Hello everyone, my name is Abhishek and welcome back to my channel. So firstly, Kubernetes is easy. Yes, you heard it right. So many people worry about Kubernetes and whenever we talk about DevOps, you know, people focus most of their time on CI/CD solutions. So I've seen many people focusing a lot on building pipelines, you know, talking about live CI/CD project. And even if you search on YouTube, you'll find a bunch of CI/CD related stuff on YouTube and everybody is focused on it. But the key player in the market is Kubernetes. Take 20 resumes, search for DevOps related jobs. If you don't find Kubernetes, you can definitely come back and in the comment section ask me, okay, I did not see Kubernetes in one of the videos, but you are saying Kubernetes is important. Trust me, that will never happen because in all of the job descriptions, you will see Kubernetes because Kubernetes is the future. Kubernetes is a future of DevOps. So if you want to do a marathon journey in DevOps, right? If you want to do a short sprint or if you just want to get into DevOps and you know, you just want to be around in DevOps, then yeah, you can survive yourself by just learning about simple DevOps topics. You can do projects on CI CD and you can, you might also find some uh, simple uh, Dev DevOps job roles, which offers you some positions, but it's not DevOps. It is basically build and release engineering, or it is basically some release engineer roles, which offers you jobs on just CI CD and other DevOps stuffs. But if you want to, like I told you, do a marathon in DevOps, or if you want to do a long run uh, in DevOps journey, Kubernetes is the future. Now, why I'm saying this? Because everybody knows that these days people have started moving towards microservices. Now, not these days, people have started moving towards microservices from last six to seven years very actively. And you all know from last six classes, we have been talking about Docker and containers. Right. So I have explained enough why containers are very important. If you haven't watched our previous videos from day 24 to day 30, uh, day 29, if I'm not wrong, we just talked about containers, evolution of containers, int introduction to containers, importance of containers. And we also did some live projects on containers that is using Docker. So if you haven't watched that videos, I'll highly recommend you to watch those videos before you jump onto Kubernetes, because the only prerequisite for learning Kubernetes is Docker. Now, why do I say Docker, not containers? Because most of the people are very acquainted to the term called Docker. They relate themselves more when we say uh, Docker. But in general, I am talking about containers. So if you want to be a key player in this space, you need to understand the concept of containers very well. It's not like when I say understand containers, don't talk about simple Docker commands. Okay, I'm not talking about the Docker commands at all. Whenever I speak to you in my videos, what I always tell you is get strong with your basics. So I am only talking about the basics of the containers. That means you need to understand what container is bringing into the picture. How is it different from a virtual machine? What is your networking isolation? What is your namespace isolation? Right. And why containers are very lightweight in nature? You all know that containers are lightweight, but why are they lightweight? How do you secure your containers. We talked about distroless. We talked about multi-stage Docker builds. So learn about all of these things before you start your journey with Kubernetes. Now I'm assuming all of you have watched my previous videos from day 24 to day 29, or you already know the concept of containers and Docker's very well. Okay. So this is the assumption that I'm making and I'm going forward with today's video. So I'm again saying you, if you haven't watched the previous videos, or if you do not have the concept or the understanding of containers, then don't go forward, but instead go back and watch the previous videos. Okay. Now the first question that you should get before learning Kubernetes is what is the difference between Docker and Kubernetes? Okay. Because from day 24 to day 29, I explained you how to build projects on Docker. We deployed some real-time applications. We, you know, secured the containers using distroless images, multi-stage builds, and we saw about the life cycle of Docker and containers and how Docker, which is a container platform. What was Docker? I also explained in the previous class, Docker is a container platform. That means Docker is making you the interaction with the containers or, you know, Docker is making your container journey very easy because it provides a complete container lifecycle, whether it is using the Docker engine or using the Docker CLI. It makes you the, uh, I mean, it makes your container journey very easy. But now what is Kubernetes then? So if you already have a container platform and if the container platform is offering you a lot of things, what is Kubernetes? So for the textbook definition, 
Kubernetes is nothing but a container orchestration platform. Okay, so what is Kubernetes? Kubernetes is a container orchestration platform. So this is for just a textbook definition of understanding. That means just for your one word answer, you can say that Docker is a container platform, whereas Kubernetes is a container orchestration platform. That does not make you understand anything, right? If I just tell you here that, oh, okay, uh, learn about Kubernetes. Kubernetes is just a container orchestration platform. And if I close this topic here, you will not understand anything if you are just a beginner with Kubernetes. So let's try to understand the practical implication or what I am like, you know, by container orchestration platform. How is it different from Docker platform or a container platform? Let's try to see. Now, if you have worked with containers before, one thing that you will notice is containers are ephemeral in nature. I use this term previously also. If you haven't, I mean, if this term hasn't uh, got registered with you, ephemeral is nothing but something that is short life or, you know, short living in nature. That means containers can die and, you know, revive anytime what do i mean by this basically if you have a, a host let's assume that this is your host on top of which you have installed docker on top of which you created let's say some 100 containers okay now one of these containers is taking a lot of memory okay all of a sudden it started taking a lot of memory so this one impacts your 99th or you know it impacts your 50th container why it impacts? Because this container is not getting enough resources, so it will die. Or if it is already not scheduled, what happens is this container will not get started. Right? So basically, the life of containers is very short. If there is a lack of memory resources or, you know, if there is some issue with the uh, container, like the image is not getting pulled in any of the cases, the container will immediately die because there is only one host here. And on top of that, I installed uh, 100 containers. One of the container, there is no relation between container number one and there is no relation between container number 100. But still what is happening here is the container one, which is consuming a lot of memory is killing the container 100 it is not directly killing but because of the linux how linux works okay so if you want to understand this thing in deep what happens is there is priority uh, that is allocated for each process in linux so now what happens is that when one of the uh, you know process is taking a lot of memory depending upon your linux and kernel rules the process like linux have to uh, define right or kernel has to uh, decide which process to kill let's say there are 100 process it cannot randomly kill process number 50 Right. So there is a particular algorithm in kernel using which it deletes one of the processes. So here in this case, what I'm telling you is container one was taking a lot of resources because of which container hundred is not at all getting created or it is directly dying. OK, so this is one use case. What is the problem here? Because you have only one host and on top of it, on top of it, you have installed Docker and you have created 100 containers. One of the container is dying because of the other thing. So what is one problem that we have learned here? Single host. Okay. So this is problem number one. Now let's move to problem number two. What is problem number one? The nature of Docker or the nature of this container platform is scoped to one single host. So because it is only one single host, the containers which are there, it is impacting each another. And if one of the container is impacting the other container, there is no way that this, this container can come up. Okay. So this is problem number one. Now the problem number two, let's say somebody has killed one of your container. Killed container. Now what will happen if somebody kills the container? Immediately the application that is running inside the container will be not accessible right why is what is the reason for it being not accessible because the container got killed and unless there is a user or a devops engineer who starts this container somebody has to act upon the container that got killed okay so this behavior is called as auto healing okay so what is auto healing auto healing is a behavior where without users manual intervention Okay, so without the user's manual intervention, your container should start by itself. 
but does it happen in the docker let's say you are playing around with your docker containers on your personal laptop does the container come up automatically no it does not come up now there are hundreds of reasons why your container can go down okay so there are hundreds of reasons why your container can go down now the problem is that a devops engineer cannot continuously monitor some 10000s of containers okay so in your personal laptop you might have just one single container but when you are working in production or when you are working with your organization you will see some 10000s of containers now you can always not do docker ps right always a devops engineer cannot perform the docker ps command and see which containers are in running state so there has to be a mechanism that is called as auto healing so auto healing is a very important feature that docker or any container platform by itself is missing so what is problem number 2 auto healing what was problem number 1 single host nature of your docker container now let's move and see what is problem number 3 so this problem number 3 is called as auto scaling now let's try to understand what is this problem number 3 so again let's take the same example you have a ec2 instance or a physical host on top of which you install docker okay on top of which you have let's assume you just created one container okay just for easy understanding in usual terms you will not just create one container but let's say that you just created one container and this container you know it has some resources called as okay this host uh, let's say it is a 4 gb ram and uh, 4 cpu now this container can maximum consume up to 4 g uh, 4 cpu and 4 gb ram because it is the maximum capacity of your host in general your container will not get all the required resources from your host because the host itself has a lot of processes that is running right but for easy understanding let's say maximum this container can go up to 4 cpu and 4 gb okay or you know for some reason what has happened is Uh, your user whoever is the user okay so you have some 10000 users your application has some 10000 users but what happened is during a festival season let's say some christmas or dasara or any festival season your users all of a sudden went from 10000 to 1 lakh so this happens all the times right so let's say a movie is released on netflix and this is a very uh, popular movie something like marvel or avengers or uh, any popular actors movie so usually uh, netflix might receive load from 10000 users but on this particular occasion netflix will receive some 10000 sorry some uh, 1 million or 1 lakh or whatever the load gets increased so to satisfy this increasing load or to uh, you know uh, for the container or the application to act upon the increasing load you need to have a specific feature which is called as auto scaling now what is auto scaling as soon as the load gets increased okay there are two ways one is manually you increase the application there is only one container right so manually you increase the container count from 1 to let's say 10 okay because the load is increased by 10 times i'm just giving an example so manually you increase the load from 1 to 10 or the uh, containers Uh, similar containers like similar to c1 uh, c1 what you will do is you will create 10 different c1 containers or it has to happen automatically okay as soon as this sees the load uh, the docker container it has to immediately understand that oh okay so uh, the load is getting increased so i have to scale up myself but docker does not support both of the things right so let's say you have one container called c1 okay so manually what you will do is uh, let's say you want to increase from 10000 to 20000 user request what you have to do you have to create another container called c1 and apart from this you have to configure load balancing okay if there is no load balancing you know you cannot tell user that okay for first 10000 users access my uh, application url as 172.16.3.4 and for next 10000 users access my application on 172.16.3.5 that is not possible netflix will never tell you this right all that you do as a end user is just access netflix.com okay so you just access netflix.com and your favorite movie so now what is happening behind the hood is there is a load balancer which is actually sending you the load whether you are doing it manually 
or automatically whether you increase this containers count uh, manually from 1 to 10 or automatically if your uh, platform is increasing from 1 to 10 behind the hood there is a load balancer okay so this load balancer basically says that oh okay now i understood that instead of one container there are two or instead of two there are three or there are 10 so let me equally split the load okay so there has to be this mechanism of load balancer which supports your auto scaling so this is feature number three which is missing in your docker okay so what are the three different things that i told you the first one that i told you is the problem that we had with the containers is it is a single host one that is the docker platform basically relies on one single host whether you install it on your laptop or ec2 instance what you are doing is on one specific ec2 instance you are installing docker and top of it you are installing containers whether the containers are like you know if you have 10 containers 100 containers you are just in simply installing on that specific host and you are serving the traffic okay now the problem number two that we have is auto healing what is happening with auto healing is that your containers are not able to heal automatically if the container is dying then devops engineer should keep track of this 10000 or 1 lakh or 1 million containers and he has to start by himself or when customers report that your application has gone down you have to start which is a very bad user experience now the problem number 3 i just explained is about auto scaling and the problem number 4 or the final problem that i that i want to bring here is Docker is a very minimalistic or very simple platform. Okay. What is simple platform? By default, Docker does not support any of your enterprise level. Application support. Okay. Docker does not provide any enterprise level support. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's say you don't know Docker at all. What are the minimal things that you require for running your application even on a virtual machine? Okay, so it's not like running your college project. If you want to run your college project, you can just run it on your laptop. But when we deal with enterprise applications or when we deal with enterprise solutions, you have a lot of things to deal with. So one of the example is your application should have a load balancer. Let, let, let's keep writing firewall. Okay, without load balancer, your application is not enterprise ready. Without firewall, your application is not enterprise ready or, uh, you know, there are some uh, such parameters. Let's keep uh, writing them. Okay. And what is the other thing? Your application has to auto scale. Or at least it has to support scaling. Your application has to auto heal or at least it has to support healing. Okay. And then, you know, uh, your application has to support some API gateways. If you keep writing, this number will go it will keep increasing okay so what are these things called some enterprise level standards but docker does not support this enterprise level standards by default okay or you know instead of you going to docker swam or any other high level docker concepts by default if you are just using docker these all things are not supported so it's a very simple or minimalistic platform so who is solving all of these problems? Let's write all the four problems here and let us see how Kubernetes is solving each of these problems. The first problem is a single host. Second problem is auto scaling. Third problem is auto healing. Fourth problem is enterprise level support. I'm sorry if there are any typos. So these are the four problems that we discussed. There are hundreds of problems, but these are the four problems that are very important. Now, I cannot tell you all of the problems because we are just starting our journey with Kubernetes. Now, who is solving these problems? As I told you, the one simple answer is Kubernetes. So now you can answer this question, right? If somebody is asking you in the interviews, who is solving you the problem of Docker or what is the difference between Docker and kubernetes okay so if somebody asks you this question you have the answer now okay so all these five slides or all these 15 minutes i just talked about this one simple question the problem with docker or the difference between docker and kubernetes so now you should be able to explain these problems let me tell you the solutions immediately okay so till now i just explained you the problems with docker and i just told you that kubernetes will solve the problem but i know that you people will not trust me you will say that oh okay explain me 
uh, how uh, it will solve because if anybody says you that oh okay kubernetes solves the problem you should not trust you should ask the question okay explain how kubernetes solves this problem so let's try to understand by default kubernetes is a cluster what is a cluster cluster is basically group of nodes okay so previously when we installed docker we just installed on one personal laptop or you know we just installed on one simple ec2 instance so kubernetes in general in a production use case it is installed in a master node architecture okay so what is master node architecture just like jenkins we create clusters so that means to say whenever we install kubernetes we just create one master node and we create multiple nodes okay so somebody will directly ask me oh does that mean kubernetes cannot be installed on one single node you can definitely do it but that is only your developer environment okay so to just practice kubernetes or you know to just start working around with kubernetes you can also install kubernetes on one single node but in general in production kubernetes is installed in whether it is high availability or a standalone mode kubernetes is generally installed as a cluster so now what happens okay uh, i might be installing it as a cluster but your question will be what what is the advantage that i get if i install as a cluster the advantage would be in the previous slide i told you if you go back to this problem here i told you that this container is actually getting affected by this one container that is taking a lot of memory right now what will happen is if you install kubernetes in kubernetes there are two nodes let's assume so if this node okay so let's assume this is the specific node and this is container 1 and container 99 okay so if container 1 is impacting this container 99 immediately kubernetes will put this container 99 in a different node okay so that what happened this container 99 is not affected by this node or the meaning is that a faulty node okay so there is a faulty node for example or there is one faulty application in the node which is impacting the other applications so kubernetes because it has multiple node architecture immediately it can put nodes in a different uh, sorry pods in a different node or applications in a different node okay so because of which you have a cluster like architecture okay so this is one problem that is already solved by using the cluster behavior of kubernetes so kubernetes is by default cluster in nature now the second problem what is that auto healing so kubernetes basically has something called as uh okay i don't want to go into the details but kubernetes has something called as replication controller or replica sets so replica set is a new name replication controller is the old name okay just like you can consider version 1 and version 2 so kubernetes has something called as replica set so all that you need to do is you don't even have to deploy a new container okay let's say you have c1 okay and uh, your c1 or your application is receiving load increase load previously it was receiving 10000 on one festival it is receiving 1 lakh for example okay or 1/10th of a million so what you can simply do is kubernetes is basically dependent on yaml files so everything in kubernetes is all about yaml files so in replication controller.yaml file replica set controller.yaml file or even in the deployment yaml file now if you don't know what this terms are don't worry all that you need to understand is as a devops engineer you can go to one specific yaml file yaml is basically a uh, indentation format file just like json files okay so you can simply go to this yaml template file and say that increase increase my replicas from 1 to 10 because my traffic is increasing i know that tomorrow is festival so i want to increase traffic from 1 to 10 this is manual way and kubernetes also support something called as hpa which is horizontal pod auto scaler okay so using which you can directly say that okay whenever there is a load uh, just keep increase okay if one of my container is receiving a threshold of 80% so whenever you see that the load is reaching threshold of 80% just spin up one more container okay so in such cases it will keep up spinning containers if the load is even going from 1 million to 10 millions even your horizontal pod scaler feature of your kubernetes can handle so this is how you are achieving auto scaling two problem solved now let's go with the problem number 3 what is the problem number 3 that i told you auto healing so what is auto healing basically the word heal itself means that whenever there is a damage kubernetes has to control the damage okay so kubernetes controls and fix the damage 
so it will either control or it will fix so most of the time it will control the damage now what is the meaning of controlling the damage or what is the meaning of auto healing so let's say for some reason one of your container is going down there are hundreds of reasons why your container can go down i'll explain you what are the classic problems of why a pod can go down or why a container can go down there are multiple things and there are some standard things that you can remember uh, or you know standard debugging steps for a container when container goes down but for now let's assume that your container is going down so in case of docker like i told you you have to look into the docker ps commands look into all the list of containers and understand okay one of my container went down so let me restart or let me recreate this container whereas kubernetes has a feature called auto healing using this auto healing feature whenever the container is going down even before the container goes down kubernetes will start a new container okay so even before this container goes down how kubernetes will basically work is as soon as kubernetes receives uh, in in kubernetes there is something called as api server okay so tomorrow i'll explain you the kubernetes architecture during that time i'll explain you what is api server what are the different components or how the kubernetes architecture is present but for now there is something called as api server whenever the api server understands that one of the container is going down or whenever it receives a signal called container is going down immediately what kubernetes does is even before this container goes down it will roll out a new container okay so whenever it will roll out a new container the end user will not even understand that the container has gone down and a new container has come up unless your application like uh, let's say you are you is a very heavy application or you know in some cases that might happen but i am only talking about the generic terminology or general uh, usage purposes so even before your container goes down a new rollout or a new container is created or a new pod is created in kubernetes we usually deal in terms of pods not in containers but for now let's understand that uh, even if your container is going down before that kubernetes starts a new container so using which we have achieved a feature called auto healing so three problems solved i explained you three problems auto healing auto scaling single uh, host nature of docker because kubernetes is a cluster it has scope from for putting one container from one specific node to another specific node what is the fourth problem the fourth problem is the enterprise uh, nature like docker i told you it does not has enter uh, sorry uh, enterprise nature okay so it does not have many enterprise support capabilities like it does not support firewalls it does not support load balancers or uh, by default okay so it does not support a lot of things unless you go to docker swarm so what people have done is the people at kubernetes so kubernetes is basically a tool that was originated from google okay so people at google were using a specific tool called borg where they say that kubernetes is one of the parts of borg so they say that borg is uh, like you know uh, a even a better solution and kubernetes is one of the like you can consider as one of the parts of blogs or one of borg or you can consider kubernetes as initial solution for borg so we don't have much details here but the people at google what the, so borg is not an open source tool so the people at google what they have done is they have built a enterprise level container orchestration platform okay so why they have built a container orchestration platform that supports enterprise level is because the docker platform which is just a container platform right docker was just a container platform so it does not have all of these capabilities but to run your application on a pat on a platform which is not enterprise ready it is not suggestible right so that's why nobody used docker in production okay so docker is never used in production so you might use docker swam in production but docker independently is never used in production because it's not a enterprise level solution so docker is basically a container platform which will allow you to play with containers on your personal laptop or on your ec2 instances but 
in general you can consider that docker has some container runtime which will allow you to run containers or which will allow you to manage the life cycle of containers but it's not a enterprise solution because it does not have all the list of capabilities like auto healing auto scaling load balancer support firewall support support for api gateways okay so all of white listing black listing so these are all features that you require to run your application in production now Flipkart or Amazon cannot just say that Docker platform is a platform that is running container. So let me move to Docker. So the first question the organizations, MNCs or your corporates will have is, okay, I appreciate uh, a solution like Docker platform, but is it suitable for our organization? Does it support all of these capabilities? Because I want to blacklist few clients or I want to black whitelist a uh, few particular IPs. I want to blacklist uh, somebody who is uh, trying to uh, perform, uh, you know, DDoS attack or denial of service attack. So all of these capabilities are required, which Docker does not have. And Kubernetes is the one that is aiming to solve this problem. Now, does Kubernetes solve this problem 100%? So to answer this question in a nutshell, the answer is definitely no. So you might talk to experts in Kubernetes. You can talk to anyone like who have been in the world of Kubernetes. So it is not as simple as we do it in the world of virtual machines. Okay. So when we were do, dealing with virtual machines, like 10 years back or, you know, uh, seven to eight years back, everybody was on virtual machines. And the way you can integrate these external tools to virtual machines was far easy. And virtual machines offer you far more security when you, uh, compare with uh, containers. So Kubernetes is evolving and it is backed up by very uh, wonderful people at uh, CNCF. Okay. So there are many contributors to CNCF. Even I am one of the contributors to CMCF, uh, CNCF where the goal of this community is to make Kubernetes a better place. Okay. So you are Basically, I mean, Kubernetes basically has a very good backup and every day there are lots of enhancements that are done to Kubernetes. So you will see that there are many projects in the CNCF, like you have Podman, you have uh, build packs, you have, uh, you know, uh, Prometheus, all of these are uh, CNCF incubated or, you know, CNCF adopted projects. So they might be created by someone else, but CNCF has adopted these projects. So what is the meaning is that there is a community that is constantly focusing on developing the Kubernetes community, not just the Kubernetes application, but the tools around Kubernetes because Kubernetes also by default does not provide you a lot of capabilities, but Kubernetes provides a concept uh, like, you know, concepts like custom resources, custom resource definitions using which you can extend Kubernetes to any level. Okay. So let's say by default Kubernetes, uh, for example, by default Kubernetes does not support advanced load balancing capabilities. Okay, so everybody knows this and this is a practical truth. So by default, Kubernetes has services and queue proxy, which will just give you some basic load balancing like right, round robin. But this is one of the major problems and how Kubernetes solved this problem was Kubernetes introduced custom resources and custom resource definitions and it told applications like FI, Nginx that, okay, you create a Kubernetes controller using which People can use your load balancer even in Kubernetes. Okay. And this concept was called as ingress controllers. So similarly, Kubernetes is advancing every day and Kubernetes is improving uh, and it is reaching this near 100%. Okay, so we'll reach that near 100%. So that is one of the reasons why even, you know, some of the companies hesitate to implement Kubernetes in production. People are migrating slowly to Kubernetes in production because of all this support and all of these things. So Kubernetes is one such tool that you have to definitely watch out for. And like I told you in the very first slide, Kubernetes is easy. Don't worry about Kubernetes. If you understood these four topics that I told you, so today your part is done. Like, let's assume that you have learned already 5% of Kubernetes. Okay, now what we will focus is learning the next 95% and this next 95% will completely depend on your foundations. That is your first 5%. That is to understand why you need to learn Kubernetes. If you understand the why statement, why you need to learn Kubernetes, then you will understand with your effort, not directly, with your effort in learning Kubernetes, you will understand the rest 95%. Okay, so we will slow by slow. I mean, in uh, our next classes, step by step, we'll learn about the concepts like pods. We'll learn about the concepts like deployments, services. Even before all of these things, I'll explain you the architecture of Kubernetes. Okay, because that is very important. And on the very first day, like tomorrow, when I explain you the architecture of Kubernetes, 
might be some people might not understand the complete architecture and you might feel that oh there are so many components in kubernetes now i have to learn about all of these components but on the very first day you will not understand all the components i'm very sure about it you might understand the definitions you might feel like you understood it but practically to gain understanding of all the kubernetes components it will take some time so don't lose hope in our next videos we'll start learning with pods we'll start learning with deployment services ingress controllers we'll start talking about admission controllers so it is a long journey and stay with me you will learn kubernetes definitely because kubernetes is very easy i hope you like this video if you like the video click on the like button if you have any feedback for me definitely post it in the comment section and don't forget to share it with your friends and your colleagues thank you so much for watching the video Take care, everyone. Bye. See you in the next video. In this video, I'll be talking about the Kubernetes architecture. So before we jump onto the topic for today, let me start with a very lighter note question. Why Kubernetes is called as K8? So everybody knows that uh, Kubernetes in short is called as K8. But to just uh, start with a very uh, fun question, let's see how many people can answer this question. Why Kubernetes is actually called as K8S? So this is not at all an interview question. So I'm just trying to, uh, you know, start with a very uh, simple question because we are going to deal with a very complicated concept. Okay, so let's try to understand the architecture of Kubernetes. But before that, if you know the answer, definitely put that in the comment section. So coming to the architecture of Kubernetes, firstly, you should understand the difference between Docker and Kubernetes. So that is the same thing that we try to understand on day 30. So if you haven't watched our previous video, that is day 30. I'll highly recommend you to watch that previous video and then come back to the video for today. That is architecture of Kubernetes. The reason why I'm telling you is if you don't understand what a Docker platform or what a container platform offers and what is the reason why we need to evolve to a container orchestration platform, you will never understand the reason for container architecture or, you know, sorry, Kubernetes architecture. So on a very high level, what I told you is your Kubernetes offers four fundamental advantages over Docker. That is Kubernetes is by default a cluster in nature or cluster in behavior. Then Kubernetes offers something called as auto healing. Kubernetes offers something called as auto scaling. And finally, it offers multiple enterprise level support. Like Kubernetes offers you advanced load balancing. Kubernetes offers you, uh, you know, security related things. It offers you advanced networking. So it offers you multiple enterprise level support, which is a major difference between Docker and Kubernetes. So we understood these four things in detail. And today I'm going to explain you the architecture of Kubernetes also using these four examples. So you might ask me that Abhishek, there are hundreds of videos on internet, which explains about the Kubernetes architecture, right? So everybody uh, says that Kubernetes has something called as a control plane. And Kubernetes has something called as data plane, right? So this is something that everybody explains. And probably if you have watched the previous videos or, you know, if you have watched any other video or if you have even read the documentation of Kubernetes, you know that there are multiple components in uh, control plane. Like, you know, Kubernetes has uh, API server, Kubernetes has a component that is called as ETCD, Kubernetes has a component that is called as a scheduler. Then you have a controller manager and then you have a cloud controller manager, which is called as CCM. And similarly, in data plane also, you have multiple components. Like, you know, you have your uh, kubelet, you have your kube proxy, you have your, uh, you know, container runtime. But what exactly all of these things are? So even I can explain you that, you know, these are the different components in control plane. These are the different components in data plane. And uh, each component does these, these, these things. But you will never understand the architecture of Kubernetes in this way. So that's why what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare this thing against Docker. So let us try to understand two basic things. In Docker, the simplest thing is container. Whereas in Kubernetes, the simplest thing is pod. So I will try to compare both of these things and how a container is what happens when a container is created in docker and what happens when a pod is created in kubernetes so that you will directly understand the architecture of kubernetes so you yourself will say what is the advantage of each and every component in kubernetes and why kubernetes requires these many components whereas in docker you have two to three components but in kubernetes you have all of these components by the end of this video 
you will understand the advantage of each and every component and why they are actually required okay so watch this video till the end so that you get a clear understanding of these components in kubernetes architecture and you will say that kubernetes is very easy though so that is our primary goal to make kubernetes easy okay so let's start with creation of a container in docker so let's say you have this platform okay so this is a virtual machine on top of which you install docker let's say and what you have done as a user is you have created uh, you have written a docker file built images i'm not going there but you have run a container using a basic command in docker that is docker run okay so you said docker run and then you ran a container but what is happening under the hood so if you run a container nothing will happen right let's say you have installed a application let's say you have installed a java application and on the platform you don't have java runtime will your java application actually run no it will not run similarly even when you are running a container you need to have something called as a container runtime okay so without container runtime your container will never run so in docker you have a container runtime component that is called as docker shim so this is something that is happening under the hood in docker okay so now if we move to kubernetes so kubernetes also need to do some similar behavior but because kubernetes is a advanced concept or because kubernetes provides you enterprise support with auto healing auto scaling and cluster like behavior what you basically do with kubernetes is you create a master and you create a worker okay so for a basic example i am just using one master and one node component or worker component architecture so that it will be very easy for you guys to understand but in general there will not be one worker there will be multiple workers in kubernetes it doesn't mean that you cannot create kubernetes with one single node you can also do it but in production always you have multiple masters and multiple workers but for easy understanding let's say you have just one master and you have just one worker so what happens is in kubernetes you will not directly send the request to worker but your request goes through master okay so your request always goes through something called as a control plane now why you need to do this i'll explain you or you will even understand by it yourself so when you deploy your pod in kubernetes the smallest level of deployment is pod whereas in docker you deploy a container you can slightly understand both of them are more or less similar kind of things because i'll explain the difference in detail in tomorrow's class but for now just understand that uh, container uh, pod is just like a wrapper over your container which has some advanced capabilities so when user tries to deploy a pod similar to container or similar to docker your pod gets deployed okay let's say your pod is getting deployed on this this specific worker node but you have a component in kubernetes that is called as kubelet so what is this kubelet doing is basically this kubelet is responsible for running your pod okay in docker basically you have a docker engine okay and basically you have docker shim okay in kubernetes you have something called as a kubelet which is responsible for maintaining this kubernetes pod okay it always looks for okay if the pod is running or not if the pod is not running because kubernetes has a feature called auto healing i have to inform kubernetes that okay the pod is not running do something so that's why kubernetes has a component called kubelet but even if the pod has to run like i explained you here there need to be something called as a container runtime right inside a pod you will definitely have container so for this container to run even on kubernetes you need to have something called as a container runtime but the only difference is in kubernetes docker is not mandatory in docker like i told you there is something called as docker shim but in kubernetes you can either use docker shim you can either use container d you can use creo what are all these things these are all comp competition to docker shim okay so docker has only one support that is docker shim whereas kubernetes can support container d kubernetes can support creo kubernetes can support docker shim or any other container runtimes which implements kubernetes container interface now let's not go into the details of it but understand that kubernetes has a standard called container interface if some container runtime 
it can be creo it can be container d it can be docker shim if they can implement this container interface or it can implement the standard that kubernetes has set then kubernetes allow you to use that kubernetes container runtime or that specific container runtime so what are the two different components that we learned we have kubelet in kubernetes we have container runtime in kubernetes kubelet is basically responsible for ensuring that the pod is always running if the pod is not running then kubernetes will inform uh, there is a component in kubernetes i'll keep that component as suspense but kubelet will inform this specific component that okay something has gone with the uh, something has gone wrong with the pod let us restart it or let us do something with it so that is the responsibility of kubelet and container runtime you already understood now if in the previous class in one of the previous classes i told you that in docker there is something called as docker 0 or you have a default networking in docker that is called as a bridge networking so this networking is mandatory for running your pod even here in kubernetes you have something called as kube proxy so this kube proxy basically provides you networking like every pod that you are creating every container that you are creating it has to be allocated with an ip address right and it has to be provided with load balancing capabilities because i told you kubernetes has something called as auto scaling when you scale your pod instead of one replica if you have two replicas to your pod then there has to be a component which says okay send 50 percent request here send 50 percent request here so that is taken care by kube proxy so we talked about three components one is kube proxy which provides networking ip addresses and also the load balancing default load balancing capabilities in kubernetes then you have kubelet which is actually responsible for running your application and if your application is not running or if your pod is not running then kubelet informs one of the components in control plane that okay something is going wrong and finally you have container runtime which actually runs your container so these are the three components that are available on the worker node so see you directly understood what are the different components that are available in worker node of kubernetes so you are already done with data plane of Kubernetes or you are done with the worker component of Kubernetes. Isn't it easy? All of you understood the components that are in worker node. Tomorrow, if somebody asks you in the interview, what are the components that are present in the worker node of Kubernetes? You can directly tell them that let me erase all of this stuff. Okay. So you can directly tell them that in Kubernetes worker node, there are three components and those three components are nothing but your Let's write them. So those three components are nothing but you have kube proxy, you have kubelet, and you have something called as container runtime. Okay, and you should be practically able to explain the purpose of each of them as well so that is the reason why i took docker as an example so that you guys understand it so cube, cube again let's repeat it kubelet is basically responsible for creation of the pods and it will basically ensure that the pod is always in the running state if it is not then it takes the necessary action using the uh, kubernetes control plane and then you have uh, something called as kube proxy Kube proxy is basically responsible for the networking, like generating the IP addresses or load balancing. Basically, it uses IP tables on your Linux machine. Okay, so IP tables is a concept where, you know, uh, okay, let's not go into the details of IP tables, but just understand that Kubelet, uh, Kube proxy uses IP table for networking related configuration. And finally, you have container runtime, which is responsible for running your container. Okay, so worker component is done. Now let us move to control plane or the master component of it. So this worker node or the data plane is basically responsible for running your application. So using these three components, you have technically everything to run your application, right? So kubelet is deploying, kube proxy is providing the networking, container runtime is providing the execution environment for your container. Now why you need actually control plane itself? So you should get this question. The reason for that is for any enterprise level tools or for any enterprise level components, like I told you, there are some specific standards. Okay, now cluster is one specific standard. Like I told you, Kubernetes has cluster. Now who will decide that the pod creation, like user has created a pod. Now who will decide that, okay, should the pod be created on node one? Should the pod be created on node two? Or should the pod be created on node three? 
so this is one specific instruction but there can be multiple instructions and there should be a heart or there should be a core component in your kubernetes that has to deal with such kind of instructions okay when multiple users are basically trying to access your kubernetes cluster or when multiple people are trying to uh, you know do some kind of hacking or some kind of things so there has to be a component in kubernetes which basically acts as a core component of your kubernetes and takes all the incoming requests whether you want to in uh, you know in future you want to implement some uh, identity provider related configuration sso or you want to do some security related stuff so there has to be a core component which is basically doing everything in kubernetes and that core component is called as api server and this component is present in your master component or you can also con call it as a control plane of your kubernetes so what is the purpose of api server so the api server is a component that basically exposes your kubernetes okay so this kubernetes has to be exposed to the external world all of these things are basically internal to your kubernetes the data plane all the worker nodes but the heart of the kubernetes is your kubernetes api server which basically takes all the requests from external world now what this uh, let's say the user is trying to create a pod he tries to access the api server and from the api server kubernetes uh, api server decides that okay node 1 is free but to schedule the component on node 1 you have a component in kubernetes that is called as scheduler okay so what is the responsibility of scheduler so scheduler is basically responsible for scheduling your pods or scheduling your resources on kubernetes okay so who decides the information api server but who acts on the information that is api uh, sorry that is the cube scheduler okay so what are the two things that we have learned till now one is api server the second thing that we learned is scheduler so scheduler is basically saying you go and schedule this on node 1 or node 2 it is receiving this information from api server after this let's say that we are deploying your production level applications on this kubernetes cluster there has to be a component inside your kubernetes that basically acts as a backup service or you know uh, that basically acts as a backing store of entire cluster information okay even when we are talking about jenkins i told you that backup is very essential in kubernetes there is a component that is called as etcd so etcd is basically a key value store and the entire kubernetes cluster information is stored as objects or key value pairs inside this etcd okay so the other component that we learned is etcd what happens without etcd you don't have the cluster related information tomorrow if you want to restore the cluster or you want to do any information etcd is basic component and finally you have two more components that are controller manager and you have cloud controller manager let's put this cloud controller manager aside for a moment if you understand what is a controller manager so basically like i told you kubernetes supports auto scaling so to support auto scaling kubernetes has some components like you know kubernetes has to automatically detect this and it has to do kind of things so for that kubernetes has basically some controllers okay for example replica set So replica set is basically is the one that is maintaining state of your Kubernetes pods. So tomorrow, let us let me say that one pod is not enough and I will schedule two pods. I will auto scale one of my pod to two pods. So there has to be a component in Kubernetes that ensures that the two components or two pods are actually running. So that is taken care by replica set. In Kubernetes YAML file, if you say I require two pods, so replica set controller basically ensures that the two pods are always running. Now there has to be a component in kubernetes which ensures such controllers are always running so that component is called as controller manager if you did not understand about controller manager don't worry about it in future classes when we talk about deployments when we talk about services by yourself you will understand what a controller manager is but for now just understand that in kubernetes by default there are multiple controllers like replica sets and there has to be a program or there has to be a component which ensures that these controllers are running that component is called as your controller manager or that that manager which is managing these controllers is called as a controller manager finally you have one component that is called as cloud controller manager okay ccm 
many people get confused with this concept so that's why i thought i'll take this as a different concept and i'll explain you okay so you all know that kubernetes can be run on cloud platforms like eks or you can also run it on uh, aks or you know gke so what is happening is you are running your kubernetes on cloud platforms so basically this cloud platforms let's say you are using elastic kubernetes service so there is a user request or there is a request to create a load balancer or there is a request to create storage so if you directly send this information to kubernetes so kubernetes has to understand the underlying cloud provider okay if kubernetes has to create a load balancer on aws or if kubernetes has to create a storage service on aks or on azure so kubernetes has to translate the request from the user on to the api request that your cloud provider understands okay so this mechanism has to be implemented on your cloud control manager that means to say let's say tomorrow there is a new cloud that is implemented called as abhishek okay and you want to run kubernetes on this platform called as abhishek okay so you want to run kubernetes on the platform called abhishek now what kubernetes tells you is that okay i cannot write logic for all of these different cloud providers i will provide you a component called as cloud controller manager so this cloud controller manager is a open source utility okay so this code is available on github tomorrow if abhishek creates a new cloud provider what abhishek can do is he can go to this open source github repository and he can write the logic for his cloud provider inside this cloud controller manager he can create a pull request to the cloud controller manager saying that okay so i have implemented a new cloud and i want i want to support kubernetes on my cloud provider so for that reason what abhishek has to do is he has to write a bunch of logic and he has to submit to cloud controller manager so if you are running kubernetes on on premise this component is not at all required or this component does not have to be created at all on your kubernetes cluster so these are the various components of your kubernetes so if you have to sum up or if you have to just put that in one specific slide basically you have kubernetes divided into two parts one is your control plane and one is your data plane so if you have two worker nodes on your two worker nodes you will have kubernetes data plane components that are three components one is your kubelet second is your kube proxy third is your container runtime so every kubernetes worker node has these three components so in some cases you will not see container runtime in some documentations but end of the day container runtime is required so i consider it as also a component okay so this is worker node one but even on worker node two you will have these three components okay one two three every worker node will have these components and then you have something called as kubernetes master which has components like your api server which is heart of your kubernetes every request is received by this api server then you have your scheduler which schedules the resources whether it has to go on worker node 1 worker node 2 api server will take the decision and scheduler will schedule on that specific thing and then you have uh, something called as etcd which is basically your data store or uh, a key value store which stores all the information of your cluster and then you have controller manager which is manager for your kubernetes inbuilt controllers and finally you have something called as cloud controller manager okay so these are the different components you have to explain in an interview if your interviewer is asking tell them that these are the components on your kubernetes master and then these are your components on your kubernetes workers so this is the control plane and this is the data plane so control plane is the one that is controlling the actions and data planes is the one that is actually executing this, your actions okay i hope the concept is clear you understood what are the master or control plane components and what are the worker node components so if you want to practically try this out in even before practically trying consider this as an assignment that i am giving to you so write a detailed notes okay so watch this video and write a detailed notes post it on your linkedin 
so that everybody understands like when a uh, interviewer is trying to approach you he understands that you know okay this guy has uh, the architecture knowledge on kubernetes so post on linkedin saying that okay today i understood about kubernetes uh, architecture these are the different components in kubernetes and uh, this is how uh, kubernetes basically works so you know you can uh, draw a specific diagram like you know you can uh, basically uh, use paint or something and uh, tell them that these are the different components in kubernetes and how one component works with uh, connects with other component take pod creation as an example and put all the details uh, including uh, you know uh, the diagram as well as the written part and put that in your github uh, profile and share that url on the linkedin so that you can create a github profile and you can also share that information on linkedin so this is the assignment for today and i hope you understood the concept you understood each and every component if you did not understand something put that in the comment section i'll definitely reply to your comment saying that okay so you did not understand about this thing and this is how this component works if you like the video click on the like button if you have any feedback share that with me in the comment section and don't forget to share this video with your friends and colleagues so this is the video for today guys i'll see you in the next video tomorrow where we'll try to understand the kubernetes pod Thank you so much for watching the video. Take care, everyone. Bye. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to my channel. And in this video, we'll see how to install Kubernetes cluster, or you know, how to deploy a Kubernetes cluster on your local machine. Or you can also use this method to. Uh, create a Kubernetes cluster on your virtual machine, wherever it is. So uh, basically for our development purpose or to learn Kubernetes, you know, you cannot uh, afford to create a full blown Kubernetes cluster. So you need a development Kubernetes cluster. So uh, there are many uh, local Kubernetes clusters like Minikube or K3S. You can also use K3 or some other stuff, but you know, the easiest thing that you can do or the thing that has been for a long time is Minikube. So in this video, I'll show you how to install Minikube on your laptop or your virtual machine and how to use it. So there are two easy steps to do. So one is, you know, uh, to install the Minikube. And the second thing is to install kubectl. So what is kubectl? kubectl is your Kubernetes command line. Uh, so with which you can interact with your Kubernetes cluster. So you can also do it with your... Kubernetes UI uh, or uh, the Kubernetes dashboard, but the most preferred way of doing it is using kubectl. So the easiest way uh, is to uh, directly go to switch to the Kubernetes, uh, sorry, Minikube official documentation. So this is the Minikube official documentation. If you see here, minikube.6.kh.io, special interest groups.kh.io. So this is the uh, official documentation and uh, you need to uh, have these prerequisites like, you know, you have to have two CPUs, two GB of free RAM and 20 GB of free hard disk and of course an internet connection. And uh, if you want to install a uh, Minikube on, you know, uh, or any of the platforms like Windows or Mac OS or anywhere, you need to have a hypervisor that is installed. And what is the purpose of hypervisor? It's uh, basically serves for creating a virtual server on top of your uh, laptop or your server. So that's only prerequisite that need that you need to have. And uh, I'm not going into details of creating a, a virtual machine, uh, sorry, a hypervisor because it differs from platform to platform that you are on. So I'll assume that you already have a uh, hypervisor. So the first thing that you do is uh, step over to the installation process and choose your operating system on which you are on. And you can simply uh, download the mini queue from here, or you can simply execute the scripts that are available here. And uh, it doesn't take much time. So if you download the binary, uh, let's assume you're on a Linux platform. So you download the binary and you can uh, set it to your path. So it uh, hardly takes like, you know, five to 10 minutes. And once you have that, you can simply use this command called minikube start. So minikube start would start a cluster for you. And uh, you can also pass uh, some parameters like uh, the driver that you want to use and all. But uh, the basic command that you can do is minikube start. And uh, the next thing that you need to have, like I uh, showed you in the previous slide, is to have kubectl up and running. So a kubectl can be easily downloaded. So uh, again, go to the official Kubernetes documentation, kubernetes.io, and search for the install tools. And 
you can simply download the kubectl binary of the operating system that you are on so install kubectl for linux once you click on this you can easily download the binary and once you have that so your kubectl would be configured to the cluster that you are with like the kubernetes cluster that you are using and you can execute your kubernetes commands and there are other instructions uh, of how you can operate with your minikube cluster like you can pass your minikube cluster or you can unpause your minikube cluster you can stop the cluster whenever you not require this or for any other reasons you can stop the minikube cluster and you can create multiple clusters with a sim uh, single minikube uh, uh, instance like you know you can create a development cluster and you can create a testing cluster you can do uh, multiple clusters with minikube and you can also set the different configurations you can increase the memory or uh, you can do uh, different things here so just type the minikube uh, command minikube and you'll uh, look into the all the options that you have and these are the simple examples that i have shown here and one more important thing about minikube is it supports a lot of add-ons so that you can uh, install add-ons like your ingress controller uh, operator lifecycle manager for which you can install the operators and you can do different things with minikube add-ons so this is a simple video of uh, using and installing Minikube guys. So if you have any questions or if you need a detailed video on how to install Minikube, please post it in the comment section. And uh, don't forget to like, share and subscribe to my channel, Abhishek Viramala. Thank you so much. Of course, and in this class, we are going to see how to deploy our first application in Kubernetes. So before watching this video, I'll highly recommend you to watch the previous videos, day 30, 31 and 32. The reason why I ask everyone to watch these videos is because from Docker to Kubernetes, like, you know, before you start your journey with Kubernetes, you have to understand the differences between Docker and Kubernetes. This is one part of it. And after that, you should also understand two things. One is the architecture of Kubernetes. And the next thing is how to install Kubernetes, right? So we covered three topics in day 30, 31 and 32. So if you don't have the knowledge of these things, then I will recommend you to not watch this video, go back and watch the videos and then come back to it because only then you will understand today's concept. So from day 30, I have been stressing on few points where Kubernetes is better than Docker and why people move to Docker, uh, Kubernetes. One is because Kubernetes is a cluster. Two is Kubernetes offers you scaling, that is auto scaling. Kubernetes offers you auto healing, right? And Kubernetes also offers something which is very important, a enterprise level behavior, right? So using Kubernetes, you can support a lot of things for your containers. So these are the four primary things. And to start with Kubernetes, to get out to achieve all of these things, you have to learn about few terminologies, okay? So like we learned about the terminologies in Docker in one of our previous classes. Similarly, we should understand few concepts in Kubernetes before we go into it. So I'm not going to talk about the architecture of Kubernetes here because we already covered it, but I'm going to introduce you to few things which will make your understanding on Kubernetes better because I don't want to directly jump onto you and explain like, you know, what is a pod in Kubernetes and how to deploy a pod, how to install your application. It will hardly take me 15 minutes to do that, but I will properly explain you the basics and then we will go with the demo. Okay, so that your fundamentals are clear. Firstly, we are moving from Docker to Kubernetes, right? I mean, we are moving our thing from containers to container orchestration environment. So in Kubernetes, the lowest level of deployment is a pod. Okay. So in Kubernetes, you cannot directly deploy a container. In Docker, what you were doing is you were building a container and you were deploying a container, right? In Kubernetes, also we will use these containers that you have deployed in Docker because end of the day, whether it is Kubernetes or whether it is Docker, the end goal is to deploy your applications in containers, right? So that is the concept of containerization. But what Kubernetes says is, okay, don't deploy your application and container as is, but deploy to me as a pod. Now, what is pod? Why we should deploy your container as a pod? Why can't you directly deploy as a container in Kubernetes as well? So this has to be your fundamental question, right? Because once you start learning Kubernetes, the very first thing that you will see is people talk about pod. 
Now, if in Docker, if you are installing your applications using containers, why you have to install in Kubernetes using pods? What is it and why is it different? Okay, so now basically a pod is described. Okay, in terms of definition, a pod is described as a definition on or definition of how to run a container. Okay, so what does this mean? Let's say in Docker, whenever you want to run a container, what you would do is basically you would say Docker run minus D or minus T or minus IT followed by the name of the container. Then what you would follow, I mean the name of the image, then you would pass minus P to do some port mapping. Then you would say minus V to do some mount volume, uh, volume mounts. Then if you have some network, you would say minus hyphen FN network and you would pass the network detail. So in Docker, you are basically passing all of these arguments to run a container, right? In command line. Whereas in Kubernetes, what you will do is you will pass those specifications in the pod.yaml file. Okay. So in Kubernetes, you basically have a wrapper or you basically have a concept that is similar to container, but it abstracts the user uh, defined commands in pod.specification YAML. So if it is confusing, don't worry about it. I'm going to explain it in a very clear way. So what you do in Kubernetes is you, instead of container, you will deploy a pod. Okay. Now a pod can be a single container or it can be multiple containers. I'll tell you why a pod can be multiple containers, what are the advantages, but first for now, just go with a single container. Okay. So assume you are building a pod with one single container. What you will do is similar to Docker. End of the day, pod is also exactly like a Docker container. The only difference if when you have one single container, the only difference is here, instead of you using a command called Docker run, uh, and then you pass all the different arguments, you will try to put all of them in a YAML file. Okay. So inside the YAML file, you will say something like this API version is uh, V1. Then you provide the name of this container, uh, sorry, of this pod and all of these things. Then you will provide the specification. So inside the specification, you will provide all of the details of the container. Okay. So you have multiple containers option here and inside which you provide specification of your containers. So don't worry, once you look into the definition or the YAML file of the pod, you will understand, oh, okay, it is exactly similar to your container, but the only thing is instead of command line, you are trying to put everything in a YAML file. That's the only difference. Now, why Kubernetes has to uh, deal with this complexity? Uh, you you might ask me a question that Abhishek, if uh, things are going well with Docker container and you can deploy everything as a container in Docker platform, why Kubernetes has introduced this complexity? Why you have to run things in Kubernetes using YAML files? So the thing is Kubernetes, like I told you, is an enterprise level platform. And what it want to do is it want to bring declarative capabilities. Okay. So, or it want to build a standardization. So, the thing is you can put these YAML files. Okay. In Kubernetes, we deal everything with YAML files. Okay. So whether it is pod resource, whether it is deployment resource, whether it is services, we are going to talk about all of these things in future, but everything will be written in YAML files only. Okay. So you have to master YAML files. Uh, you don't have to like, you know, mug up how to write a pod uh, YAML file. You don't have to mug up how to write a deployment YAML file. Don't worry about it. We have a bunch of examples and everybody make use of these examples only. Like whether it's a senior DevOps engineer, junior De DevOps engineer, everybody use this example from official Kubernetes documentation or from some samples. But the thing that I want to mention is you have to understand how YAML files are written. So only then you will become expert in Kubernetes. Because every day we deal with YAML files in Kubernetes. Okay, now, so like I told you, pod is nothing but one or group of containers. So why it has to be one or group of containers? So most of the times a pod is a single container, but there are some cases where you have some, you know, sidecar containers or you have some init containers. So what are these things like? These are the things that support your actual container. Just to give you an example, let's say you have a container, 
okay you have your application deployed in a container and this wants to read some config files or you know this wants to read some uh, uh, user related files from another container so in such cases what you will do is instead of creating two different uh, pods in kubernetes you can put both of them in a single pod and what pod says is if you put one or two containers or multiple containers inside a single pod i will ensure that kubernetes will ensure that both of the containers will have some advantages so that's why you put one or group of containers inside a single pod when it is required what are the advantages so if you put group of containers in a single pod okay let's say you have container a and container b and if you put both of them in one single pod in kubernetes then kubernetes will allow you shared networking shared storage okay so this way what happens is container a and container b inside a single pod can talk to each other using local host that means to say if uh, container a wants to talk to container b port uh, Three uh, three thousand. So it can simply access using local host three thousand. Okay, so the application can be directly accessed and the information can be retrieved. Or if both of them wants to share some files. Okay, so even in such cases, because both of them are in one single pod, they can share the files as well. So that is one of the reasons why people put multiple containers. But it is a very rare case. The usual practice for this is to create some sidecar containers or init containers, which is an advanced topic, which I'll explain going ahead when we talk about service mesh or when we talk about, uh, you know, things like uh, some advanced concepts of Kubernetes. I will talk about why uh, you put multiple containers inside a pod. But for now, if you understand that there is a pod and inside this pod of Kubernetes, you have a container. So container and pod so basically what kubernetes does is it allocates a cluster ip address to this pod okay and you can access the applications inside the containers using this pod cluster ip address so ip addresses are not generated for the containers but they are generated for the pods now don't worry or don't overthink the concept here because it is fairly simple a pod is basically a wrapper that Kubernetes has created for a container to make the life of DevOps engineers easy. Because when we try to deal with uh, containers like hundreds of containers, thousands of containers in production, if you have a wrapper like pod, which can define everything in a YAML file, okay, which can say like if a developer can go to a Git repository or a DevOps engineer can go to a Git repository and look for the pod.yaml file, he will understand everything about the container that okay so this container is running on the application is running inside it on port 80 it has a volume mount then uh, you know what is the networking of it or you will understand multiple details that you have for your docker container so kubernetes has created a wrapper for it okay so most of the cases when you are dealing with a pod you deal with a single container and uh, you know you access the pod sorry you access the container using the cluster ip address that kubernetes gave for pod so who is giving this cluster ip address if you watch the previous videos kubeproxy is generating this cluster ip address okay Perfect. So this is the concept of pod in Kubernetes. So very first application that we are going to deploy, we are going to deploy as a pod. Okay. Don't worry. We are going to, when we do the demo, you will understand this e even in a better way. But one more concept that I wanted to introduce here is cube CTL. What is cube CTL? So kubectl is nothing but like for docker whenever you are trying to run any commands you have the docker cli right in kubernetes you have something called as kubectl so kubectl is command line for kubernetes okay so what is it it's a command line tool for kubernetes so you can directly interact with the kubernetes clusters let's say you have a kubernetes cluster and inside that you have 10 nodes okay so to understand how many nodes are there inside your kubernetes cluster you can just use this kubectl command and say kubectl get nodes okay so how you will understand these commands what are the different options i'll show you don't worry so 
if you want to see how many pods are there you can simply say kubectl get pods if you want to see how many deployments are there kubectl get deployment if you want to delete a deployment you want to create a deployment so for such cases to interact with kubernetes we have kubectl so today's class we will first install kubectl then we will create a kubernetes cluster that is minikube why we will create a minikube kubernetes cluster because in last class i told you I showed you how to create a Kubernetes cluster on AWS using COPS, but for this, you need to have some free credits on AWS. You can also run EKS or any other systems, but for that, you need some free credits. So if you don't want to spend on your Kubernetes clusters, you can learn them using a local Kubernetes cluster that is Minikube or K3S or uh, Kind or any Kubernetes clusters. Installation of all of them are fairly simple. Don't worry about the installations at all. But the only thing is, when you use this local Kubernetes clusters, they are not as equal as your full blown Kubernetes full blown Kubernetes clusters. But for our demo purposes or for our learning purposes, because we don't run huge applications, we are not running applications that are CPU and memory intensive. So even these clusters are fine, and we are not going to set up any high availability. All of these things at this point, so you can use Minikube so that you don't have to spend on your AWS. Okay, so first thing we will see is how to install kubectl. Then we will see how to create a Kubernetes cluster on your local using Minikube. I have a complete video as well where you can refer to this complete video. I'll share the link in the description. If you find today's video uh, is going fast with respect to installation, don't worry, you can refer to this complete video. So kubectl, Minikube, and then we will see how to deploy a pod, which is our first application on Kubernetes. Okay, is the things clear till now? Let me stop sharing here and let me proceed with the <coughs> demo part. So I stop sharing, then let me share my terminal. Okay, just a second, perfect. So now my terminal, let me increase the font a bit. Perfect, so now you guys are able to see my terminal as well, right? So the very first thing that we'll do is start with the installation of kubectl. So to start with the installation of kubectl, just go to your browser, search for kubectl. Don't do anything, just say kubectl installation. You'll go to this specific page called install tool Kubernetes. Click on it, then choose the platform. Do you want to install kubectl on Linux, macOS or Windows? Click on, for example, I'm using macOS. Let me click on macOS. Then there are multiple options. Do you want to install it on Intel or Silicon chip? So Silicon chip is nothing but your Mac uh, M1, M2 or your ARM processors. These are related to Silicon chip. But if you are using the old Mac, uh, then you are basically on Intel. So just copy the script and your Kubernetes insta uh, kubectl installation is done. So this is very, very simple. Just copy the script. Just execute it. You will see that the kubectl is installed. So it barely takes uh, a minute or so for the entire installation now once you have the kubectl installed just search kubectl version so your kubectl is up and running perfect after this like i told you we'll proceed with the installation of a local kubernetes cluster so here there are multiple options you can use minikube k3s kind you can use uh, a micro k8 so there are multiple options but in my case, the videos uh, that I'm going to demonstrate, I will prefer Minikube because many many people or many subscribers already are using Minikube. If I uh, teach them in kind, then they have to uh, do some additional network settings. So that's why I'll proceed with Minikube. But just to let you know that uh, on my local setup or whenever I'm practicing things, I prefer kind. So once you learn Kubernetes, then you can also move towards kind. But for easy way to start with Kubernetes, start with Minikube. But why kind is better is because kind is basically Kubernetes in Docker. That means to say your Kubernetes nodes or your Kubernetes entire setup as is done as Docker containers. Okay, this is a slightly advanced concept how kind handles Kubernetes clusters, but you can create hundreds of Kubernetes clusters even on your personal laptop using kind. Whereas with Minikube, it's not possible. Okay, but for now, let's bother only about one single cluster. So let's use Minikube. So firstly, install Minikube. So to install Minikube again, go to your browser, search for Minikube. You will go to your Minikube uh, Kubernetes page. 
click on it so you will find the installation uh, suggestion where you will be asked with your operating system similarly if you are in linux uh, click on linux then be very careful with the architecture so if you are using uh, x86 64 use this architecture if you are using arm 64 then click on this button arm 64 is a arm processor so most of the times people on linux must be using this x8664 unless you uh, change your configuration or you are using ibm p, p cluster or ibm z cluster uh, sorry uh, p uh, operating system or z operating system so in my case i am using mac os and uh, you know i am using the arm 64 processor so as soon as i change this you will see that there is a change in the command so let me copy these things here and let me execute so as soon as i execute this one you will see that minikube is installed the reason why i did not do is i already have minikube but the installation is that's it like you just in install these two commands and your minikube installation is done you can just search for minikube and you will notice that your minikube installation is done perfect so i have my kubectl i have my minikube my kubectl sorry uh, i just have my minikube i have to proceed with creating a cluster okay so what is minikube minikube is a uh, command line tool that will allow you to create a kubernetes cluster but right now your minikube is only created your kubernetes cluster is not created so to do that the simple command is minikube start so if you just do minikube start your kubernetes cluster will be started but if you are using mac or if you are using uh, windows understand that how minikube creates a cluster is it will create a virtual machine first on top of this virtual machine it will create a single node kubernetes cluster okay what is it single node kubernetes cluster like i told you in production or in uh, you know real time scenarios we will use multi node kubernetes cluster where we will have a master node or we will have three master nodes and we will have three worker nodes four worker nodes 100 worker nodes whatever is the requirement but in general when you are doing high availability you will have three master nodes and you will have n number of worker nodes but because minikube like i told you it's a demo cluster or you know it's a test cluster your practice cluster so it just creates one virtual machine on top of it it runs a single node kubernetes cluster so to create a virtual machine on top of your mac os or on top of your uh, windows firstly you need to have a virtualization platform most of the time it comes by default so if you are on mac all that you need to do is just run this command minikube uh, so okay so you can just use hyperkit this is a command okay so hyperkit comes by default and uh, so what i am doing minikube start pass the memory requirements whatever is the requirement that required and then hyper hyphen driver is equals to hyperkit so here you can change the values you can change it to virtual box you can change it to hyperkit whatever is your requirement okay so let's say you are not bothered about these things uh, today's class we are only learning about the basics of kubernetes so in such cases even if you do this simple minikube start that is more than enough okay so the only difference is if you are just doing minikube start then the kubernetes cluster will by default use your docker driver okay but docker driver better uh, you don't use it when you move to advanced kubernetes concepts in such cases just use this command okay where you will use minikube start and hyphen hyphen driver as hyperkit okay so now uh, i think i have spent enough time in explaining how to install kubernetes cluster now my kubectl is configured to understand that just say kubectl get nodes okay when you do kubectl get nodes you will notice that kubectl is already connected to your kubernetes cluster and it is saying that okay there is one kubernetes cluster that is running sorry there is one node that is running which is called minikube node uh, so minikube Uh, reference that node as minikube node and then the status is ready and this node itself is your control plane and data plane okay because you just have one node architecture here awesome so minikube is done kubernetes is installed my nodes are up and running so what do you have to wait for so you can directly start with installation of pod but how to do it so again go to your kubernetes documentation and search for pod okay so if you see this like i told you pod is basically a yaml file okay so you can simply copy this yaml file because we are just starting with kubernetes and even once you advance with kubernetes also you have to take this examples as reference because nobody is going to uh, mug up 
these things as it will not give you any advantage learning this specific uh, things inside your yaml file is of no use all that you need to understand is like you know copy this specific thing even for your future cases and just understand where do you have to update your commands okay so yaml file will remain same whether you are creating one pod file whether you are creating tomorrow you might be creating pod for different application day after tomorrow you might be creating pod for another application the definition will be the same only thing that will change is these values so these are all the keys and the values will change okay so today let us try with the default image that is provided in the example called nginx but if you want to replace you can replace this image with any application that we have created in our previous applications or in our previous docker uh, demos so we did lot of docker demos where we created my first docker or you know we created some uh, golang based applications we created some python based applications so that's fine you can use any of those images or you can go with the default example that kubernetes is offering you here because we just uh, wanted to run our first pod and see how pod works right so here name of the image is nginx 1.14.2 you can change it like i told you and then whenever you make this modification make sure you make this change as well so here the image that he is uh, giving i mean kubernetes is giving us it says that the container port is 80 but in your case your application container port can be 8000 it can be 9000 it can be anything so modify it accordingly okay but in this case the image is this one and the container port is this one so let us try to first compare this with the docker command okay so that everybody will be clear because you people are coming from docker so let us try to debug and see what is the equivalent command for this in docker so here we are just saying docker run we are trying to run it so docker run minus d so we are running it in the background and then hyphen hyphen image you don't have to give image in docker you can simply say uh, nginx this one hyphen hyphen name what is the name we are giving name as nginx so this is the name and then minus p 80 to 80 so this is the equivalent command to pod okay so the reason why i just explained you in this way is to make you understand that like i told you a pod is basically a specification or a specification on of how to run your container so that's why i just showed you how the equivalent command looks in docker save this one so now your kubectl will come into picture okay so use this command called kubectl which is similar to docker cli here this is a kubernetes cli the command you will say is create minus f pod dot yaml so as soon as you do this you will see that your pod is created that means your application is created so how do you see in docker you will see docker ps so here you will say kubectl get pods okay so you see that the kubernetes pod is running if you do minus o wide then it will print the entire details of this pod it said this is the ip address you can simply do curl and then you can execute this specific ip address you will notice that the uh, okay so in this case you have to log into the cluster right so like previously if you are not exposing this application from docker container to external application we log into the container and we execute it right the curl command or something so in this case you have to log into your kubernetes cluster so the command is easy just do minikube ssh okay so you will log into your kubernetes cluster if you are using a real time kubernetes cluster what you will do is instead of minikube ssh you will ssh to the master or any worker node ip address and then you will just do curl to this specific thing and you will notice that your application is running it says thank you for using nginx so your first ever kubernetes application is created and you were able to execute as well using kubectl get pods minus o wide now the first question that you should ask me is abhishek how do you remember all of these commands so i have been working on kubernetes for a long time but for somebody to start with there is a very good reference called kubernetes or kubectl cheat sheet okay just just search for kubectl cheat sheet you will see this specific page go to this page and you have bunch of kubernetes commands okay so just go through this uh, specific page whenever you uh, want to find any specific command you are not understanding so even i reference this page because it has bunch of examples and all of these examples are very very handy for us to understand 
okay how uh, let's say i want to search one command with respect to uh, get the pods so i can search for get pods and it gives me all options so you can it says that kubectl get pods get in all the namespaces get uh, your complete description of the pod so all of these things are very much provided here so reference kubectl cheat sheet okay so things are fine i have just installed my first pod my pod is running everything looks good i was even able to access the pod once i ssh into the cluster now what is next so you were able to do this similarly you can also do kubectl delete uh, pod provide the name of the pod okay so your pod will be deleted okay so kubectl is basically life cycle but what is next so there are two things next one is <clears throat> like i told you this pod.yaml is a specification of your docker container how a docker container has to be run so here you can enhance this specification as well like i told you here you can add more uh, for example volumes okay the syntax is not correct don't worry about it at all you can add uh, volume mounts so these things we will learn as we go ahead because i don't want to complicate these things and explain you at this point of time itself uh, how to add persistent volumes how to add volumes how to add volume mounts to your pod a lot of these things are not required at this point because we are just learning kubernetes so for now understood uh, you understood how to deploy your first application the next thing you have to ask me is how to add auto scaling auto healing so these were the topics i was telling you that this is how kubernetes is better than docker or any container platform so you should ask me next question is how to add this capabilities because this is the reason why we started learning kubernetes because kubernetes is an enter enterprise platform which we already saw why looking at the architecture and all of the things now the next thing is kubernetes provides auto scaling or auto healing how do you get this to my application so if you ask me this question abhishek how to get this auto healing auto scaling capabilities to my application so the answer is what you will do is on top of the pod you have a wrapper called deployment in kubernetes okay so you have to use your deployment in kubernetes to get these features like auto healing and auto scaling which will be our tomorrow's topics okay so to start with kubernetes you also have, you always have to start with pod but to get this advanced capabilities we will move from pod to deployment now you can ask me why we have to learn pod at all because we have to move to deployment because deployment is just a wrapper okay so tomorrow when i show you how to write a deployment.yaml file you yourself will understand oh okay so deployment and pod are pretty much same only thing is we are just changing the kind here okay so here instead of kind pod we are just modifying it and we are just saying it as kind deployment and we add more things like we add uh, some other things like template and we say okay so this is my pod template specification but more or less what a kubernetes deployment does is it acts as a wrapper on top of your pod which is going to be your way to deploy your applications okay so it is going to be your way to deploy apps in kubernetes in real time production scenarios you will not deploy pods but you will actually deploy your deployments or stateful sets or daemon sets these things which we will learn but to understand those things you need to have your foundations correct that is you need to understand how does a pod works in kubernetes okay so today we understood how does a pod work we logged into the pod we uh, try to uh, execute the pod right all of these things are done final things that i have to show you is how to verify the application let's say you have some issues with respect to the applications that you are uh, running so kubectl also offers some commands like you can say kubectl uh, let me create the pod one more time kubectl so the pod is created now using the kubectl itself you can debug your applications like you know you can say kubectl logs followed by the name of the pod okay so once you provide the name of the pod here you will see the logs of your application okay uh kubectl logs pod nginx right so as soon as you do it you will see the logs oh, okay so it is still not running don't worry about it but using kubectl logs you can verify the logs of your uh, kubernetes pod and uh, using kubectl uh, get pods as you get the pod information what you can also do is you can just say kubectl describe okay followed by the name of your uh, pod so if you do this you will notice that it will print all the information of your pod 
so what is uh, the current status of your pod so if your interviewer is asking you how do you debug a pod you can simply say them that i use a command called kubectl describe pod using which i get the status of everything inside a pod whether the pod is currently running if there is any error what is the error in the pod if there is any issue with the pod what is the issue with the pod so you will get all that informations with the pod and once you understand it you can also get the information of kubectl logs pod followed by the name of the pod if your application is throwing uh, some logs you can also uh, sorry what is the issue here oh sorry kubectl logs nginx so if there is any logs currently this application the demo application that kubernetes has shared us it is not throwing any logs but in real time in production your application will throw the logs where you can see those logs using the kubectl logs nginx okay so let's say if i log into this uh, specific pod one more cluster one more time and if i execute uh, the http server or the nginx server you will notice the logs even uh, with respect to kubectl logs nginx but for now that's okay so the interview question is how do you debug pods or how do you debug applications uh, issues in kubernetes so your two go to commands would be kubectl describe name of the pod nginx and the next command would be kubectl logs name of the pod so this will be your two go to commands describe will explain your complete details of your pod what is the issue with the pod and all and to verify the logs of your pod you can use the kubectl logs command so this is the video for today i request everyone who is watching this video to practice everything that we have learned today because going ahead the complexity will increase we will go in, we will uh, like i told you we will learn about deployments we will learn about services we will talk about auto healing auto scaling all of these things for which it is very important for you guys to practice today's session and also watch the previous videos on kubernetes okay so if you like today's video click on the like button don't forget to share this video with your friends and colleagues i'll see you in the next video take care everyone bye hello everyone my name is abhishek and welcome back to my channel so today is day 34 of our complete devops course congratulations we already reached day 34 of 45 days devops journey and uh, you know in this class we'll be talking about kubernetes deployment so from classes day 30 to 33 we try to understand in depth about the kubernetes architecture how is it compared with docker kubernetes installations on premise as well as cloud and today on day 34 we will be learning about the kubernetes deployment so what is this kubernetes deployment to understand that everyone must have watched the previous video that is day 33 it is very important because we talked about kubernetes pods so let's try to understand the difference here itself right if kubernetes can do things with pod okay so if you can deploy your application onto kubernetes as pod then why do you require deployment okay so what is the comparison that we are going to look at the difference between a container a pod and a deployment right so this is your interview question as well so people will ask you in an interview what is the difference between a container pod and a deployment you might feel this is a very entry level question but if you can't answer this question then you know uh, there itself your interviewer will understand that you don't have uh, experience on kubernetes so basically containers like we have watched from day 23 to day 30 you can create containers using any container platforms like let's say you have created a container using docker okay so to run this container what you usually do is you provide uh, the specifications to run this container on the command line right so how do you do that basically you say docker run minus it right or minus d if you want to run in the detach mode then followed by the name of the image then if there is any port you will expose using minus p if there is any volume you will use minus v if there is any network you will use hyphen hyphen network so similarly you will pass bunch of options here right so this is how container works and this is how i'm not going into the workflow how you create a container you write docker file build docker image and container let's not go there but just le let's assume that this is how you run a container on docker platform so what kubernetes said is okay uh, let me modify this process and let me bring a enterprise model to this so what what does kubernetes say is instead of writing all of these things in the command line you can create a yaml manifest okay and inside this yaml manifest 
you can define all of these things that you are defining here in the command line option and you know you can just say what are the things that are required what is the container image right even even you provide the container image here then what is the port that you want to uh, run uh, this specific container on what is the volumes that you have and what is the network so everything you can provide in the yaml manifest so a pod.yaml or a pod.yaml manifest is nothing but a running specification of your kuban uh, docker container right so it's just like a running specification what are the parameters that you are that you require to run a container is pod so the only difference here is a pod can be a single or multiple containers okay so in a pod you can create a single container or multiple container why do you create multiple containers is because let's say you have an application that is dependent on other other application without which it cannot run or you know uh, you have a container here this is your actual application container and in this you have written your api gateway rules your load balancing rules like sidecar containers so in such cases also you can put both of them inside a single pod so uh, a popular use case is service mesh so in case of service mesh you have a container that is sidecar container and this is your actual container so what is the advantage is if you use a pod you no know, both of them can share the same networking so both of them can communicate using local host and both of them can have the same volume or storage kind of things okay so this is about the pod now finally what is a deployment so if you if you can ask me this question abhishek uh, in day 33 we already saw how to create a pod uh, you know how to deploy a application using a pod we deployed a nginx application now why we have to transition from pod to a deployment because if you can deploy a container or if you can deploy an application as a container in kubernetes using a pod what is the purpose of using a deployment this is a very valid question right so your interviewer can also ask you this question so to answer this question it is very simple so kubernetes like i always told you from day 23 or from day 30 when we started learning kubernetes kubernetes offers you some things which is required i mean which is the requirement for people to move from container platforms like docker to kubernetes what are the two important things that i told you the first thing that i told you is the auto healing behavior the second thing that i told you is auto scaling behavior okay so does pod ha has this capability of implementing auto healing and auto scaling no so pod is equivalent not equivalent is somewhere similar to your container because a pod is doing nothing it is just providing a yaml specification of running your container nothing more than that or in some cases a pod can run multiple containers and it can offer some advantage there because these two container can share networking and uh, share the storage space but the thing that pod cannot do and which is very important is the auto healing and auto scaling capability so who offers this thing in kubernetes this kind of things in kubernetes can done using deployment okay so if you want to do some zero downtime deployments or you know if you want to bring in auto healing auto scaling then you should never deploy your applications as pods in kubernetes but instead you should deploy as deployment and what deployment will do end of the day it will deploy a pod only okay but instead of deploying a pod if you deploy a deployment what it does is let's say you have deployed this deployment okay you have created a deployment resource it will again create some intermediate resource called replica set and then replica set will create something called as pod for now forget about this replica set because i'll teach you as we progress into the video but so this is how you can create pod so the practice that you have to do is or what kubernetes suggests you is do not create pod directly okay so end of the day you will be creating pod only that's why we saw in day 33 how to create a pod what is a pod all of those things you have to know the concept but do not create it directly but create it using a deployment resource okay so what is this resource called deployment resource and what this deployment resource will do is firstly it will create something called as a replica set which is your kubernetes controller okay what is this this is a kubernetes controller and then what happens is this will roll out your pods okay now why you need this intermediate resource so the thing is what a deployment does is inside your deployment you can just say 
what is the number of replicas of your pod that you require okay so why is this required is in some cases you know you always do not want to have a single replica of your container sometimes you are your load will be too high you might want to talk uh, expose your application to uh, multiple concurrent users who can access your applications like you know you can say 100 users should go to pod 1 Hundred users should go to pod pod two. I mean, a replica of pod, uh, replica one of pod, and replica two of pod. That means to say, you are implementing. You can call it as high availability or load balancing or whatever is a general terminology. Okay. So what you can do inside your deployment YAML manifest. Deployment is again a YAML manifest because in Kubernetes everything is a YAML manifest. Okay. So inside your deployment YAML manifest, you can just say replica count as two. But when you say this okay there has to be something in kubernetes that ensures that okay you said i want two replicas okay so deployment will create a pod that i have already told you but if we go back to the topics called auto healing and auto scaling okay what does auto healing mean if you say you need two replicas okay deployment will create using replicas at two uh, two pods but what replicas at additionally does is because it's a kubernetes controller what it will always do is it will ensure that there are two controllers even if some user deletes one of these pods okay uh, sorry there are two pods so even if a user deletes one of these pods he says that okay accidentally i deleted one pod now there is only one pod kubernetes will say don't worry because you have submitted a deployment yaml manifest to me i implement auto healing using this replica set controller okay so it will always ensure that there is two number of replicas on the controller if you are not understanding this wait for the demo in the demo i live in live i'll show you how this is working okay so the end process is you will create a deployment okay and this de deployment will roll out a replica set okay which is called as rs and this will create the number of pods that you have mentioned in the deployment yaml manifest okay what this rs or replica set will do is it will ensure that what user has provided in the yaml manifest it will ensure to be uh, implement the auto healing capability if you say the replica count as 2 if you can say the replica count as 100 this replica set will always ensure that there are 100 replicas of your pod on the kubernetes cluster so that million users can parallelly use it maybe okay so if user deletes one and if he makes it 99 what replica set will do is no no because deployment told me that the uh, pod count has to be 100 so let me put it back to 100 okay so this is how a zero downtime deployment out tomorrow uh, let's say uh, you want to increase the replica count from 100 to 150 okay you can just go to this yaml manifest and change the replica count from 100 to 150 i'll show you how does a deployment yaml look like but for now if you change the replica count from 100 to 150 then rs will say that oh okay there is a new change in the yaml manifest so i have to increase the pod counts uh, from 100 to 150 let me create 50 more pods okay 50 more pods in the sense 50 more replicas of your pod okay so this is how a deployment works it it will create a replica set and this replica sets will create a pod for you okay and this replica set is a kubernetes controller so if you are listening this word for the first time kubernetes controller don't worry you will get acquainted with this because in kubernetes we deal with a lot of controllers so controllers are something which maintains a state you know it always ensures that the desired state is always present on the actual cluster that means desired state and the actual state on the cluster are same so anything that is doing this behavior in kubernetes is called a controller okay so there are some default controllers in kubernetes and you can also create custom controllers like argo cd admission controllers all of these are custom controllers that you are creating whereas the default controllers are also available in kubernetes which ensures that the actual state is always same as the desired state okay so whenever you hear this term called controller just understand that, okay controller is something that will ensure that uh, the state in the yaml manifest if in yaml manifest you are saying uh, something has to be there it is always there in the kubernetes cluster that is maintained by the controllers in kubernetes okay now this is the introduction so the popular interview interview questions here will be what is the difference between pod versus container versus deployment so this is question number 1 if you are not able to answer go back and watch this specific slide okay so here in this slide i clearly explained container versus pod versus deployment
okay so this is question number 1 and the question number 2 will be what is the difference between deployment and replica set so people will confuse here don't worry it's very simple so replica set is basically a kubernetes controller that is the one that is implementing the auto healing feature of your pods if a pod is getting killed or if a uh, deployment says that increase the pod by 1 so who is doing this replica set controller so replica set controller is the one which is actually implementing the auto healing capability by saying that the actual state in the deployment yaml manifest or the actual state in the deployment should be on the cluster okay so this is the desired state that is provided in the yaml manifest which always have to be same on the actual state so when you create a deployment a replica set is created automatically which is responsible for tracking this control controller behavior in kubernetes okay so this is it now let us try to see this in practical and don't get confused it's a very simple topic even if you refer to the kubernetes documentation you can learn about deployments in 30 minutes not more than that okay so let me stop this uh, here and let me share the screen stop now let's take a terminal and let's try to implement this live so share screen perfect let's say i'm new to kubernetes okay and uh, i don't know anything only thing that i know is from the last classes if you use kubectl command you can interact with the kubernetes okay so you just have created a kubernetes cluster it can be mini kube cluster or it can be uh, the clusters on aws using cops that i showed you okay mini kube also we have seen it's very simple to create so i'm assuming all of you have a kubernetes cluster and kubectl configured now if i do kubectl get pods okay so at this point of time there is something so let me delete it okay so that the demo will be clear so i have one deployment and what i'll do using kubectl i'll just delete it so that we we are ready for our demo kubectl delete deploy this specific thing now if you notice kubectl get pods there are no pods kubectl get deploy there are no deployments so in real world scenarios you cannot do all of the like you know you cannot enter multiple commands so you can just say kubectl get all so it will list everything like the get, uh, deployments pod services all the kubernetes by default services it will list out in the particular namespace okay perfect so this is one interview question again if somebody asks you how do you list out all the resources that are available in a particular namespace you can just say kubectl get all and if you want for all the namespaces just say kubectl get all minus a then it will list out for all the namespaces all the applications in your cluster okay but for now just because uh, you know i was doing that command i just thought of explaining you if you go back to the uh, specific course of today we will see what will happen to kubernetes pods because we stopped from there so i have a pod.yaml let me open this pod.yaml this is the same thing that we saw in the last class okay so what is it just a kubernetes pod simple kubernetes pod this is the example that we have copied from the kubernetes documentation okay and what is it doing there is a simple nginx image and let us try to create it how do you create it kubectl apply minus f pod.yaml now what happens as soon as we apply it this will be created on your kubernetes cluster let us see if it got created kubectl get pods awesome it got created how do we check the ip address of this just say minus o wide so it will print kubectl get pods will just give you some information and if you do kubectl get pods minus o wide it will give all the information about the pod okay or you can also give uh, kubectl describe anything is possible so kubectl get pods minus o wide where you got the ip address of this so what i'll do is to access this pod i need to log into my kubernetes cluster so because my kubernetes cluster is mini kube so mini kube just says enter this command called mini kube ssh but if you are using a remote kubernetes cluster you have to use ssh minus i your identity file right followed by the name or the node name or the ip address of the node so that you log into your kubernetes cluster but because mini kube makes our life easy for development it just says that enter mini kube ssh and we will convert the command accordingly and you will log into the kubernetes cluster so now just say curl and this specific thing your application is running this is something that we saw in the last class as well now i'll show you something that will make you understand why deployments are required the same thing that i explained in the uh, theory as well just say kubectl delete pod what was the name of the pod sorry i forgot kubectl get pods okay let me copy this kubectl delete pod nginx 
let's say someone performed this action accidentally someone deleted a pod on your cluster so now when i click on the enter button or let's say for some reason your pod got deleted because of some network issues or for some reason your pod got deleted now the customer who is trying to access your application usually customers won't access using minikube ssh and all because you know they are external people who are outside your kubernetes cluster so in future classes when we learn about ingress we learn about service you will understand how that happens in real time but for for now just assume because we are still in the concept of pod you have done minikube ssh and when you try to access the same application that we did okay so uh, using the ip address i think i forgot the ip address yeah curl 172.17.0.3 now you will notice that the application is not reachable because you have killed the pod the application is gone now you should ask me then what is the advantage of kubernetes because the same thing was happening in docker also you told me that uh, kubernetes is a very robust platform kubernetes supports auto healing auto scaling wait so kubernetes supports all of that but you have to create the correct resource you have created a pod instead you have to create deployment okay now the next question will be abhishek but this syntax is very huge how do i remember all of these things don't worry nobody remembers all of these things and it is also not suggested to remember all of these things what you need to do is just go to official kubernetes documentation or any examples that you want to follow you can you are open to follow any uh, specific website just go to the deployments and you know here you have an example so in the future if you want to uh, deploy your application you can simply modify this image here right and uh, if your application has some volumes and specific thing you can take example in the kubernetes documentation itself you have lot of examples i'll show you you can pick the right examples and then you can just update the fields which are required okay so that is how you have to deal with it don't remember all of this syntax because it's waste of time in your interview nobody will ask you to write the syntax people will ask you what is image in container or what is the labels and selectors what is the role of it or what is the role of replicas this is what people will ask you okay so this is the same thing i have on my uh, cluster as well and if you see here this is what i am telling you inside deployment what you will do is you will say how many pods you want to create do you want to create one pod do you want to create two pod do you want to create three pods for example i'll show you that i want to create only one pod for now now let us see what happens as soon as i create the deployment kubectl get sorry uh, apply minus f or create minus f deployment dot yaml as soon as i do this the deployment is created but the magic is kubectl get deploy deployment is there but you will also notice when you do kubectl get pods pod is also created so this is what i was telling you so who has created this pod like i told you the ecosystem is once you create a deployment it will create something called as a replica set for you and replica set will create a pod for you okay so we can see this same if you do kubectl get deploy you notice that the deployment is there then you do just say kubectl get rs you will see that the replica set is also there rs is short for shortcut for replica set okay and then when you do kubectl get pod your pod is also created okay but what is a deployment deployment is an abstraction that means you don't have to create this replica set you don't have to create this pod what deployment says is okay just create one resource called deployment.yaml and i'll take care of everything for you because i am responsible for implementing auto healing and zero downtime in kubernetes okay but deployment will not do it directly deployment will take help of replica set and replica set is a kubernetes controller which is actually doing it what is a kubernetes controller kubernetes controller is nothing but a go language application that kubernetes has written which will ensure that you know a specific behavior is implemented now in this case what is the behavior the behavior is that the desired state or the desired number of replicas inside the deployment has to be available on the cluster i'll show you live let's take two terminals here okay i took two terminals here and let us see it in live let me just say kubectl delete pod this is the name of the pod right and before i click on enter what i'll do is i'll watch for the pods kubectl get pods minus w when you do minus w that means you are watching it will show you in live what is happening with the pods so as soon as i click this button you will notice that the pod is getting deleted but see the magic what is the magic that replica set is doing for you even before like it initiated it initiated the terminating signal but before the termination is done it is just terminating not terminated okay so before the termination is done what it has done is 
you know a new container is getting created that means a new pod is getting created and you see both of the actions has taken place in parallel terminating running that means the termination and the running are happening in parallel if someone there is a malicious user let's say i am a malicious user or i am a wrong person who has deleted your pod then even without your consent replica set because it it knows that the deployment has told it that the desired replica uh, count for the pod is 1 so it ensured that the pod is always in running state even if someone deletes it there is one pod that is available so if you if you just see kubectl get pods you will notice the same behavior right so the pod is running now let me increase the pod count and show you just say vim deployment.yaml let me increase the pod count to 3 okay now again let me apply this manifest kubectl apply minus f deployment.yaml you can also use kubectl edit command but apply is more easy okay so that's why i just modify uh, the yaml file here and then i just use the apply command so kubectl apply minus f deployment.yaml now let us again watch for the pods kubectl get pods what is the expectation here the replica count should be increased by 3 and who has to do it replica set let us see if replica set is doing it configured now let us see what is going to happen if you see here there are three pods okay now who has created this three pods again replica set so deployment is just a wrapper it's just a high level abstraction deployment by default will not do anything for you it's just like a, a high level abstraction and who does the things for you replica set controller okay now let me delete one of the pods and let us see what happens okay kubectl get pods so there are three pods right let let me delete one of these pods randomly and again what replica set has to do is it has to make sure that three pods are running irrespective of the one pod that you are deleting two pods you are deleting it also it always has to ensure three pods are running because it's a kubernetes controller that is responsible for keeping a state that is a kubernetes controller that is responsible for auto healing let me click enter now let me see uh is the pod deleted okay i just said get sorry i have to do the delete operation i was just confused why uh, kubernetes is not showing anything yeah delete a pod and now let us see what is going to happen see again the behavior is the same even before deleting or parallelly deletion and creation has happened so that's what is the beauty of kubernetes if you say kubectl get pods you will see that the three pods are running awesome right so this is how kubernetes implements the auto healing capability using deployment replica set and pod okay so in real world kubernetes or in production scenarios you will never create a pod directly but what you will do is you will create a deployment okay so this deployment will create replica set for you and replica set will create a pod for you okay so this is how kubernetes will work in real time so your assignment for today will be create a deployment okay so take the same example replace your image okay so here replace your image and play with the kubernetes like i showed you okay uh, kill a pod and see what is going to happen create new one increase the replicas and see if replica sets are getting created or not okay so if you see here kubectl get rs this is the replica set you have not created but replica set is automatically getting created right and that is creating pods for you so understand this behavior keep playing with it okay take more examples of deployments you can just search for you know just come here randomly kubernetes deployment examples okay and just search for github you'll notice bunch of uh, kubernetes examples okay this is official kubernetes repository and you have bunch of examples here just take guestbook example okay and uh, choose any of the thing that you want all in one for example where you have the uh, uh, this one here i guess all in one.yaml and here you have a deployment so you can find bunch of examples in the internet okay just play around with these examples because this is what you will do in real time as well on a day to day basis you will not create pods but you will create deployments okay whether you are creating these deployments directly or you will put it in the git so those are in the future but now you have to understand this concept how kubernetes does zero time deployment what is zero time deployment if you see here i increase the replica count from 1 to 3 but it happened without disturbing the existing pod even i deleted one pod okay then it did not implement uh, sorry disturb the existing application no live traffic is destroyed because parallel 
creation and deletion has taken place so user will not face any disturbance okay of course there is role of service there is role of ingress which we are going to learn in the future but till this point you have to be clear with the concept and i hope you enjoy the video if you like the video click on the like button if you have any questions put the time stamp and ask the question to me then if you like you know feel there is someone who is going to be benefited by these videos please share the videos thank you so much i'll see in the next video take care everyone hello everyone my name is abhishek and welcome back to my channel so today we are at day 35 of our complete devops course and in this class we will try to learn about kubernetes services so service is very critical component of kubernetes so in like like i told you in production scenarios we don't deploy a pod but we usually deploy a deployment right so this is what we learned in the last class so this is our learning from the last class similarly once you deploy a deployment for each deployment most of the times you will create a service in the world of kubernetes so why will we create this service and what is the importance of service let's try to understand in today's class okay so before we learn every anything what we usually do is we'll try to learn the why aspect of it right why do we need a service in kubernetes and what happens if there is no service in kubernetes okay so let's talk about the scenarios of no service okay so now everything that i'm going to talk about is assuming that what if there is no concept of services in kubernetes okay so what will happen so what will happen usually like our previous classes what a developer or devops engineer would do he will deploy his pod as a deployment in kubernetes right and what that pod will do or what that deployment would do it would create a replica set and what replica set would do it would create a pod if the pod count is one it would create a single pod or if the replicas are multiple then it would create multiple replicas let's say we have the requirement of creating three replicas okay so assume this is replica one replica two and replica three why do we need multiple replicas of a pod for a general understanding let's say there is one user then in such cases you don't need it but let's say there are 10 concurrent users concurrent is uh, people trying to use same time let for example uh, you and me might use whatsapp at the same time so uh, like similarly there there can be some thousands of users who are trying to access whatsapp uh, at the same point of time so if every request is going to only one particular pod then this pod will go down because it is getting too much of load so that's why what you usually do is you create multiple replicas and the number of count of replicas depend upon the number of users trying to access your applications and also number of connections one particular pod can take okay so if somebody asks you what is the ideal pod size or what is the ideal pod count what will you say is it depends upon the number of concurrent users and number of users or the number of requests one replica of your pod can i mean one replica of your application can handle so if one uh, replica of your application can handle 10 requests at one time and if you have 100 requests that are coming in then you have to create 10 pods okay so you have to take this decision as a devops engineer as developers you have to sit together and you have to take this decision okay now if we don't deviate let's say there are three pods okay and now for this three pods the problem is that let's say one of these pod has gone down for some reason okay there is some network issue or in in the world of kubernetes in the world of containers a pod going down or a container going down is very common but what is the advantage of Kubernetes is because of its auto healing capability. Okay. So why we move towards Kubernetes is because Kubernetes has this auto healing capability. Containers are ephemeral. So if the containers die, they do not come up. Similarly, if a pod goes down, it will not come up automatically unless you have the auto healing behavior that is implemented by the deployment in Kubernetes or replica set controller in Kubernetes. Right. Sorry. So now let's say you have the auto healing in place so what happens as soon as this pod has gone down what will this uh, replica set say don't worry i'm here let me create one more copy and this copy will be created even before the actual one is deleted or parallelly it happens okay so i have this one back but the problem is that when this one comes up let's say previously the ip addresses were 172.16.3.4 3.5 
and 3.6 i mean 172 uh, 3.4.5 something like that and next time when it came up the ip address will change previously if it is 172.16.3.4 when it comes up this time it might be 172.16.3.8 so what happened is okay the application came up but the ip address of the application has changed and now we are talking about the scenario where there is no services concept in kubernetes so what will happen is your application ip addresses you have to share with your test team you have to share with your other project who is using these applications or thought as third party applications or something what they usually do is they'll try to access this application let's say there are three teams who are trying to access this application or three people who are trying to access this application what you said for user number one this is the ip address user number two this is the ip address user number three this is the ip address so as a devops engineer you thought I created a deployment which created a replica set which created three replicas of pods and there are three users. So parallelly also if they try to use my applications are accessible because I created three uh, replicas of the pods and for one person I said 172.16.3.4 for uh, one person or other team you said 172.16.3.5 and for the others you said 172.16.3.6. So you are in an assumption that everything is right. But now what has happened? Even though you have the auto healing capability of Kubernetes because the IP address has changed. So this is pod one, pod two and pod three. But the IP address is new 172.16.3.8. So this user one or the project one, let's say there are 10 people in project one who are trying to test this application. What they said is your application is not reachable or your application is not working. But as a DevOps engineer, what are you arguing? No, no, my application is there. I can see my application. You are doing something wrong. End of the day, you realized that after debugging, he is trying to send request to 172.16.3.4, but the IP address of your application is 172.16.3.8. So neither he is wrong nor he nor you are wrong because you have implemented auto healing and he said that I have used the same IP address that you that you gave. So this is the problem. And even if you look at the real world, okay, so the real world will never work like this. Let's say all of us use google.com on a day to day basis. Okay, will Google ever tell you that try to access my application on an IP address called 100.64.2.7? And for uh, let's say there is another user, Google will say, okay, access me on 172.16.2.7. 3.9 so let's say google has 100 replicas now google will never tell you that 1 million user access on this port uh, this particular ip address another million people access on this specific ip address that doesn't work like that so what is the concept here the concept is google does a load balancing okay and even i told you when i introduced you all to kubernetes so that there is a concept called load balancing in kubernetes okay and i'll teach you later so what you will tell this user project one is okay do not access using this ip addresses what you will do is i will create like you know you created a deployment for this you will tell them that on top of this i will create something called as a service the shortcut for service is svc okay so i will create something called as service and what you do is instead of accessing this specific things okay directly try to access the service Okay, so what now the user project one team does is instead of accessing the 172.16.3.4, let's say there are three replicas, let's write all the IP addresses 172.16.3.5 and 172.16.3.6. Let's say these are the three IP addresses that you got from Kubernetes clusters, and then there are three projects one is user project one, then user project two then user project three previously you were giving them this ip addresses and you are asking them to access the application using the ip addresses but what was going wrong when the pod was going down you have the auto healing behavior but the problem is that the auto healing behavior when it spins up a new pod the ip address was changed from 172.16.3.4 to 3.8 this can happen to this specific pod as well and this can happen to this specific pod as well so what you will do is instead of this behavior instead of giving them each and every ip addresses you can simply change this behavior by creating a service on top of the deployment
so if you say that this is a deployment that has created three pods using a replica set on top of this you will create something called as a service okay and what this service does is it acts as a load balancer how does it acts as a load balancer it uses a component in kubernetes that is called as queue proxy now let's quickly not go into it because you will get confused for now let's assume that service is doing it ignore about queue proxy for now okay so what service is offering is load balancing and you will tell this three user projects that instead of accessing the ip address and this ip address can change very frequently so what you will do is access me using the service name so what these people will do or what this development teams will do instead of accessing the payments applications on this specific ip addresses they will say payment dot default dot svc okay so let's say this is the name of the service that kubernetes provided you as soon as you create a service what kubernetes does is it, this is your name of the service this is the namespace and this is dot svc so kubernetes will give you something like this and you can tell them that okay you can access my applications on this specific ip address that is the service ip address or the load balancing ip address so these people will try to access these applications on the same ip address okay so everybody will use the same ip address underlying what this load balancer what this service using queue proxy will do is it will forward the request let's say 10 requests are coming from here 10 requests are coming from here 10 requests are coming from here it will just say okay send 10 requests here send 10 requests here and send 10 requests here so this is one problem without service you would have faced okay so if there were no services concept in kubernetes you would fail terribly even implementing the auto healing capability even you have deployments and pods your applications will not work for certain people when the application goes down it comes up with a new ip address so there is a problem and who is solving this problem the problem is solved by service so what is one point that we learned about the advantage of service that is load balancing now you should immediately get a question from the previous explanation that i just uh, you know that i just showed you you should get a question that okay abhishek let's go back to the diagram once i got a doubt so what you should ask is okay let's say that you gave this ip address i mean instead of ip address you gave this url to them so you know service should also face the same problem right because if user 1 project was not able to reach this specific pod because the ip address url has changed right from 3.4 it has changed to 3.8 now a service what is it actually doing it is just taking the request from this user and it is forwarding the request but even the service should face the same problem because the ip address has changed the service should be sending the request to 172.16.3.4 but the new ip address is 172.16.3.8 right so you must ask me a question that okay abhishek even the 10 requests that service has sent to 172.16.3.4 would fail and again the problem is same user project 1 who is trying to access this pod using the service would fail terribly right because there is no traffic so this is another problem that service solve that is called as discovery okay so what is it called the second advantage that you get using service is service discovery so what service says is okay i understood the problem that if i am a, if i am keeping a track of a deployment okay let's say this is service service is keeping a track of deployment and which is creating three pods for example and if one of these ip address is changed let's say this ip address has changed if service also follows the same problem of keeping a track of ip address the problem is not solved at all so what service said is okay i will not bother about ip address at all okay i will come up with a new process which is called as labels and selectors okay so how service does a service discovery unlike the previous example that i showed you unlike manually keeping track of ip addresses which can change any number of times okay and even if there are two to three pods let's say service can keep track of ip addresses what if there are 1000 pods this can happen like companies like google they might have 1000 pods okay i'm just giving an example 
or they can have some 50 to 60 pods. So if service manually keeps track of all the IP addresses, then this problem will arrive. So that's why what service said is, I'll introduce a new mechanism called labels and selectors. Okay. And what this labels and selectors will do is, okay, for every pod that is getting created, DevOps engineers or developers, what they will do is they will apply a label. Okay. So this label will be common for all the pods. Let's say this is payments, right? So you can create a uh, label for each of these pods called payment. Now what service says is, I will not bother about IP address. I will only watch for the pods with this specific label called payment. Okay. So this can go down 100 times or this can go down 1000 times. I don't bother about it because I'm only watching about label. So next time if it, if this goes down and this can come up with a new, new IP address, but the label will remain the same. Why will label remain the same? Because the replica set controller, what it will do is it will deploy a new pod with the same YAML that it got, right? That is auto healing. So if a service is keeping track of your pods using labels instead of IP address and the label is always the same, the problem is solved. So this is the service discovery mechanism of Kubernetes service. So how Kubernetes service will do a service mechanism using labels and selectors. Okay. So this is why Kubernetes service concept is advanced. Okay. Why Kubernetes service has a very good service discovery mechanism is because of the concept that it uses, which is called as labels and selectors. Right. I hope you got this answer. Let's go back to the previous slide to make it even clear. So what service will do is, okay, I'll draw a new diagram probably. So the end mechanism would be you create a deployment. Okay. So this is your deployment. And how do you create a deployment? Basically, you create a YAML manifest, right? So let's say you created a YAML manifest. What as a DevOps engineer you will do is whenever you create this deployment, okay? So you provide all the specification that is required and all of the things. Along with that, inside your metadata, okay? Metadata of your uh, deployment, you create something called as a label. Label is just a tag. You can just say, app payment for example so now what this deployment will do it will create a replica set and what this replica set will do let's say there are two replicas it will create pod 1 and this is pod 2 and for both the pods it will have a label like a pod will, if you just do kubectl edit pod you can see the pod right or you can do kubectl describe pod and you can you can see the pod so what you will see is for this pod there is a label called app payment similarly there is also a label here called app payment perfect so let's say this service has gone down i might be repeating this multiple times but this is very important let's say this pod has gone down so the ip address will change but what will replica set say okay i have the yaml manifest and according to the yaml manifest the pod has to be created with this specific label so even if this is going down 100 times 100 times it will come up with the same labels and selector now what we will do from today's learning is we will create a service right because service offers a load balancing that is required along with that what service is also doing is instead of looking at looking or keeping track of ip addresses it will keep track of this label so whenever a new pod is created, let's say you increase the replica from two to three also. So again, a new pod will be created with label app payment. So service will understand, oh, okay, there is a new pod. So I have to keep track of this as well. So this is how service maintains a service discovery process. So this is very important. If interviewers are asking you, you should be able to answer this. Okay. So this is the concept of labels and selectors. Perfect. First one we learned is load balancing. Second one we learned is about service discovery. Let's learn about the third thing. So the third thing and the other important thing, what a service can do is any guesses what a service can do apart from this is it can also expose to external world. Now, 
what is this another thing that i am going to talk about don't worry we will do practicals and we will do demos of each and everything so even if in case in today's theory you are understanding few things and you are waiting for the demo don't worry in tomorrow's class we will do a detailed demo of service okay so i just don't want to hurry up in the theory and uh, move on to the demo part because practicals are as equal as your theory so if you understand theory very well then practicals you will able to understand very easy so we talked about two things if we see here i explained already two things and i hope these two things are clear load balancing and service discovery now the third thing is exposing your application to the world what is this so yesterday's class what we have seen is whenever we are creating a deployment right the pod that got created what has happened to this pod this pod came up with a ip address 172.16.3.4 okay whether you are accessing this you know uh, directly by sshing into the mini cube or you have created a your kubernetes cluster and you have ssh to the master or any worker node what is actually happening is whoever has access to this kubernetes cluster right it can be mini cube it can be cops it can be eks anything so whoever has access to this they can log into the kubernetes cluster and they can hit the application but this is not a real world scenario right so you cannot ask your customer that okay ssh to my machine log into kubernetes and access my application on this ip address will google ever tell you this complicated process so google.com you are anywhere in the world you don't require ssh or you don't require anything you directly access your application on https.google.com right so this is what you try to do so this is something that kubernetes cannot offer you directly by using deployments so deployments can create a pod and uh, a user can ssh onto your kubernetes cluster then ssh into uh, probably master node worker node and they can you know access the application but for end user somewhere your user might be sitting in you know somewhere in italy or he might be sitting somewhere in austria now you cannot tell him that okay you cannot have access to my application directly because you are not in my network uh, firstly you have to come to my network use vpn you cannot say all of these things right so what service will do additionally is a service can expose your application okay so by expose your application is service can allow your application to access outside the kubernetes cluster right outside the kx cluster so how service will do it is basically whenever you are taking a kubernetes service you are provided with three options okay we will see that in life don't worry like i'm telling you whenever you are creating a kubernetes service resource in the yaml manifest what you can say is you can create this service of three types type 1 cluster ip type 2 you can create it as a node port mode type 3 you can create it as a load balancer there are other types as well headless service and all i am not talking about all of those things okay so these are the default types so cluster ip node port and load balancing so what happens is if you create this service using a cluster ip mode any service so this will be a by default behavior so your application will still be only accessed inside the kubernetes cluster nothing will change for you only if you create a service with this cluster ip mode what happens is you will get the two benefits that we talked till now that is discovery and load balancing okay what are you getting discovery and load balancing but if you create service of type node port mode then what service will do is it will allow your application to be accessed inside your organization okay so anybody within your organization or anybody within your network who is not you know uh, technically they might not have access to the kubernetes cluster but they have access to your worker node ip addresses okay so if i have to just put it in a very simple way whoever has access to your nodes node ip addresses only they can access the application if you create your service as type node port mode okay and finally load balancer type so what is load balancer type so load balancer type is basically your service will expose your application to external world 
let's say you have deployed these uh, you know everything on a eks kubernetes cluster so if you are creating a service of load balancer type then you will get a elastic load balancer ip address for your specific service and whoever is trying to access you know they can use this elastic any anywhere in the world because this is a public ip address right so they can access using the public ip address got it so like i was telling you previously payments dot default dot svc so this is your you know uh the service name or this is your uh, this is where your service get resolved but when you create a service as uh, you know external world or load balancer service type of mode load balancer then if it is on any cloud provider then depending upon the cloud provider implementation this load balancer will only work on cloud providers okay so if you are trying to do it on your mini cube or if you are trying to do it by default it will not work okay so there is a project which is trying to get this work on the mini cube as well but for now let's not go into the details if you try to do by default on mini cube or any local kubernetes clusters the service type load balancer will not work so what is the solution there that we will learn in future classes there where we will learn about ingresses okay but if you create load balancer service type then that means to say on your cloud on your cloud provider there will be a elastic load balancer ip address that will be created which is the public ip address using which you can access your application okay if you create it as a node port mode then you can access within your whoever has access to your aws or whoever has access to your node uh, inside the aws they can access your application cluster ip nobody can access whoever just has access to uh, kubernetes can access this thing now i'll explain everything in one simple diagram so that you will understand it in a much clearer way so let's say this is your entire kubernetes cluster what you have done is you created a deployment replica set pod all of these things is inside a node okay let me this is pod okay now let's assume all of this is inside a node this is worker node 1 for example this is your kubernetes cluster which has assume two to three nodes okay but for easy understanding i did not draw all of them now there is a customer okay so what you will do is on top of this like i told you you will create something called as a service so service will watch for the pods now let's try to understand the customer's flow or let's try to understand the user flow depending upon the type of service if you create this service as a cluster ip service this is case 1 you have created this as a cluster ip so what will this service do is if you create this using a cluster ip mode then this service will say okay don't worry about anything the application should be accessed only for the people who has access to this kubernetes cluster so there is a customer or there is a user who is trying to access this application he is sitting out of outside your organization okay so let's say this is public and this is your organization something like you are using your home wifi and he is using his home wifi very easy understand okay so this is public and this is your organization so he tries to reach but you know you, he cannot reach uh, this specific thing let's say he has access to the organization as well he cannot reach the application because the problem is the application is sitting somewhere here and he do not have access to this specific thing right so that is not practically possible now let's say you have created a load balancer type service what will happen is the service that got created it will say the if you assume this cluster is on aws it will notify aws that oh i mean kubernetes api server will notify aws that okay eks i have a service of type load balancer mode so can you give me a elastic load balancer ip address okay which means a public ip address and which component of kubernetes is doing it there is a component in kubernetes that we learned that is called as cloud control manager 
right this is part of your kubernetes master node what is this component kubernetes cloud control manager so the cloud control manager will generate a public ip address using the aws implementation and it will return a public ip address and now what we what pod will i mean what service will do is it will say whoever wants to access these pods you can access using a public ip address okay so this is the public ip address so this public ip address by the name itself it's public so that anyone who has access to internet you just need to have access to internet so user who has access to internet can access the application because the service type is load balancer finally you have something called as node port mode so when you create a service of node port mode then whoever has access like this is the public right or this is the user now he only has access to public internet or he only has access to resources in the internet but what a service type node port will do is it will say that okay what i will do is instead of allowing only people who has access to kubernetes cluster what i will do is i will say because the service is of type node port mode i can allow access to people who has access to this worker node 1 or worker node 2 or worker node 3 okay so whoever can access the worker node ip addresses like like let's say these worker nodes are ec2 instances okay so whoever has access to the ec2 instance ip addresses they can access me okay so the first case is if you create a load balancer type then anybody in the world can access it if you create a node port type mode then anybody who has access to worker nodes or the ec2 instances traffic or the vpc traffic they can have access to the pods or the applications and in the third case that is cluster ip mode then nobody has access to it even if you have access to the vpc even if you have access to the ec2 instance only if you can log into this kubernetes cluster and if you have access to the network inside the kubernetes cluster that is you have access to the container network or you have access to flannel calico whatever you have configured only they can access okay so these are the three things this is how a kubernetes service works so what are the three advantages if we go back so the first advantage that kubernetes service offers you is load balancing second advantage that kubernetes service offers you is service discovery third advantage is exposing the applications to the world so i explained each and everything using examples and i hope you understood it like understand right from here if you have not understood the video go back to this specific slide where i have explained what happens if you don't have a service in kubernetes watch the video one more time you have the auto healing capability that deployment is giving you why you need a kubernetes service i clearly explained here that is the ip address will get changed whenever a container comes up if you know you have configured auto healing so a new pod comes up but the ip address has changed so you need a discovery mechanism and you know to manage the traffic between the pods you need a load balancing mechanism similarly if you want to make this applications available to internet available to specific people in your organization like probably you want everybody in the world to access this application if it is a open source application or if it is application that you want everybody to access okay so for example best example is amazon.com okay so here if we go back to this slide when will you choose cluster ip mode when will you choose uh, node port mode and when will you choose load balancer mode for example amazon.com let's say we are working for amazon okay and if as a devops engineer if you have to understand services in a very simple words if you are working for amazon.com what you will do is you will create a service of type load balancer this is just example guys okay so that anybody in the world can access amazon.com okay there is one application let's say uh, that is called amazon.com so if you create a service of type load balancer then everybody in the world can access this if you create so amazon.com is a load balancer don't get confused i'm just giving it as an example if you want people inside your organization or people who have access to your vpc your nodes right only those people to access then you will create service of type node port mode if you want only devops engineers or you know if you want only people who have access to your kubernetes cluster network then you will create cluster ip mode take this as an assignment try to write few lines try to see you know if you understood the concept well try to draw a diagram for this and you know post it on your linkedin post it on your github so you know 
this is how you can uh, correct your understanding or you know you can see if your understanding is right or wrong i hope you enjoy the video if you like the video click on the like button if you have any questions put that questions on the uh, comment section also if you have any feedback share that with me finally don't forget to subscribe my channel abhishek viramala and share this with your friends and colleagues thank you so much i'll see you in the next video take care everyone bye hello everyone my name is abhishek and welcome back to my channel so today we are at day 36 of our complete devops course and in this class we'll be talking about kubernetes interview questions part 1 now what is this and why i have decided to do this video because ideally today's class has to be on the practical services implementation and introduction to ingress but why i have decided to do this interview questions is like you know we have been learning about kubernetes from past 5 to 6 days and we have covered a lot of topics like kubernetes architecture comparison with docker deployment pods containers versus pods so we have covered some very interesting topics and these are the topics that interviewers will ask you uh, you know during your course of interview so i thought to check how much concept have you grabbed or you know how much have you understood from the past videos so this is a really good exercise that we are going to do today you can consider it as a mock interview you can consider it as anything but what you will do is try to answer the questions like whenever i show you the question number 1 okay firstly i'll not show you the answer i'll just show you the question so try to see how many are you able to answer before i reveal the answer okay so that you can give or you can assess your score by yourself so if you want you can also comment your score below so there is no competition kind of a thing here but the only thing is you will understand how others are you know taking the topics or are they practicing the topic so that they are remembering the concepts so that you can consider it as a feedback or retrospective for yourself okay so without wasting any time let us quickly jump on to the video i will have 10 questions for you i mean i have 10 questions for you and let us see how many of you can answer how many number of questions so firstly the question number 1 sorry for that lines uh, i can quickly remove them no worries there so just clear the drawings here perfect so the question number 1 is what is the difference between docker and kubernetes so today's questions will be scenario based questions and so here what you need to do is try to answer this question by yourself okay pause the video here and try to see if you can answer this question assume you are an interview you are in an interview and see if you can answer the difference between docker and kubernetes okay so the answer for this would be uh, i have also explained this in the previous uh, video i think the very first class when i have introduced you people to uh, kubernetes in that class itself i told you that docker is a container platform and kubernetes is a container orchestration platform i also have answers for you don't worry so kubernetes is a container orchestration platform and what kubernetes adds to the docker is like you know containers are ephemeral in nature that means to say a containers can go down containers you know for multiple reasons uh, if a container goes down then your application is already down so your end user who is trying to access your application he will see a traffic loss so to avoid that you can move to a container orchestration platform solutions like kubernetes which will offer you auto healing auto scaling which will offer you like you know because kubernetes is a cluster itself like in production you can uh, join or combine multiple virtual machines and create a kubernetes cluster so that even if one of your nodes let's say docker is a single node platform right you install docker on a platform and you start your container if that node itself goes down for example your laptop has gone down for some reason so your application is not reachable but what kubernetes offers is if one of the node goes down because it's a cluster it will immediately move the pod from that specific node to a different node and finally it also has many enterprise capabilities like uh, load balancing it can offer uh, integration with custom resource definitions or you know you can uh, deploy uh, any custom kubernetes clusters uh, controllers that are developed by other people like for example ingress controllers right so there are multiple ingress controllers which can offer you uh, advanced capabilities so in nutshell you can extend the capabilities of kubernetes cluster using the custom resources as well so this is the primary difference between docker and kubernetes uh, let's say you have not 
uh, understood this one because you are watching this video uh, even watch even before watching the previous videos then i'll highly recommend you to watch our video i think day 31 where i explained and compared the difference between docker and kubernetes so it was complete 30 minutes class where we took plenty enough time to understand the comparison between docker and kubernetes so now uh, if you are able to answer this question assuming that you are in an interview you are in an interview then yeah uh, you get one mark here <laughs> okay so question number 2 what are the main components of kubernetes architecture so this is one of the most asked interview questions okay so you go to an any kubernetes interview the interviewer will definitely ask you this question because kubernetes has lot of components and when i explained you in day number 33 i guess the architecture of kubernetes that is what i actually like you know i took 40 minutes of time to explain about the kubernetes architecture because it's a very important topic whenever you plan to learn about kubernetes you should understand how a you know how multiple components of kubernetes are talking to each other and how the kubernetes is maintaining its robustness so in a nutshell when somebody asks you this question what you need to say is on a very high level i can divide kubernetes into control plane and the data plane on the control plane you have components like api server which is uh, you know responsible for handling the apis talking to the end users and then you have the scheduler which is responsible for scheduling the resources on the kubernetes cluster then you have etcd etcd is a kubernetes object store where you know it, uh, all the resources of the kubernetes are stored uh, as objects in kubernetes and then you have controller manager so controller manager is basically uh, for example you have a replication uh, replica set or replication controller so you know controller manager is something that takes care of this default controllers in kubernetes and then you have cloud control manager so cloud control manager is in the last class i explained you let's say you want to implement the kubernetes on any cloud provider for example amazon has implemented kubernetes as managed service on eks platform so whenever you install this kubernetes cluster what these cloud providers will do they will contribute to the cloud control manager and they will say like let's say you created a service of type load balancer so what happens under the hood is the cloud control manager has the logic that is written by the people at aws which can spin up a load balancer ip address for you okay so when you create a load balancer service type you are getting a load balancer ip address on the aws but who is generating this right so cloud control manager is doing this with the help of the contributions from the people of aws tomorrow if i write my own cloud then what happens is i have to go ahead and contribute to cloud control manager so that uh, kubernetes can uh, like let's say somebody creates a service on my cloud then the cloud control manager can act and give you a load balancer ip address so this is about the control plane or the master node uh, components of kubernetes and then you have the data plane where you have three primary components one is kubelet one is kube proxy and then the final one is container runtime so people also say there is one more component called kube dns but you can restrict yourself to here where you can talk about kubelet kube proxy and container runtime so kubelet you all know it is responsible for uh, managing the pods let's say if pod is running in a healthy state or not a, a pod has to be restarted if the pod has gone down then kubelet takes care of starting the pod so kubelet is a component that is responsible for managing the pods on the nodes then you have kube proxy kube proxy is a networking uh, component of kubernetes uh, which typically takes care of uh, updating the ip tables uh, for example you create a service of type node port so what under the hood happens is the kube proxy is the one that understands that okay there is a, a service that is created of type uh, node port so i have to go ahead and update the ip tables in such a way that somebody access the node ip address colon a specific port the request has to be sent to the pod okay so kube proxy is the one that takes care of the networking finally you have container runtime what is container runtime so container runtime is nothing but for a container to run you need a runtime for example if you have a java application and for java application to run you have a java runtime similarly for containers to run you have container runtime and kubernetes is not opinionated uh, at, about this one like you can use docker shim you can use uh, container d you can use creo previously kubernetes was opinionated because uh, it only used to support uh, docker shim out of the box 
okay uh, but now uh, you know out of the box nothing is supported you have to install the container runtime on each and every node okay then so here interviewer might ask you one question uh, i've seen uh, sometimes like when you say kubernetes is not using docker shim out of the box or kubernetes is not using docker as runtime out of the box does that mean kubernetes is not supporting docker no it supports docker it supports docker shim but nothing is available out of the box let's say previously when you install a kubernetes cluster on each worker node you used to get docker shim runtime out of the box but now it's up to you like you can install docker shim you can install container d you can install creo any container runtime that implements the kubernetes container runtime interface okay no let's not go into the details of it but if you want to understand the details you can watch my kubernetes architecture video that should be day 32 or 33 then what are the main differences between docker swam and kubernetes so this i haven't covered in my previous videos but many people are asking about it in the comment section so uh, docker swam uh, and Kubernetes, what is the difference, why we have to use Kubernetes, when we have to use Docker Swam. So basically, if you look at the popularity, Kubernetes is quite popular even when you compare against any container orchestration environments, whether it can be Cloud Foundry, it can be MesoS, Marathon, Docker Swam. So Kubernetes is a quite popular choice. And if you talk about Docker Swam, Docker Swam is a Docker based solution, right? So the major difference is Kubernetes is suited for the enterprise like you know large organizations or even mid-scaled organizations whereas docker swam is very easy to install it is very easy to use but it is only suitable for the small scale or you know very simple uh, ap applications the reason for that is you know when you are going for scaling kubernetes has multiple options and when you are going for you know uh, advanced networking capabilities kubernetes can uh, do advanced networking capabilities very easily like you can use flannel calico or uh, you know uh, sdn ovn so all of these things with kubernetes very easily and with docker swam the support is very limited and the other important thing is that you have a lot of third party uh, support for kubernetes like for example the cncf community it has been very active and uh, because kubernetes supports something called as custom resource definitions so anybody who can write a kubernetes controller if they feel that Kubernetes is not supporting something, they can extend the capabilities of Kubernetes, right? Because it's all about installing and deploying a controller in Kubernetes and you can extend the capabilities to whatever extent that you want. So this is the comparison on a very high level. So if you are looking for a mid-scale or large-scale solution, then go for Kubernetes. But if you don't bother about the scale, uh, then you know you can choose Docker Swarm because Docker Swarm is also very easy and very uh, simple to install and use. But you know, if you look at the market today, Kubernetes has uh, large openings. And uh, if you even take 10 JDs out of 10 JDs, 10 JDs in DevOps will have uh, Kubernetes. So why should you go for Docker Swam if you are learning about Kubernetes or if you are learning about container orchestration environments? Then what is the difference between Docker container and a Kubernetes pod? So again, I took almost 30 minutes to explain this difference in one of the videos. Uh, so if you are trying to answer this question, you should definitely uh, answer and, uh, you know, uh, let us see how many people will get this uh, answers correct. So sometimes what happens is you people can answer the questions, but you people will not be able to phrase the answers. Okay. So whenever the interviewer is asking, so if you take a lot of time thinking about the answer, then interviewer might feel that, okay, so probably he does not know the answer or he is searching for the answer somewhere. Uh, because these days interview, interviews are also not face to face, right? So interviewer might feel that you don't know the answer. So these are some of the standard questions that you can expect in any interview. So try to be ready with the answers for these questions. Okay. So what is the difference between Docker container and a Kubernetes pod? So as I explained, a Kubernetes pod is nothing but a runtime specification or, you know, uh, what you do is in a YAML file, Kubernetes resources are basically written in YAML files. Okay. So in a YAML file, you can put together all of the things that are required for your container to run. So that itself is a pod. But the only difference is we in a pod, like pod is the lowest level deployment in Kubernetes. In a pod, you can create one single container or multiple containers. So if you have multiple containers, then both of them can talk 
within the pod using the same network okay and they can also use the uh, uh, same storage or you know same uh, resources inside the pod so that is the only difference between a pod and a container so you can simply say pod is nothing but a runtime specification of a container what is a namespace in kubernetes so again many people were asking this question uh, in the comment section uh, explain about the namespace namespace is a very simple concept okay so namespace is nothing but a Kubernetes cluster is used by multiple people in your organization, right? So there are multiple projects and multiple projects for each project. You cannot create a Kubernetes cluster in production because end of the day, let's say you have 20 projects which are working on 20 microservices. All of these 20 microservices together might, uh, you know, create your uh, end application. Uh, if you take about Amazon.com for Amazon, there can be 20 different teams working on 20 different microservices. But end of the day for Amazon.com to function, what, what is required? All these 20 microservices should talk to each other and should form a single application. Okay. It will be bundled uh, probably as different applications, but all of them are deployed in one single uh, Kubernetes cluster end of the day. So a Kubernetes cluster, I mean, in a Kubernetes cluster, namespace is nothing but a logical isolation of resources, networks, RBAC and everything that you can do. For example, there are two projects and two projects you want to deploy on a Kubernetes cluster. So you will say for project A, uh, you will create a namespace called namespace A. For project B, you will create namespace called namespace B. And within project A, there can be 10 developers. They can work on namespace A and the other 10 developers in project B, they can work in namespace B. So what happens is you have provided them the same Kubernetes cluster, but you have created two different namespaces for them. So in that way, they have a logical separation. Physically, they are in the same Kubernetes cluster, but logically they are separated with concepts like RBAC. What is RBAC? Authentication. Then they have different network policies. They have, you know, isolation of resources. Like in namespace A, let's say there is a deployment. In namespace B, there is another deployment. Okay. So here there is application A and here there is application B. So developers of namespace A, you can restrict from accessing the applications resources in the namespace B. So this is how your namespace isolation works. Okay. So to separate the isolation or, you know, to create the isolation, to form this uh, concept, what you can do is you can make use of the RBACs. Okay. RBAC is nothing but role-based access control. So we'll talk about the RBAC uh, for people who don't know about RBAC. Don't worry about it. But for now, if somebody is asking you what is a namespace, you can simply tell a Kubernetes namespace is a logical isolation of resources so that multiple project teams in a company can work on the same Kubernetes cluster, but each of them will have a dedicated namespace so that nobody will interrupt the work of the other people or other projects. What is the role of kube proxy? So this is question number six till question number five. Uh, let us see how many people were able to answer all the five questions till question number five, because more four questions I think we covered already in our previous classes. Let's see. Uh, now question number six. What is the role of Q proxy? So again, this I explained uh, in one of the previous classes. So Q proxy. I think I explained even during the question number two, where uh, we discussed about the architecture of Kubernetes. But if somebody asks you dedicatedly, like, uh, please elaborate more on the queue proxy. So I've written some description here. You can write down this description somewhere or, you know, you can as it easily, uh, you know, you can uh, copy paste the description uh, when somebody is asking you. Queue proxy basically is about configuring the network rules okay on each of the node that means to say like the fundamental example that i gave you if a user creates a service of node port mode okay so that means to say your pod can be accessed on that specific node ip call in the port that you configured in your service.yml file right but who is doing these things under the hood right so who is saying that when somebody sends a request on the node ip followed by the port number the request has to be routed to the pod. Okay. Somebody has to say this configuration, right? So Q proxy is the one. What it does is on every Linux machine, there is a concept called IP tables. Okay. So Q proxy, I mean, you, you can configure Q proxy in different modes, but by default one is Q proxy updates the IP tables. So whenever somebody access the application using, let's say your service is on node port mode. So if they access the URL or if they hit the URL node port colon port uh, port number. 
the queue proxy because it has configured the ip tables the request is sent from that specific node port colon uh, sorry node ip colon port to the pod okay so this entire routing is done using the kernel and the ip tables so you can also use ipvs and other things but by default mode is ip tables in kubernetes okay so this is about queue proxy and i've also provided the uh, you know description here so that if you want you can uh, copy this description and you can uh, say say it as it is okay when you want to convey it to your interviewer then what is the different type sorry what are the different types of services within kubernetes so day number 36 uh, sorry 35 when we talked about services i explained three different services in kubernetes so this is the question uh, again uh, where if somebody asks you what are the different types of services within kubernetes so fundamentally i explained you services has three major responsibilities right one is load balancing one is uh, you know the service uh, discovery and finally to expose your applications to the external world these are the three major responsibilities of a service in kubernetes so discover service discovery load balancing and exposing the applications so service discovery and load balancing i already explained now this question is about how to expose this application uh, outside the kubernetes cluster or you know what is the uh, networking that you have configured or what are the different types of services that are available in Kubernetes, service modes that are available in Kubernetes. So the answer to the question is you can create three different of types of services in Kubernetes. One is you can configure the service mode as cluster IP mode. Second is you can configure the service mode as node port mode. And the third is you can configure the service mode as load balancer mode. So this is a straightforward answer, but your interviewer will definitely you know, ask you to elaborate more. Can you elaborate the difference between cluster mode, node port mode and the load balancer mode? So in the last class, I explained a uh, difference between each of them. In tomorrow's class, you will see the practicals as well. But again, if you have to explain you the cluster IP mode, what happens if you create a service as a cluster IP mode? So your pods or, you know, your service will basically get a cluster IP. So if you try to access your service, so you will be only able to access the service using the cluster IP, which is only available or accessible within the Kubernetes cluster. Okay. Whereas if you try to create the service as type node port mode, then your service can be accessed on the node IP call on the port number that you define in your service.yaml file. So what happens with that? Anybody in your organization who has the access to your node IP address, for example, you have created a Kubernetes cluster on your AWS platform. Okay. So what happens is you have configured your worker nodes as EC2 instances. So now anybody who can basically reach that EC2 instance. So you, if you can just ping the IP address of the EC2 instance, then that means to say that your node is accessible to that specific users. So whoever can access the nodes, whoever can access the worker nodes, or whoever can access the uh, IP address of your Kubernetes cluster, then they can basically access your applications if they are deployed in the node port mode. But for the end users who are sitting outside your organization, okay? So your end user is somewhere in India and your applications or your Kubernetes cluster is somewhere in the US. So in such cases, if they don't have access to your network, and if they are outside your organization, then you have to expose your applications as load balancer mode. Okay. So what happens if you do that? You are cloud control manager component of Kubernetes. Basically, it will create a public IP address for you or it will create a load balancer IP address for you and using which you can anybody in the world can access that applications. Okay. So this can also be done using ingress, but the question is only related to services. So let us restrict to service only. So again, the question is same here. What is the difference between node port and load balancer type service? Because this is a very frequently asked question. I thought uh, I'll also put this question here. So the description is same, the one that I just explained. So you can pause the video here and you can read the description. Question number one, what is the role of kubelet? Okay, so here, when I explained to you about the architecture of Kubernetes, so I told you that Kubelet is a very important component, right? Because Kubelet is very, I mean, Kubelet is the one that is responsible for managing your pod lifecycle on the worker nodes. So whenever you install or whenever you schedule a 
pod on the worker node using the cube scheduler so the pod can go down for some reason or you know a pod can uh, something can happen to your pod so there has to be someone who has to inform the uh, cube api server that okay the pod has gone down now uh, you have to send the uh, information to the replica set or the deployment and it has to scale up the pod okay so if your pod count has to be one so if for some reason the pod has gone down and the replica has become zero so your replica set controller has to know that okay the pod has gone down so i have to ensure that the pod comes up and i have to scale up the pod so this information is actually continuously monitored by the kubelet so kubelet always watches that uh, pod if it goes down then it sends the notification to the api server and then api server not notifies the replica set controller and then you know the replica set controller again spins up or you know uh, it increases the scale to the required amount so this is the life cycle so on a high level what pod is doing so pod is the one that is responsible for managing the uh, sorry kubelet is the one that is responsible for managing the pods on the worker nodes so i have provided the description as well so that you can uh, explain the answer to uh, to your interviewer during the interviews question number 10 and this is a very important question what are your day to day activities on kubernetes so many people get confused here and i see also many people asking that abhishek i'm getting the theory knowledge i'm able to practice uh, using your videos uh, we were able to you know get some understanding of kubernetes and the devops itself but when somebody asks us the question what are the day to day activities uh, as a devops engineer or what are the day to day activities uh, on kubernetes we are not able to answer so don't worry about it actually you know it's a very easy question or it's a very simple question to answer and if you are starting with a you know good answer like this will be your first question interviewer can ask you what are your day to day activities on uh, devops or what are the day to day activities on kubernetes so because this is your first question or most probably uh, in first one or two questions if you answer this question uh, in a very good way then it boosts your confidence and this question is a very simple one you don't have to uh, complicate the question or complicate your answer simply say them that you know as part of the uh, devops engineer role we manage kubernetes clusters for our organization and we also ensure that you know the applications are deployed onto the kubernetes cluster and there are no issues with the application so we have set up monitoring on our kubernetes cluster we ensure that whenever there are bugs on the kubernetes cluster for example uh, the developers are not able to troubleshoot some issue uh, with respect to pods developers are not able to troubleshoot with respect to services they are not able to uh, you know uh, route the traffic in, inside the kubernetes cluster so in such cases as subject matter expertise on the kubernetes clusters we come into picture and we solve their problems but apart from that we also do a lot of maintenance activities for example uh, we have uh, kubernetes clusters with three master nodes and 10 worker nodes so we have to do some continuous uh, maintenance activities on these worker nodes probably uh, you know upgrading the versions of this wor uh, worker nodes or uh, installing some default mandatory packages ensuring that these worker nodes are not uh, security uh, sec exposed to security vulnerabilities so all of these things are our day to day activities on kubernetes apart from that we also serve as subject matter expertise on kubernetes so if anyone in the organization has any issues with kubernetes they create a jira items for us or you know they create tickets for us and we will help them in solving or uh, making them understand the concept of kubernetes so this is how you can explain so it is a very simple answer it's a very straightforward answer you don't have to uh, you know get scared about this question so these are the 10 questions that i have for today and uh, let us see how many people were able to get all the 10 questions correct because you know most of the questions we have covered i think eight questions we already covered in the previous videos so let us see what is the uh, scorecard <laughs> and uh, yeah in future videos we will learn about uh, ingress we will learn about the practical implementation of uh, services we will also talk about custom resource definitions we will see a few things about helm so it's going to be four or five videos more on kubernetes and after that we'll also do uh, kubernetes interview questions part 2 so if you like the video click on the like button and uh, if you feel that someone who is not following our uh, 45 days of devops course please share these videos with them so that they'll also get benefit out of the videos thank you so much i'll see you in the next video take care everyone bye
Hello everyone, my name is Abhishek and welcome back to my channel. So today we are at day 37 of our complete DevOps course and in this class we will deep dive into Kubernetes services. That means we will be doing practical session on Kubernetes service where you will see uh, the aspects that we were talking about like the load balancing, service discovery as well as how to expose your applications to outside world in Kubernetes. So everything will be practical. I'll recommend everybody to watch the video till the end because we are doing practical uh, traffic viewing using kubeshark so kubeshark is a tool uh, which will help you to understand how traffic is flowing within the kubernetes how each component of kubernetes is talking uh, like you know how one component is talking to the other component so it will be a very interesting session and uh, you will see all the capabilities using kubeshark like the uh, how service is uh, doing the load balancing within multiple pods how uh, a you know uh, service is able to discover the uh, pods and also we will see how to expose the applications to outside world as well as uh, within the Kubernetes cluster and within your organization. Perfect. So without wasting any time, I'll quickly jump onto the video. But disclaimer and very important point is watch the video till the end because even if you know the concept of services, even if you understand Kubernetes, uh, using the Kubeshark, I'm going to show you how uh, the traffic is flowing. So it is very uh, useful session. Okay, perfect. So let me stop this share and uh, go on to the uh, Kubernetes cluster. Uh, where is it? Perfect. So here, for the purpose of demo, I already have a, a Kubernetes cluster. Let me clear this thing. Yeah. So this is the Kubernetes cluster that I have. It's a Minikube Kubernetes cluster. If you just see Minikube status, you will see that the Kubernetes cluster is already up and running. Uh, for instance, if you don't know how to create a Kubernetes cluster, uh, you can watch my previous videos where I explained how to create a Kubernetes cluster, both using Minikube and also if you want to create on AWS, if you have some uh, free coupons or the resources, then you can use COPS to create the Kubernetes cluster, which I explained in the last classes. Perfect. So I have the Minikube uh, Kubernetes cluster running and let me clear up all the resources that I currently have. Okay. So if I just do kubectl get all. So I was just using uh, the default namespace for my other activities. So let me just clear all of these things. I just have a deployment and a service. So kubectl delete uh, deploy. Let me de uh, delete this deployment that I have. And then I'll also delete the service that I have kubectl delete uh, SVC. Uh, this is the service that I have and you will not remove the default uh, service that is Kubernetes service itself. So now if I just do kubectl get all, I should see just the Kubernetes default service that is running. Perfect. So I think we are good for the demo. So for the demo, what I've done is, uh, you know, in the previous classes, we use the repository called Docker zero to hero. So I'll use the same repository. Uh, you can either use that repository or you can use your own uh, images if you have one. So this is the repository docker zero to hero. So you can also get that repository from my uh, GitHub. So you can simply go here, GitHub, um, Viramala, docker zero to hero. So this is the repository guys, where you have uh, real time practical uh, Python as well as Golang images, uh, which are basically, uh, you know, front end and back end based applications. So either you can use these things or you can uh, personally use your own ones, but, uh, if you want to use, then you can go to this GitHub repository called, uh, this is my uh, username in GitHub and docker zero to hero is the link. I'll also put the link in the description. Okay, let me go back to the screen. So here, now let's start from the uh, scratch where I'll create a deployment first and uh, you know, uh, deployment is something that creates your replica set, which indeed creates a pods, but these pods are only accessible within your Kubernetes cluster. So we have seen that in the last classes because those pods come up with a default cluster IP address. And if you are using the cluster IP address, then the problem is that the cluster IP is only accessible within the Kubernetes cluster. So firstly, let me, uh, you know, go to that folder examples. And inside examples, I have uh, either you can go to Python application or you can go to Golang based application. So go to Python based application uh, in the demo. I'll use Python and you know, here I have the Docker file, this file, uh, let me remove this so that I can do right from the scratch and you people can understand. So here I just have a Docker file and uh, this is the code and service.yaml also we can delete. 
So you will not have these files in the repository. If you go to the repository, you will see DevOps folder, which is the application itself. And uh, you will have a Docker file and the requirements.txt. So now the thing that we will do is we will create a deployment here uh, and we will deploy this uh, application as a deployment onto the Kubernetes cluster. So this is a Docker file, guys. So it's a very uh, simple Python Django based application and the application uh, has an entry point and CMD. So you don't have to pass any arguments, commands. Uh, it will uh, self execute when you uh, run the uh, container. So for that, uh, firstly, let's build this Docker image. So uh, let me call this as uh, Docker build, right? So I'm giving a tag called uh, Python sample application demo and uh, V1. Right. This is the image name and this is the tag. So we will create the image so that we will do the things right from zero. So the image is created. Now I have the image ready here. Now the thing is we have to start with the deployment because I want to deploy this onto the Kubernetes cluster. So as I told you in the last classes, you don't have to remember any syntaxes. Just go here, search for Kubernetes uh, deployment. So you will go to a page uh, called deployments in Kubernetes and here just take the example that is available. Okay. Just copy this example onto the uh, terminal. Let me call this file as uh, deployment.yaml. Perfect. So let me paste it here. So this is the deployment. We need to edit the fields. So as I told you in the previous classes, you don't have to remember anything. You just have to know which fields have to be modified. Right. So I don't want three replicas. Let me just choose uh, two replicas for the demo so that I can show you the load balancing as well with the service. So I'm just creating two replicas of my uh, pod. So name, I'll just modify the name as uh, let me call this as sample Python app. Okay. And we have to choose the labels guys. So labels is important because uh, uh, let's say someone wants to use this deployment or you know you want uh, a selector so i explained the concept of labels and selectors so this applies for every resource in kubernetes so every time you create a resource in kubernetes whether it is deployment or whether it is any kind of uh, resource try to put some labels on top of them okay so here i'll say label as uh, just again i'll use the same label called sample python app okay replicas as two and uh, uh, selector we can use the same thing so this selector is required for the deployment to actually look into, uh, you know, labels and selectors concept where this is the selector which will uh, look for the labels called app sample Python application. OK, so that's why what I'll do is inside the uh, this is the pod template, right? So inside the pod template also, you can choose the same label. OK, sample Python application. Now, who will be looking for this label? Service will also be looking for this label because service works on the concept of labels and selectors. So whenever I'm, I'm going to create service after this, I'll show you when we create service, we have to remember that we have to copy this label as is and we have to use this inside the selector field of the service. Only then your service will be able to find out this pod. For example, if I remove this and uh, let's say uh, it it is conflicting information in uh, service as well as in pod, uh, then you know your service will not be able to find the pod and you will uh, see a traffic loss. So we can also try that as an example, no problem. Now uh, here you can call it as a Python app, just a, a name of the container, it does not matter. But the main thing is you have to replace with the image that we have just created, okay? So let me save this and uh, what was the image that we created? So this is the image, right? So let me open this one and put the image name here. Okay. So this is what I'm going to uh, show you guys that you don't have to remember any syntax for the deployments or services because the file will remain always the same. And on which port is the application running? My application is running on the 8000 port. Okay. So how do you know this? It's very simple. You can open the uh, Docker file and you know, you will know on which port your application is running. So either it will be part of the expose statement or you can also find that as part of the uh, command. Okay. So whenever you are running the uh, uh, application, so as developers or DevOps engineers, you should know on which port your application is running. Got it. So now this is the deployment.yaml. I have uh, 
successfully updated the container port. I have updated the image. Then I have updated some labels and selectors. So this is it. Now you can go ahead and create the deployment. kubectl apply minus f deployment dot yaml. So if I create this deployment, so you will see that uh, you know uh, it says that the deployment is created, and you can also use the kubectl get deploy. What does kubectl get deploy do? kubectl will talk to your Kubernetes API server and it will get the information of deploy. Okay. So here you will see that kubectl get deploy returns saying that, okay, I've created a deployment and there are two pods that you have requested and both of the pods are available. So if you don't believe uh, kubectl, you can just say kubectl uh, get pods, which will show you the two pods that are created as well. Okay. So this is how you can get the information of the pods that are running. But if you want to get the IP addresses of these pods as well, what you can do, kubectl get pods minus O wide, which will give you the information of your IP address of the pods. Okay. So if you are keen enough uh, to, I mean, if you are keen to understand uh, what exactly is happening when you run this kubectl commands, you can simply add a verbo statement. Like, you know, instead of just saying kubectl get pods, you can say kubectl get pods minus V uh, is equals to seven, for example. Okay. So it will give you the information. What is it saying? Firstly, loaded the kube config file. Okay. After that, it is connecting to the API server. Okay. So here, this is the API server and uh, it is trying to use this API call with the Kubernetes to get the list of pods. Then it says that the request headers are accepted and it got the response as 200. So it has returned you the information of the pods. As you increase the verbosity level, you will get more information about this uh, Kubernetes pods. Like you can do nine, which is the maximum verbosity level. Then you get more information about the API call, like the JSON uh, that it is passing and what is the response, what is the request. So this is only if you are uh, curious to understand how uh, kubectl is talking to the Kubernetes API server and what is happening behind the scenes when you run the kubectl get pods command. Okay, so now this is not relevant to our class today. So you can just do kubectl get pods minus o wide. Now deployment has created two pods and we all know the practical use cases of deployments, right? So what it does, it's a high level uh, wrapper and uh, you know, it rolls out a replica set and you know, replica set is a controller, which makes sure that uh, the state of the pods is matching according to the deployment.yaml that we have created. So for example, if I delete one of these pods, you already know that, okay, let me delete this kubectl uh, delete pod then replica set will create a new pod. We have already seen this in the last classes with uh, practicals as well. So if I again do kubectl get pods, you will see that the two pods are running. And this time probably the IP address might change. Okay, so if I just say kubectl get pods minus O wide, see here the IP addresses were 0 0.5, 0 0.6. Now the IP address has changed to 0 0.7 and 0 0.5. So this is, the problem that we were discussing about Kubernetes deployments, right? So if the IP address has changed, now the user who was trying to access the application on 0 0.6, they will say that, oh, I was using 0 0.6 and I'm getting a traffic loss. But as DevOps engineer, you will say, no, no, uh, there are two pods, Expect expectation is two pods and two pods are running, so I'm not responsible. So whose problem is this? The problem is with respect to Kubernetes because Kubernetes, whenever it has created a new replica, okay? It has changed the IP address because Kubernetes does a dynamic allocation of IP address. It's not a static allocation. If it was a static allocation, so whenever a new pod comes up, every time it comes up with the same IP address. But in case of dynamic allocation, the IP address might change. So now this is the reason why you need a service discovery mechanism. Okay. So if Kubernetes services was identifying the pods, okay, using the IP address, what happens? then, you know, it becomes wrong, right? So what I means to say is you will face a traffic loss because the IP address has changed. So that's why, as I explained to you in the last classes, we use a concept called labels and selectors. So using labels and selectors, what you do is you identify, like Kubernetes service identifies the pods using the labels and selector concepts so that every time a new pod comes up, its label will remain the same. Right, because the label is same. Label is just like a stamp or you can understand it as a tag. So every time a pod comes up, it definitely comes up with the same tag. IP address might change, but the tag or the stamp or the label is always the same. So service will say that, oh, okay, 
So uh, I noticed that a new pod came up and uh, let me check the label. Okay, label is correct. Uh, this is what information the DevOps engineer has given me that uh, this is my selector. Uh, selector should match the label of the pod and a new pod is created. So this pod belongs to me. So I can send the traffic to this new pod as well. So that is how it works. And I explained this thing in the last class using uh, theory and the diagrams as well. So now we will go ahead and see this behavior. Okay, firstly, uh, what happens is if you want to stop here, let's say if you just want to use the deployments, then what you can do is you can just say minikube SSH and uh, use one of these IP address, right? And uh, probably you can access them using a curl command. You can just say curl HTTP uh, followed by this uh, specific IP address. Just use minus L because uh, the application that I have written, uh, it requires a redirect. So you will notice, okay, colon 8000, right? Because the application was running on the port 8000. So you will notice that there is a uh, traffic here. So what, what is happening here? Slash demo as well. Sorry, guys. So uh, the application which I have written is running on the context root called slash demo. So you have to use this specific thing, curl followed by the IP address colon port uh, on which the application is running and the context root of the application. Okay, so don't worry why I am changing this information. I'm not changing anything. You can just go to this uh, Python web application. It's a Django based application. If you have knowledge on Django, you can just go here and you can see the context root of the application. If you go to the urls.py, you will see uh, here actually. Uh, yeah, if you go here to the urls.py, you will see that the context root is slash demo. Okay, so that's why I'm accessing the application on slash demo. I'm not changing anything. Don't worry. So you just have to access it on 172.17.0.5 followed by the port of the container followed by the context root that is slash demo. Now you will see that there is a traffic that you are trying to access. What does it say? Uh, learn DevOps with strong foundational knowledge and practical understand understanding. Please share the channel with your friends and colleagues. So this is a very simple uh, static application that I have written. Now the problem you all know that, okay, uh, if you use the same IP address and try to access it, uh, let's say use this IP address, say use the same command. Okay, so curl minus L HTTP colon double slash colon 8000 slash demo. You will see that there is no traffic. We were getting only uh, you know, we were able to access the application and we were able to get the response only inside the Kubernetes cluster. This is because a pod by default will have only the cluster uh, IP addresses. That is, I mean, a pod by default will just have the cluster network attached to it. So if it is a cluster network, you have to access it using the cluster itself, right? You have to log into the cluster and access it. But this is not expected. Your customers will be definitely, if you have internal customers, internal customers can be within your organization. But if you have external customers, they will be even outside your organization. So you have to two, solve the two problems here, right? One is people within your organization, okay? For people within the organization, like I told you, you can use the Kubernetes service concept. Let's say this is your uh, Kubernetes cluster, for example. Uh, where is this? Okay, so uh, I was trying to draw here, but I hope you uh, understood that uh, if you are trying to use people within your organization, um, okay, let me try to grab something here. Yeah, probably I can write here. So let's say this is your Kubernetes cluster. Okay, or let me uh, take a external diagram itself. Draw auto draw. We can use this auto draw to explain. Okay, clear this thing. Start over, right? So let's say this is your Kubernetes cluster. Okay, and this is your organization. Okay, so this is your organization and this is your Kubernetes cluster and this is your application. So you can have people within your organization trying to access this application. Or you can might you you might also have people who are outside the organization itself, right? So if you are building applications for uh, your organization, if they are internal applications, then what you need is you have to expose this application on the Kubernetes worker node IP addresses, so that you know these people can directly access 
using the kubernetes worker node ip address if you want to use uh, uh, i mean if you want this application to be used by external customers they don't even have access to your organization so you need to create a public ip address for this application so that you know everybody in the world can access your applications so these two cases can be solved even in yesterday's interview question i explained if you want to solve this problem one you have to use node port mode right and for two you have to use load balancer mode so let us see both of these cases okay let us try to understand a node port mode and let us also try to understand the load balancer mode perfect so if you want to learn these things in detail uh, you can watch my previous videos where i have explained all of these things in detail but today's video will be going to be a practical video and i am also going to show you the same things using virus arc first of all let us proceed with the creation of service so service.yaml let me uh, create this file here and again, I'll not remember anything. I'll just go to the uh, Kubernetes website itself and say Kubernetes service. Okay. So if I'm doing a Kubernetes service here, uh, let, let me clear this diagram. Uh, go to annotate and clear. Perfect. So if you go to Kubernetes service, so here you will notice that just copy this, uh, I mean, go to this uh, page. And here you have multiple example of the services. So the default one, like I told you, it's just serves for the cluster IP address. I don't want it. So firstly, let us uh, demonstrate the node port example. Okay. What happens in node port? Your application will be ex uh, exposed on the node IP address. Okay. So in my case, the node IP address is the minikube node IP address because I'm using minikube, right? So let me just copy this one, right? Because this is an example for node port and uh, paste it here. Uh, let me delete this so that it will be clear. Okay. Perfect. Now, what are the things that I have to change? Firstly, you can give any name to for your service. You can also keep it as is my service. Uh, let me change this thing to uh, Python Django app service. You can give any random name. Okay. Don't worry about it. Now, the most important thing is to keep this selector similar to the deployment or the pods that you have created, not the deployment to the pods because service will be directly looking at the pods using the selectors. If there are 100 pods, then this selector will be looking at 100 pods that have this label. Okay. It doesn't matter. Tomorrow, if you have 200 pods, 300 pods, what service says is, I don't bother about the number. I'll be only looking at pods that has this label if any pod uh, let's say uh, uh, unexpectedly someone else has created a pod with this specific thing then your service will forward the traffic to that pod as well if it is in the same namespace okay so that's how the service works so service will only bother about the labels and selector okay so what you need to do is you have to go back to your kubernetes pod uh, or the deployment.yaml file inside the deployment inside the pod template okay make sure that you are copying it from here Okay. Sometimes for the deployments, you might have different labels and selectors. Okay. So always pick from the template section inside the templates. You have this label pick from here, go back to the service example. Oh, sorry. I did not save it. <laughs> My bad. No problem. I'll just uh, go back to the page and save it one more time. Uh, copy it one more time. So this is the service Copy it from here. copy and then delete this comment delete this comment so that it is clear now copy this uh, thing app python so always make sure that you uh, copy the right thing because if you don't copy the right ones you will uh, land into some problems with the labels and selectors and it will be difficult to debug okay so that's why I try to copy it as is now i have copied this one okay so app sample python application Perfect. I have copied. Now choose any node port that you want. Uh, I can keep as is as well. I can use uh, 30,007 port number. And one important thing is to change the target port. What is target port? Target port is basically the port on which your application is running. So my application is running on port 8000. So I'll choose this as the target port. And do I need to change anything? I don't. Uh, like I can change this one. Uh, Python django sample app it can be anything now let me just save this kubectl apply minus f service.yaml okay so as soon as you apply this 
the service will be created. Again, if you want to debug or understand more, then what you can do, just say kubectl get svc minus v is equals to 9. You will get the entire information, how the call is, uh, how the traffic is going within the cluster, how the kubectl get is working, and you will get the, all the information. But if you just ignore for the purpose of the demo, you can just say kubectl get svc, and you will get the application that is running. This is the cluster IP. Don't get confused because you have created the service using the node port. You will see that there is a port mapping that is done. So the cluster IP colon 80 port is mapped with the node IP address 30,007. Okay. What does this mean? This means to say that either you can do minikube SSH, copy this IP address. Okay. And you know, you can also access your application using this cluster IP address of the service that is HTTP colon this IP address colon 80 slash demo. Okay. Even if you do this, you will get the traffic minus L I have to pass. Okay. Even using this, you will get the traffic or what you can do is you can otherwise use the node port IP address. Now, why this is not recommended? Because you can already do this using the pod IP addresses, right? So a service or any resource that you are creating in Kubernetes whether you are creating in node port mode, whether you are creating in load balancer mode or anything, cluster IP will definitely be there, right? So additionally, you are creating node port. Uh, additionally, when you are creating service in node port mode, you will get a port mapping and that port mapping is nothing but what Kubernetes service has done for you. It says that, okay, if you don't want to access using the cluster IP address, you can use the node IP address and I have mapped the port that is on port 80 with 30,007 port that you have provided in the service.yml. So now I can simply say minikube IP uh, to get the IP address of the minikube node. If it is a EC2 instance, you can get the IP address of the EC2 instance. You already know how to get the IP address of EC, EC2 instance, right? So this is the IP address. What I can simply do is I can say curl minus L. So for other applications, you might not need this minus L, but for my application, because there is a redirect happening uh, within the application, I require this. And now HTTP colon. This is the node IP address. So this is the interesting thing, guys. Now I'm going to show you how the application is accessed from the uh, node IP address. Okay. So now I'm not logging into the Kubernetes cluster. I can also access this using the browser. I'll show you that as well. Okay. So why I can access using the browser? Because it is the same laptop. If you access from your browser, you will not get the traffic. If you want to access using from uh, other people's browser, then you have to use the load balancer IP address because it becomes external, right? It, it becomes external traffic. But if you are accessing from your laptop, the Minikube IP address, you can do that because you are already in the same laptop. You know the, uh, right? Your laptop can connect to Minikube because it is part of the, uh, what it is, end of the day, what Minikube is doing, it is just installing a virtual machine on top of your laptop. And, uh, you know, uh, because both of them are in the same network, you can access. But outside people cannot access it because you have just exposed using the node port mode. So what I'll do is colon 80. Watch this carefully. I'm not using colon 8000 because I'm basically, you know, what service is doing is, this is the node IP address and this is the port. When you do it, it maps to, even if you don't use it, uh, there is no problem. Uh, sorry, uh, you have to use 30,007, right? Uh, you cannot use 80 because if you use 80, uh, service, uh, sorry, the node IP address would be looking for applications on 80. Nothing will be running. So if you have, if you do 30,007, then this is how the service will route the traffic to the ports. Okay. So this is the node IP address. This is the node port followed by slash demo. Now you will see that the application is accessible. You can use the same IP address. Okay, just let me copy the same thing and you can also access from your browser. This is from the browser, right? So this is the application that is running. Now, if you take this same URL, you are watching this video, right? If you take this same URL and if you try to access this from outside, it will not work. Okay, why will it, why will it not work? Because what is the reason? you have not exposed your application to outside world. So this is how you expose your applications to other people in your organization or somebody who has access to your node IP addresses or someone who has access to your EC2 instances or your virtual machines. Now, how to access the application to outside world? Okay, so to do that, you will make a very simple change. Just go to your service called kubectl edit service. Okay. And what was the name of the service? Sorry, I don't remember. So let me do kubectl get service and uh, let me edit this service. Okay. kubectl edit svc 
and once you edit you will see uh, the type as node port mode right so in one of the places we have selected the type as node port just simply make the modification and change it to load balancer now this will not work here because we are using minikube okay if just the same thing just modify it to type load balancer and it will work for you if you are on your ec2 instance or if you are on any cloud provider because load balancer type is only uh, uh, you know supported on the cloud providers right and who does that the thing is done by your uh, sorry cloud control manager right so what you need to do is just go back here kubectl edit svc and search for node port and just modify the thing to your load balancer okay what is the mode that you will change load balancer i hope the syntax is right perfect so now if you do kubectl get svc the ip address will not be allocated the external ip will remain pending here because this is mini cube if it was aws or if it was azure or if it was GP gcp you will get the ip address here and who is generating that ip address for you the cloud control manager of kubernetes why cloud control manager is generating because the people of aws azure and gcp have told the cloud control manager they have contributed to the cloud control manager saying that if you find a service of type load balancer then use the internal components of aws or azure and gcp and generate a ip address okay so that is why the external ip will be generated in my case it will not be generated there is a project called uh, metal lb uh, using which you can expose the applications on minikube as well you can search for the project called metal lb okay so you can expose the uh, it it can generate you one uh, public ip address as well but this is still a beta project uh, you know uh, and you don't have to try that as well because if you know the concept that's more than enough you can uh, if you have a ec2 instance you can try it or else just understand that you will get a public ip address something like uh, 32.48 uh, or 100 dot something and you can share this ip address to your customers or someone and they can access that using the public ip address okay so this is the concept of how to expose your applications okay but i told you about three concepts right uh, whenever we are talking about the service i promise you that a service can do three things one is load balancing two is service discovery and three is exposing the applications okay so third part is clear to you till now right because i showed you using node port i showed you using uh, load balancer mode how does this work and all so now let us see the second part that is service discovery okay so to understand the service discovery just make a very simple change kubectl edit svc uh, sorry again we need the service name if not we will get uh, both the services in the edit and it will just be confusing so kubectl get service this is the uh, name of the services kubectl edit service followed by the name of the service and now what you will do to understand the concept of discovery just modify the selector okay search for uh, selector see if you are not comfortable with the kubectl edit what you can also do is just use the same service.yaml file that you have created okay but the only condition is whenever you have created this you must have used the apply command okay so either if you have used the kubectl apply command to create the service then you can just say vim and uh, edit the service and reapply the service or else you can also use the kubectl edit command okay whichever uh, is easy for you but i will recommend this one uh, always create your services using the apply so that in future you can modify it now what i'll do is i'll just come here and remove one character let us see if even if you can access your applications like this okay uh, then kubectl apply minus f service.yaml okay so now the labels and selectors are different so the labels of your pod is sample uh, application what was that so the label that you have on your uh, pod is sample python app but here on the service it is sample python ap so let us see if the service discovery uh, will be able to detect the pods what i'm saying is it shouldn't because what is the reason why it shouldn't uh, detect because the labels and selectors are different so what was the curl command that i used uh, let me show you from the browser itself uh, this is the curl command right so let me just copy this one more time 
and let me try from the browser. So this time you'll notice, ah, sorry, uh, I just need this one, right? I don't need curl. So this time you'll notice that the application is not accessible. Why is it not accessible? Even using the curl, you can see that you will not couldn't connect to the server. So by just changing the labels and selector, by just changing the selector, you understood that the service is not discoverable. So again, go back and modify. So you will understand the concept of how service is using the service discovery concept using the labels and selector. So now let's, let me reapply kubectl apply minus F. So just give it one minute, right? Because the kube proxy has to update the rules. Uh, the IP tables and all the things have to be updated. So just give it a minute. Uh, don't get uh, pan. I mean, don't go into a situation of thinking, oh, this is not working. It will just take a minute, uh, not not even minute, sometime. So sometimes the refresh will take time. So you will notice that the service discovery is done. So now what are the two things that you have already learned? One is service discovery and one is how to expose your application. So finally, now I'll show you the load balancing as well. So you have two applications, right? kubectl get pods. Why you need load balancing? I explained like uh, if there was only one replica, if there are 100 requests, it will be difficult for one uh, replica to serve all the requests. So if you have, uh, depending upon the load of your application, you can create multiple replicas, but by default, the deployments or the pods do not have load balancing. If you create service, you will get the load balancing. This is what I explained. Now let us see that in practical. So for that, I have the cube shark as well. So what I am doing, Kubeshark is a very simple application. Uh, you can also install the Kubeshark and I recommend you to install Kubeshark. I'll make a full detailed video on Kubeshark as well. But if you want to install, the installation is very simple. Just go to uh, the Kubeshark documentation. Okay, so you will understand a lot about Kubernetes if you, uh, you know, if you have this Kubeshark. Uh, because it explains you how the traffic is flowing within the cluster and all of the things. So go to the install and run page here. And this is the simple curl command, just execute this curl command or if you are on Mac, you can just run these two commands and your cube shark is up. Then you just have to run this specific thing called cube shark tap minus A or you can do cube shark tap, but this will only be limiting your uh, cube shark to one single namespace. If you want to expose cube shark to all the namespaces or if you want uh, to understand the Kubernetes uh, traffic flow for all the namespaces, just run this command called cube shark tap minus A and you will see this page. Okay, so you can access the Kubeshark uh, browser on the port called 8899, localhost colon 8899. It will automatically open in your browser. Uh, so you will get this beautiful page where, you know, you can do a lot of things on Kubeshark. So this video, I'm not going to talk about the details of Kubeshark. I'm just using this to explain you the concept of load balancing in service. But I'll do a dedicated video on Kubeshark where I'll explain you how does the traffic flow and all. But here I'll just spend two minutes to explain you. Okay, now let me run this curl command five times. Okay, so this one I'll just copy it and I'll run for five times so that you can understand. Let me run for six times and show you the load balancing. One, uh, okay, let me remove this so that uh, it will not print the output. Let me just remove minus L. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Now, what should be the expected output is the Kubernetes service has to send request uh, three times or, you know, uh, using the round robin, it has to send request to 172.17.0.7 as well as 172.17.0.5. Let us see, we made six requests. Let us see if the requests are, uh, you know, segregated amongst these two parts or not. Okay, let me go back here and let me see. So once the request went to 172.17.0.5, then Okay, let me just refresh this page called apply. Just let me apply and show you. Uh, perfect. Let me rerun. Sorry, I had some old data. Let me do it one more time. One, two, three, uh, four, five and six. Okay, so sorry guys, I had some refresh information. Uh, so because of which it was not showing. But now what you will see here is when you apply this thing, uh, I think it is taking some time to uh, refresh and get the data. Just give a minute. Yeah, 
sorry, I had to restart uh, the Cube Shark. So I just created it before the demo, and for some time, uh, you know, the proxy was disconnected. So what I did was I went back and restarted the Cube Shark. So I'll show you how to restart these things and all uh, in the video where I uh, demonstrate about the Cube Shark. But what happened was this is the Cube Shark which is running, and if you see here error while proxying the request and context cancelled. Okay, so this was the error I got and what I did was I have re-established the connection with uh, between the kubeshark and my Kubernetes cluster. Okay, so this is the command uh, in general called kubeshark proxy and what it will do is it will re-establish the connection. Uh, so I just did not want to uh, go into the details but uh, yeah, unfortunately <laughs> because the uh, the connection was disabled so i had to uh, explain you all of these things perfect now but the demo that i wanted to show you here is now the cube shark is back you will see that i have sent six requests right uh, so these are the six requests that i have sent and see what is happening so once the request went to 172.17.0.5 and again the request went to 172.17.0.7 .7. again it went to 172.0.17.0.5 172.17.0.7 again it went to 172.17.0.5 so what is happening is Kubernetes service is doing the load balancing. Okay. So what I did is I tried to access the application on this specific port called 192.168.64.10 and using which the request actually this is the service and it it is once sending the request to 172.17.0.7 and another time again you hit the same URL and it is sending the request to 172.17.0.5. So this is how the packet is actually uh, traveling within your Kubernetes cluster or you know this is the packet flow. What is happening is uh, so if you take this is the start of the request. I as a user I executed 192.168.64.10 and this is the IP address. So it went from my uh, machine. So this is my machine IP address from my machine because I'm using the browser or the curl command. So it went from my browser or the curl command. This is the source, right? So what is the source? Source is the point where you have started the execution. Okay. So from source, uh, if you look at the if config. And if you just grab for this IP address, 192.168, 192.160. Okay, let me even search it here. So just run IF config, and if you search here, you will notice that this is my machine IP address, 192.168.64.1. Whether you are doing from curl or whether you are doing from the uh, browser, you will see that this is my source or this is my origin. So from my laptop, I have executed this specific IP address that is 192.168.64.10. What happened is from here, the request went to 172.17.0.1. This is my minikube IP address. Okay. From here, it went to the service. So this is the packet flow guys. And if you want to understand the packet flow in detail, this is the tool called Kubeshark. And I'll explain you when we actually deal with this uh, specific Kubeshark individual video. So I'll explain you how this packet is traveling. Okay. So this is the request and this is the response. From this it went to minikube what happened once it went to minikube like you know this is the uh, url context path this is the host uh, ip address and then it went to you know it sent this response and from there it sent the request to 172.17.0.7 so you can understand these things in detail you can replay right when you replay you know you can do this uh, action one more time or you can also uh, you know capture the packet and you can debug uh, it with some external tools so you all know about Wireshark. Probably you can capture this packet and you can execute against Wireshark as well so that you understand more details about the packet. You can use TCP dump. So these are some of the things. Uh, let's not go into the detail of this tool, but we have understood the three concepts, right? So here using Kubeshark, I explained you the concept of load balancing. Then using, uh, you know, uh, the browser and the terminal itself, I explained you the service discovery concept and also the, uh, what was the other thing? I, exp I explained you how to expose the application. So these are the three things that I wanted to cover as part of this video. I hope you enjoyed the demo and Kubeshark, I'll do a dedicated video because this is a must have tool for every DevOps engineer. This explains the traffic viewer of Kubernetes and most of your Kubernetes concepts will become clear. Here you can also do a service map where you can see, see what are the different services, how one service is talking to the other service. Then, you know, you can look into a list of pods uh, in the namespaces here and you can, uh, you know, uh, blog, sorry, access, understand the traffic uh, depending upon the TCP request, HTTP request, you can do layer four, layer seven, all of the things. So I'll explain uh, this in detail, but for now, this is the video for today. Like if you enjoyed the video, click on the like button. If you have any feedback for me, put that in the comment section. And finally, don't forget to share this video with your friends and colleagues. Thank you so much, guys. I'll see you in the next video. Take care, everyone. Bye.
Hello everyone. My name is Abhishek and welcome back to my channel. So today we are at day 38 of our complete DevOps course. And in this class, we will be learning about Kubernetes ingress. So people find this concept slightly tricky or people find it slightly difficult because of two reasons. One is they don't understand why ingress is required, right? If you don't understand why ingress is required, then definitely you will find the uh, topic complicated. And the second thing is practical implementation. So people try it on their Minikube clusters or on their local Kubernetes clusters and they will not succeed with the setup. So that's one of the other reasons why people find it difficult. I've also seen few videos and we also have created an end to end video on ingress on our particular channel. Uh, so I'll also share the link in the description so that you can follow the link where we have done end to end complete practical uh, on how to set up ingress and all of the things. Don't worry, even in today's class, I'm going to explain you both the theory and the practical okay so even if you watch this video till the end you will get a very detailed understanding on why ingress is required and how to practically install ingress and try out the things so you know if you have followed our previous class on service deep dive you know you'll be easily able to understand today's topic so if you haven't watched the video 37 that is on deep dive of Kubernetes services. I'll highly recommend you to go and watch video number 37 on the complete DevOps course and only then come back so that you understand the concept of ingress very well. Okay, now without wasting any time because we have to cover a lot of things in this specific video. Let me jump onto the video. Okay, so firstly, what is ingress? So you must be asking me that Abhishek in the last class we used Kubernetes services and service was offering me a lot of good things, right? So I explained to you that service was offering you service discovery mechanism on Kubernetes. So it is solving this problem. It was also doing a load balancing for you, right? Services were doing the load balancing. We have seen using the CubeShark utility as well in the last video. And it was also exposing the applications to external world. Then why you need a tool like Ingress or why you need a concept like Ingress and what problem is it solving? So before 2015, uh, December, I guess, or November. So that was before Kubernetes version release 1.1. Ingress was not even there. Okay. So people were using Kubernetes without Ingress. That was, that means people were using Kubernetes with just service concept. Okay. And Ingress, without Ingress, so what they used to do was similarly, uh, like we were doing till the last class. So people used to create a deployment which would create a pod, right? And additionally, because you are creating a deployment, you, you will get auto healing and auto scaling, right? These features. And then you will create a service on top of it so that you can expose your application within your Kubernetes cluster or outside the Kubernetes cluster using the load balancer. That is using the load balancer mode of your service. But there are some practical problems which people realized after using Kubernetes, okay. So once people started using Kubernetes, so obviously these users who migrated to Kubernetes were migrating from the legacy systems, like, like people used to have virtual machines or physical servers. On top of that, they used to install their applications, okay. And what people used to do was they used to use a load balancer. So these load balancers were uh, something like, you know, people used to use uh, Nginx, Nginx or, you know, people used to use FI load balancer or any other uh, load balancers that they want to use on their virtual machines or physical servers. Okay. And these are some enterprise load balancers. Okay. So what is enterprise load balancing? So they offer very good load balancing capability, load balancing capabilities. Like for example, you can do ratio based load balancing. That is, you can say, uh, send three requests to pod number one, seven requests to pod number two. You don't have pods in the virtual machines, but just for your understanding, I'm explaining you. Okay. You can do ratio based. You can do sticky sessions. That means if one request is going to pod one, then all the requests of that specific user have to go to pod one only. Okay. So this is called sticky sessions. They can use path based load balancing. They can use the domain or host based load balancing. Okay. They support, uh, you know, whitelisting. That means only allow specific uh, customers to access the application. They can do blacklisting. That means to say, okay, so these customers are like hackers, do not allow any users coming from Pakistan, for example, or do not allow any users coming from USA, do not allow any users coming from Russia. So you can define your traffic and you can say that, okay, 
so this is the concept or this are the capabilities that enterprise load balancers support now the problem was when these people who were doing this uh, virtual machines and applications when they migrated from this to kubernetes okay so initially they were very happy that kubernetes was offering you auto healing auto scaling automatic service discovery uh, exposing the applications to external world so you know people used to create the same things that we we did like you know they used to create a deployment after the deployment they used to create a service right and using the services they used to get all the features that are available and using the deployment they used to get the healing and scale, scaling capabilities but of late they realized that okay service was providing load balancing mechanism but the load balancing mechanism the service was providing is a simple round robin load balancing what is round robin if you are doing 10 requests what this specific uh, service using q proxy right q proxy is updating your ip table rules what it does is it will send five requests to pod number 1 and it will send five requests to pod number 2 let's assume there are two pods but this is a very simple load balancing because people were coming from uh, virtual machines and they used to get all of these features against what they are getting in kubernetes is a very simple round robin they are not getting all of these features and these are only list of features i gave you the commercial or the uh, enterprise load balancers they can offer hundreds of features okay so you can simply read and you will see that uh, you can do a uh, web application firewall you can do uh, uh, you know lot of configurations like uh, tls uh, you can add more security using tls so these load balancers offers all of these features okay so i within uh during this video itself i have listed 10 uh, close to 10 features which kubernetes was not supporting so these people were unhappy with kubernetes okay so they said that okay service was doing few things but still we are not happy and the other thing that they have noticed so this is problem number 1 and the problem number 2 is uh, you can expose your applications to external world using load balancer mode service right you can create your service as load balancer mode but what is the problem is every time like let's say you have 100 services if you take companies like amazon they have some thousands of services okay so for each of the service when they create the service as type load balancer mode you know the cloud provider was charging them for each and every ip address because these are dynamic and public ip address sorry uh, sorry these are static public ip address so they don't charge for the dynamic ip address but whenever the ip address becomes static so for static load balancing ip addresses and static public load balancing ip address so if there are thousands of microservices or if there are thousands of services that you require for your applications on kubernetes so cloud provider was charging very heavy and cloud providers are right in their terms because you are asking them for static load balancing ip address and they are charging you for money okay so this is another problem that these these people were facing in the previous example okay what they used to do was because there was only one load balancer okay in the contrary you have for each application you have one service right but on the physical or virtual virtual servers people used to create one load balancer whether you have one application two application three applications so they used to configure in their load balancer like okay if the request is coming to uh, amazon.com slash uh, abc send request to app 1 if it is coming to slash xyz go to app 2 and they used to only expose this application uh, sorry they only used to expose this load balancer with static public ip address so what is happening is here they just have one ip address which they are getting from the cloud provider or even within their organization they are only exposing one specific ip address whereas here what is happening is you are exposing thousands of ip address and you are getting charged so this is problem number 2 so let us write the two problems so that it is very clear to you before i jump on to ingress and how ingress is solving this problem what is the problem number 1 okay so the problem number 1 that we discussed is enterprise and tls that is secure load balancing capabilities so if you are using a service this thing is missing people who are coming from the virtual machines they had very good load balancing capabilities like 1 2 3 4 5 that i discussed in the previous slide 
like for example i can give you basic example like it is missing sticky sessions then it is missing uh, tls based load balancing that is secure load balancing https based load balancing then the other thing it is missing was uh, some uh, path based load balancing like i just told you host based load balancing or domain based load balancing so if request is going to amazon.com go to this specific application if the request is going to amazon.in go to other application so that is host based load balancing and then there are many other things like uh, like i told you ratio based load balancing so i can write this list to 15 to 20 different things on top of my head but you know uh, it will only waste our time so what what is the thing is the services in kubernetes was not offering all of these enterprise level capabilities and the second point is i just told you that if you are creating a service of type load balancer then for each service kubernetes will charge you kubernetes will not charge you the cloud provider will actually charge you right so the cloud provider will charge you this is a very important interview question as well people will ask you what is the difference between load balancer type service and the Uh, traditional uh, kubernetes ingress okay so what you will answer is the load balancing type service was good but it was missing all of these capabilities and also you will say that the cloud provider will charge you for each and every load balancer service type like if there are thousands of services you will be getting charged for thousands of load balancer static public ip addresses okay so these are the two problems and these two problems you have to remember and it they have to be on top of your head because this is very important interview point okay so people will definitely ask you in your uh, interviews that what is ingress or why ingress has to be created what is difference between load balancer service type and ingress so these questions will keep coming so definitely you have to remember those two points and now how ingress is solving those problem okay so what now kubernetes said is so kubernetes also admitted the problem so kubernetes said that yeah we understand and till that point what happened was open shift open shift uh, which is red hat open shift which is again a kubernetes distribution they have implemented something called as open shift routes which is very similar to kubernetes ingress so kubernetes has understood that okay open shift has also implemented something to solve the problem and even many users are requesting us saying that okay so this is a very valid problem when we were on virtual machines this is vm and this is kubernetes okay so these customers kept on complaining on kubernetes github page that when we were on virtual machines we were enjoying all the good capabilities of load balancers okay and because of which our applications were very secure because of which uh, you know we had reduced cost but when we moved to kubernetes we realized that this is a very big problem so kubernetes people have also agreed to it and what people at kubernetes said is okay we will implement something called ingress okay so we will allow the users of kubernetes to create a resource called ingress and what you people have to do who are these people like nginx fi ambassador okay traffic uh what are the other things like okay there are bunch of ha proxy so these were the top load balancers that people were using uh, here on the virtual machines i don't think ambassador was there till now but okay that doesn't matter so people were using these uh, top load balancers and what kubernetes said is okay i cannot implement for each and every load balancer so what i'll do is i will tell my users to create something called as a ingress resource okay so as a kubernetes user you will create a user call uh, sorry you will create a resource called ingress resource and now all of these load balancers okay so all of these companies what they will do is kubernetes said them that you create something called as ingress controller now what is this ingress controller okay so on a high level if you are creating ingress resource on your kubernetes cluster and if you are saying that i need a path based routing for example okay so you realize that you are missing the path based routing on kubernetes which you were very heavily using on your virtual machines so you can come to your kubernetes cluster create a ingress resource i'll show you the example don't worry and you can say that okay i want to create path based routing so you can kubernetes said that okay create one yaml file and inside that yaml file say that you know i want path based routing so you said the same thing but who will implement this okay so who will decide that which load balancer you want to use 
so there are hundreds of load balancers in the market so what kubernetes said is okay we cannot support all of you uh, you know we cannot create the logic for all of you in the kubernetes master or the api server instead you people create something called as ingress controller okay what does ingress controller mean so let's say that you want to create uh, uh, this specific capability using nginx load balancer so the nginx company will write a nginx ingress controller and as kubernetes users on this kubernetes cluster you will deploy the ingress controller okay you can deploy that using helm charts you can deploy that using yaml manifest okay and once you deploy the developer or again the devops engineers they will create the ingress yaml service uh, yaml resource for their kubernetes services okay so this ingress controller will watch for the ingress resource and it will provide you the path based routing okay so if it is complicated don't worry i'm explaining again okay so for example let's say this is your kubernetes cluster what you are doing is you are creating a pod for example okay so you are writing a yaml manifest for this and you have created a pod now what will happen like i told you there is a component called kubelet this kubelet will deploy your pod onto one of the worker node so kubelet will also sit on the worker node and api server will notify kubelet using scheduler that okay a pod is created and kubelet will deploy the pod right and similarly let's say you are creating a service yaml manifest okay so there is kube proxy and this kube proxy will what it will do this kube proxy will update the ip table rules so for every resource that you are creating in kubernetes there is a component which is watching for that resource and it is performing the required action okay so similarly even if you are creating ingress in kubernetes let's say you are creating ingress so there has to be a resource or component or a controller which has to watch for this ingress right so this was the problem so kubernetes said that okay i can create ingress resource but if i have to implement logic for all the load balancers that are available in the market that is nginx fi uh, traffic ambassador ha proxy so kubernetes said that okay it is technically impossible i cannot do it so what i'll do is i'll come up with a architecture and the architecture is user will create ingress resource okay load balancing companies like nginx fi or any other load balancing companies they will write their own ingress controllers and they will place this ingress controllers on github and they will provide the steps on how to install this ingress controllers using helm charts or any other ways and as a user instead of just creating ingress resource you also have to deploy ingress controller okay so it is up to the organization to choose which ingress controller they want to use what is ingress controller at the end of the day it is just a load balancer right sometimes it can be a load balancer plus api gateway as well api gateway offers you some additional capabilities okay so end of the day what you need to do as a user is on your kubernetes cluster the prerequisite is deploy a ingress controller which ingress controller you will deploy let's say in your virtual machines world before you move to kubernetes if you are using nginx so you will go to nginx github page and you will deploy the nginx ingress controller on to the kubernetes cluster after that you will create ingress resource depending upon the capabilities that you need okay if you need path based uh, routing you will create one type of ingress if you need tls based ingress you will create one type of ingress uh, ingress if you need host based you will create one type of ingress so this is one time activity the one time activity for the devops engineers is to decide which ingress controller they want what what is ingress controller to decide which load balancer they want okay it can be nginx it can be fi and they will go to their organizational github page they will find the steps on how to deploy this and once they realize how to deploy they will after that it can be one service two service 100 services they will only write the ingress resource once they write the ingress resource like you know ingress does not have to be one to one mapping okay you can create one ingress and you know you can uh, handle hundreds of services as well using paths you can say if path is a go to service 1 if path is b go to service 2 i'll show you that don't worry about it 
but you understood the topic here right what was the problem why ingress was introduced what is ingress controller you understood all of these things so once you understand this concept it is very easy for you okay so the major thing that you have to understand is the problem number one that ingress is solving that is the kubernetes services did not have enterprise level load balancing capabilities and which is very very important you will say that move to kubernetes because containers are very lightweight because all of blah 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 but without security without good load balancing capabilities nobody will move to kubernetes and kubernetes has realized that so that's why they have introduced ingress and the problem number two was if you are creating a service of type load balancer mode cloud providers were charging you for each and every ip address okay so these were the two problems that ingress was solving you understood this thing and the next thing that you need to understand after this is okay how to install ingress like if you just followed the uh, document till here or the presentation till here and to you will go to your kubernetes cluster you will find one ingress example for the yaml file and you will just create a ingress resource what will happen nothing will happen because you don't have ingress controller on your cluster okay so if the ingress controller is missing then you might create one ingress two ingress 100 ingress nothing will happen because the ingress is of no use without ingress controller and what is ingress controller ingress controller is a load balancer that you can choose from the requirement okay if you want nginx uh, nginx load balancer you can create nginx ingress controller if you want fi uh, or big ip uh, load balancer you can choose fi ingress controller if you want uh, ha proxy then you can create ha proxy ingress controller okay once you create this ingress controllers once the ingress resource is created on the cluster they will watch for the ingress resource and they will what they will do is basically they will provide you the required capability if you require path based load balancing they will help you with path based load balancing if you require host based it will help you with host based so this is the theory part i hope the thing is clear till here if it is not clear you have to watch the video one more time before we jump on to the practical because theory is very very important and your interview questions will be on theory perfect so now let me stop sharing here and let me jump on to my other screen and show you how to install and how to configure okay so let me get my terminal let me start sharing the screen perfect so this is my screen and in the last class we learned to tell services okay so what i'll do is let me check if i have the same state uh, if i do kubectl get pods uh, yeah i have this deployments that we create these pods that we created in the last class and if i do kubectl get service as well perfect the service is also available so this is the service and uh, if you have followed my last class i showed you how to create deployment.yaml and how to create service.yaml as well and many people have tried it i watched in the comment section so really appreciate you people for doing it perfect so now let us see if i can access the service on the first fall okay so i created this service as node port service and this is the port so what i'll do is firstly i'll get the minikube ip address so this is the minikube ip address so i can just use the curl command perfect so i am getting the output learn devops with some strong foundational knowledge great so we are able to verify that our service is running our service is watching the pods and the application is running now let me create a ingress resource for this and what we will do with ingress is we will set up a host based load balancing okay so what is host based load balancing like i told you uh, host based load balancing is nothing but we can say that okay uh, in the previous example we tried to access using a curl command right so instead of this curl command i can say that allow users when they try to reach my uh, specific service on example.com okay or you can say allow if they try to reach on example.com/abc okay so let us try to see how to create this so again there is no rocket science what i'll do is i'll simply go to the kubernetes official documentation so uh, i'll just say kubernetes ingress perfect so this is the official page for kubernetes ingress and what i'll do is i'll just go here okay see the example also here what these people are saying is there is ingress managed load balancer that is ingress controller okay so 
you create a ingress resource and using this ingress controller you know you can define how to route the traffic for your uh, applications or how to route the traffic for your pods i'll also paste the link in the description of the previous video i i think i did that two to three months back that is a very very informative video because we spent almost more than one hour explaining you different types of ingress resources how to create them how to create a path based load balancing how to do uh, you know ssl offloading how to do pass through so a lot of things in very detail after watching this video if you have time definitely watch that video as well okay perfect so here i'll just copy this example uh, instead of this let me go for host okay so this is an example which has host go through all the examples uh, you can just follow the documentation and you can uh, go through all the examples as well so i will do ingress dot yaml okay and what i will do is i'll just modify these fields so instead of ingress wildcard host i'll just say ingress example so let let us keep the same foo.bar.com no problem with it right instead of example.com let us just keep it as foo.bar.com and now i'll say if anybody wants to reach my application my service okay so if they hit on foo.bar.com slash bar okay so they should reach the service one and they should uh, you know typically you have to provide what is your service name and what is your service port so let us see what is my service name kubectl get svc so this is my service name right so let me go to my ingress yaml and let me just replace the service name my port number is 80 so i don't have any problem there perfect so now let us deploy this file kubectl apply minus f ingress.yaml and let me see if something is happening okay so the ingress is created if i do kubectl get ingress you will notice that the ingress is created but the address field is empty and you will see that nothing will happen like even if i try to replace this curl command and instead of this, what I'll do is I'll just say foo.bar.com. So this is domain-based routing. Okay. So what we are achieving here is domain-based routing. And I will say uh, foo.bar.com slash, uh, for example, what was the path that we have provided slash bar. Okay. And if I try to hit, nothing will happen here. Okay. So the reason here nothing is happening is because you haven't created ingress controller. Right. So only if you create the ingress controller, then you are, uh, this thing will start working, right? The ingress should be read by ingress controller. So what we need to do is firstly install the ingress controller. So let me install Nginx ingress controller because Nginx is a quite popular one. So again, I'll just follow the Kubernetes documentation and say Kubernetes ingress install. And this is the example uh, documentation where I can search for ingress controllers here. Uh, there are bunch of ingress controllers that Kubernetes supports, like I explained to you. Uh, there is nothing like Kubernetes supports. Actually, as uh, load balancing companies, they can create the ingress controllers. Okay, so all of these companies have implemented their ingress controllers. Like Nginx has their own ing uh, ingress controller. HAProxy has their own. FI has their own. Okay, so Apache has their own ingress controller. Like you can also create your own ingress controller if you have a load balancer. Perfect. So let us see Nginx ingress controller because it's a very lightweight and simple ingress controller. Let us see how to install. So if you are trying to install on Minikube, like they provide you some very easy steps. Uh, where is this? Nginx ingress controller works with Kubernetes. Perfect. So you can just say try Nginx ingress controller. Okay. Uh, here the steps are not good. I can just say Kubernetes Nginx ingress controller Minikube because I'm installing on Minikube. So, you know, there is a very good documentation straightforward. Like you can use this same example that I'm showing you. Just search for Kubernetes Nginx ingress controller Minikube. And this is one simple command that will install Nginx ingress controller on your Minikube cluster. So all that you need to do is Minikube enable add-ons uh, sorry add-ons enable ingress and that will create an ingress controller for you right so it's a very simple step that you have to do uh, additionally like if you want to know how to deploy ingress controller for your uh, production like you know in production you will not use minikube probably you are using uh, 
uh, EKS clusters or OpenShift or some some things, right? So in such case, go back to the documentation that I showed you. Just search for Kubernetes ingress. Okay, uh, go back here and choose which ingress controller you want. Let us say that you are doing this in your organization. So the steps you will follow is go to this ingress controller and let's say you are using same Nginx ingress controller. Okay, instead of choosing the page, this page where you will only be able to install for Minikube. Okay, go back here and in the documentation, what you need to do. So these are individual documentations, right? For every ingress controller, you have their own uh, documentation. So you can come here and you can provide, uh, you can look for the steps to install. Uh, where is this? Uh, installation steps. Let us search for install directly. Okay, let us choose a different ingress controller. I think uh, they have complicated the steps here. Let me just search for ambassador. Okay, so I took this randomly. And here, once you click on a quick start, so again, this is asking for some, okay, don't worry. Uh, so they are just asking for all the uh, sign up and all the things, but uh, you can just search for their uh, official product documentation and say, for example, ambassador, ambassador, ingress, controller, installation. Okay. So just search in Google like this and you will directly find the steps for installing ambassador, uh, ingress controller or, you know, anything that is required for your organization. So if you are doing on Minikube, you don't have to worry about anything like, you know, this is the official documentation for ambassador installing. Uh, ambassador ingress controller okay so you have the direct steps here install with helm install with kubectl yaml so on your production cluster you can choose probably helm so click on the helm instructions and you can install them using these specific commands but for minikube like i told you we just have to do minikube add-ons enable ingress and it will install the ingress controller for us so let us see if the ingress controller is installed or not end of the day ingress controller is also a pod so kubectl get pods minus a because i'm not sure in which namespace it is installed and just say nginx so see here so nginx ingress controller is up and running and in which namespace it is it has created its own namespace called ingress nginx okay and let us try to see the logs and let us see if it has identified the ingress resource that we have created kubectl logs minus n uh, what was the namespace ingress hyphen nginx okay so click on enter and it should identify the ingress resource that we have created so what was the ingress resource that we have created see here ingress example we have created in the default namespace and the name was ingress example okay so it said that it has identified that we have created an ingress resource and it has successfully synced as well so what does it mean like it synced so it will go to the nginx load balancer configuration that is nginx.conf file okay and it will update some ingress related configuration for or load balancer related configuration for the ingress uh, resource that we created and you don't have to go into these details at this point of time so with using the ingress controllers you will understand like you know don't learn everything on day one eventually you will understand what is happening under the hood but as I showed you in the pod logs, it has identified that, you know, uh, Abhishek has created an ingress called example ingress or ingress example in the default namespace, right? This is a default namespace and it said that the configuration is synced. Okay. For example, tomorrow you are getting any error. What you need to do is you have to go back and see in the pod dot logs. And now if you notice this address field was not there previously, but it is updated now. Okay, so if I can show you that, I don't know if my terminal, okay, so the logs are deleted, but address field was not there previously, but after creating the ingress controller, this address field is populated. That means to say, now I can access, you know, uh, I can uh, use the ingress resource on foo.bar.com. What was the ingress resource that we have created? This ingress example now can be accessed on foo.bar.com slash bar the reason why i can access is because i have used the ingress controller right and the ingress controller has updated the configuration so in your production environment this is enough but if you are trying on your local kubernetes cluster you have to do one more configuration that is you have to update the slash etc host configuration okay you have to update this file 
why you need to update this file and why you don't need to update this in production is because because you are doing on local and you have not done this domain mapping so this food.bar.com has to be mapped with the domain or ip address that is 192.168.64.11 so this is my mini cube or you know this is my ingress ip address not mini cube this is my ingress ip address so whenever i try to say food.bar.com like if you ping and say food.bar.com this ip address does not exist right this domain does not exist in your real time production environment for example for people at amazon they might be using amazon.com and amazon.com is a real domain which does exist so in their ingress resource what they will do is they will simply mention here as amazon.com but because we are not a company and we are just doing a domain uh, sorry demo video so i cannot go to godaddy and purchase the domain right so that's why i simply said food.bar.com but what you can do is you can mock this behavior or you know you can uh, create a dummy behavior here like you can confuse your uh, laptop or you can you know you can update the etc host file like uh, sudo vim slash etc host update this host file and tell the host file that uh, let just me provide the password so you can just tell it right i know this ip address called what was the ip address uh, sorry i have to go back so uh, you can tell them that okay if somebody is trying to reach food.bar.com okay you can tell them that i know this domain called foobar.bar.com and just provide this ip address and tell them that or tell the machine that foobar.bar.com okay so this ip address uh, sorry this domain will be resolved on this specific ip address okay so now if you try to access foobar.bar.com it will try to reach 192.168.64.11 so this way you can mimic the behavior or mock the behavior but this is not production use case in production you don't have to do all of these things you can simply ask your manager or you can simply ask your company what is the domain that we use and you can provide the domain name now if i try to ping food.bar.com okay so you will notice that okay so the request is not reaching yet but in some time you will notice that the request will reach on to food.bar.com okay so did i do any mistake here no there is no mistake so okay uh, there are some previous entries i have to delete these entries okay uh, right perfect so in some time what you will notice is when somebody tries to reach on this specific uh, food.bar.com you can tell through your curl request or you can tell through uh, you know slash etc host even if you don't want to update this etc host you can also tell that in your curl command that okay i know what is uh, food.bar.com you can resolve if somebody tries to access food.bar.com just resolve this on ip address 192.168.64.11 okay so now what will happen after some time is you will be able to reach the application uh, just replace the curl command with food.bar.com and your application will be reached now okay i can go into that practicals but before that you need to understand that go through this document where you will find multiple other things like this was just example of uh, host and path based routing right similarly you can do tls based routing so what is tls just search for tls here and you will see that you can create uh, secure uh, kubernetes ingresses as well that means to say that you know uh, this ingress resource that i have created anybody can accept uh, access on the http request but in production real time use cases for example you are accessing google.com you will access on https so these all things can also be done using ingress and if you want to do this if you want to try the practical okay you can follow the video that i am pasting in the description okay it has everything like i have shown all the types of ingress that were available i think it was made 2 to 3 months back i have shown all the type of ingresses tls without tls host based path based wildcard entry so follow that video after this so that you understand the entire concept okay so if you like the button click on the like button if you have understood the concept of ingress definitely comment on the video and i'll see in the next video take care everyone bye hello everyone my name is abhishek and welcome back to my channel so today we are at day 41 of our complete devops course and in this video we will be learning about config maps and secrets in kubernetes so on a very high level what we will learn is what is a config map in kubernetes we will learn the why aspect of what is a secret why a secret does exist in kubernetes 
then we will try to understand a classic interview question that is the difference between config map and secret so this is a very popular interview question right and then we will also try to do a live demo so this video is going to have a live demo where we will try to see how to create config map how to create secret different types of secrets and then we will finally see how to reference or how to use these ones inside a pod or deployment of your kubernetes right so this is going to be a long video and uh, without wasting any time let's quickly jump onto the video but before that if you haven't subscribed to my channel definitely uh, consider subscribing it because in the future i am going to do more and more free courses where we will learn about uh, uh, yeah i'll keep it suspense and uh, you can keep watching our community tab and telegram channel to understand what are my future free projects okay first of all config map so what is a config map in kubernetes so if you just for a couple of minutes if you forget about kubernetes let's say you are a application developer or you have understanding of how application works so you know there is an application and uh, let's call it as a backend application so this backend application what it does is it talks to a database okay and it retrieves some information from the database and it gives it back to the user so this is a very simple application right so uh, this backend is trying to talk to the database and it is trying to give the information back to the users when user has requested now what is the information that is application require from database like it requires some information like what is the database port what is the database username what is the database password okay and what is the uh, for example uh, connection type or uh, what are the number of connectors that are required and uh, a few more information that uh, this application requires from the database now how this information is retrieved uh, you know uh, this can be retrieved using a environment variable inside the application like you know that uh, a hard core or a thumb rule is that the application should not have these uh, details hard coded right so if you have these details hard coded what will be the problem in the future if these details gets changed okay any of this information get changed then the user will get null or you know he gets some vague information okay if there is a vague uh, like you know uh, if there is any other uh, username that got changed or password got that got changed or the port got got changed so in such cases the user will get a wrong information or he might not get any information at all regarding the user right so to solve this problem you will not hard code this information inside the application but a general practice is we are not talking about kubernetes at all general practice is you will try to save this as part of environment variable or you will try to save this as a specific file in a specific path inside your uh, application or inside your file system right and you will try to retrieve this uh, information from the file system using os modules right let's say you are using python you can use the os module you are using java you can get uh, that from the uh, operating system uh, libraries uh, that java supports right so this is how you read the information now how do you do, do this inside the world of kubernetes okay so inside kubernetes there are two things one is okay with the same problem let's say we want to solve the problem with respect to db port and uh, uh, the db connection type all of these information so i am not talking about db username and db password okay for some time let's put db username and db password aside and let us talk about only the db port and db connection type this kind of information okay so what kubernetes says is because kubernetes basically deals with containers okay how a user can get this information uh, you know as part of your container environment variable or as part of your container uh, a specific file inside your container okay so to achieve this what kubernetes says is okay so we support something called as config map okay so what you can do is as a devops engineer or as a uh, configuration manager engineer you can create a config map inside the kubernetes cluster okay and put the information like db port or any kind of information inside the config map okay and you can mount this config map or you can use the details of the config map inside your kubernetes pod okay so the information can be stored inside your pod as a environment variable 
or can be stored as a file inside your pod on your container uh, file system but this information has to be retrieved from the config map because as a user you cannot log into the pod you know you cannot go to the container and once you go to the container you cannot create this environment variable or you know uh, so that's not a right practice so because you can do it but the problem is that sometimes you might not have access to the container uh, uh, you know login itself or the other problem is that what if this fields gets changed continuously okay or whenever you are creating the docker file itself you don't know these values okay probably these values are fed to your application later point of time so this is not possible and what kubernetes suggests is go with the config map so as a devops engineer what you need to do is you can collect this information that a user requires you can talk to the database admin and as a devops engineer you can create a config map and inside the config map you can store these values once you store these values you can mount this config map or you can use this config map as the data of this config map as environment variables inside your kubernetes pod how you can do it and uh, you know uh, what are the different ways like i told you one is you can use them as environment variables one is you can use them as volume mounts so i'll talk about both the use cases when we go with the live demo but for now you understood the purpose of config map right so what problem config map is solving so config map is solving the problem of storing the information that can be used by your application later point of time okay so config map is used to store data and this data can be at later point of time used by your application or your pod or your deployment now if config map is solving this problem why you need a secret in kubernetes right so you should get this question like okay config map is solving this problem then what is the purpose of secrets in kubernetes so secrets in kubernetes solves the same problem but secrets deal with sensitive data that means to say like you know if you are just providing all of the information if you go back to the previous slide like i told you you have parameters like db password okay you have parameters like db username like if you try to put this information along with the db port and all the details in the config map there is a major problem in kubernetes that is in kubernetes whenever you create a resource what happens is this information gets saved in etcd okay so if this information is getting in saved in etcd in etcd usually the data data is saved as objects and you know any hacker who tries to get access to etcd they can retrieve the information so if they are retrieving the information of your dt db username and db password that means your entire application or your ent entire platform is compromised so they can get the details of your database so if they are getting details of your database then you know your kubernetes cluster does not have a proper security so to solve this problem what you will do is kubernetes says that if you have non sensitive data then store it in config maps if you have sensitive data then store it in secrets now what will happen if you store it in secrets what difference does it make so what kubernetes says is if you put any kind of data inside the secret okay what we will do is we will encrypt the data at the rest that means to say before the object is saved in etcd kubernetes will encrypt this one okay so by default kubernetes uses a basic encryption but what kubernetes says is we will also allow you to use your own encryption mechanism like the custom encryption so you can pass these values to their api server and say that whenever you are storing like you know api server is feeding some information to the etcd you can use this custom encryption and even if hacker is trying to access this etcd because he does not know the decryption key right so he can read all the information from etcd let's say he read the information about config maps deployment pod everything but when it comes to secrets he will just retrieve a encrypted information that is of no use for him okay so he will ju he just have to throw that information because he cannot read that he does not have the decryption key okay so that's why whenever you have encrypted or sorry whenever you have sensitive information go with storing the objects or values in the secrets whenever you have non sensitive information then go with the config maps okay so this is the differentiation between config maps and secrets now what happens like okay let's try to go a step back and let us see the step by step approach on what is happening like let's say you are a user okay as a user you are creating a config map for example so what you will do is you will write a yaml file for config map and inside the yaml file 
like i told you you will put all the details that are required so you can uh, get the yaml yaml syntax from the kubernetes documentation as well and once you do this you will use the kubectl apply i'll show you all of these things in the uh, demo as well so you use the kubectl uh, apply and you create this config map on your kubernetes cluster so your config map got created so what is happening here your config map is created and at the same time api server is saving this information inside the etcd as well so this is the entire process with respect to config map now for a hacker if you are storing the sensitive information he has two points to retrieve the information one is if the hacker has access to your kubernetes cluster one is he can come here he can come to the config map he can just say kubectl describe config map or he can just say kubectl edit config map and he can get the information from the config map so your db password is compromised and the other thing that he can do is he can go to the etcd and because the data is not encrypted he can get the information from here as well so these are the two problems major problems that secret is solving problem number 2 i already explained so at the etcd the data is encrypted at the rest so the hacker does not have the decryption key so that's why your information is secure but what about the point number 1 you might say that uh, you know uh, the hacker might come to the secrets and he can again use the kubectl uh, describe or edit and he can read the information right so for that reason what kubernetes recommends is apart from kubernetes doing its part so kubernetes is doing its part it is using the decryption uh, encryption so kubernetes is saying whenever you create secrets use a strong rbac okay say that no user should have access to uh, rbacs who are not like for example there is a very popular concept in devops that is called as least privilege okay least privilege is a concept where what you will do is you will only grant least access like you know very less number of people should have access to secrets okay like the same concept with the iam as well in aws so if you are restricting the access like uh, there is a developer who is trying to log into the kubernetes cluster like he can have read access to config maps he can have read access to pods he can have read access to deployments but there is no requirement he has access to secrets so you can prevent that in the user rbac you can just say that okay he should have access to all the resources but not secrets so this is how you prevent both the things okay so this is the difference between config map and secrets if user uh, sorry if your interviewer is asking you this question what is the difference between config map and secret this is how you explain him like both the config map and secrets both of them are used to store the information or you know pass the information or uh, 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 for example you might want to save some json data you want to save some key value pair inside your kubernetes cluster that will be later fed to your applications uh, which are in pods in kubernetes you can use both of them uh, for the same purpose but secrets is used for sensitive information whereas config maps is used for non sensitive information and how does secrets solves this uh, sensitive information problem like i told you uh, with secrets the data is encrypted at the rest and with secrets you can enforce a strong rbac so that you know for the entire secrets resource in kubernetes you can say only devops engineer should have access to it you can do that using the kubernetes rbac okay now we will not waste more time and we'll quickly jump onto the demo because demo also might take uh, some time for us so let me stop sharing here stop share perfect so let me start sharing my other screen so at this point of time if the things are clear to you uh, while i'm sharing my screen just uh, comment saying that okay so i am able to understand i am not able to follow at any specific point okay so your feedback is highly appreciated perfect now you should be able to see my terminal in 1 2 3 seconds perfect so let me firstly clean my cluster kubectl uh, get deployed do have any deployments i think i should have a few so kubectl delete i should have done this before sorry delete deployment sample python app done and uh, kubectl get cm config map let me delete this config map as well kubectl delete config map test config map perfect so let's start with creating a config map okay so uh, vim cm.yaml i'll just say uh, this one and here uh, inside the config map.yaml firstly you have to provide the api version v1 then you have to provide kind uh, which is as config map 
don't think that abhishek is just typing it how does he remember all of this like uh, i do it on a day to day basis so i remember but you can also use the kubernetes uh, documentation and you will not get any extra points for remembering this thing okay uh, name as uh, test cm then data you can pass any data here like uh, probably we'll use the same thing db hyphen port uh, let us give the mysql port let me just say 3306 okay so let me just save this one now let us create this always use kubectl apply over create why i have already explained in the previous video and uh, if you know the answer you can also comment that kubectl apply minus f cm dot yaml so now if i just say kubectl get cm you will notice that the config map is created now let us describe this and see kubectl describe cm test hyphen cm right so this is one data entry that we have saved in the config map similarly you can save any number of data okay as part of uh, your application uh, in your enterprise your application might require a lot of fields then you can use a lot of fields here like later you can uh, point these fields as environment variables inside your kubernetes pod that is what we are going to see now so my end goal now will be to take these fields from the config map and to put these fields as environment variables inside my kubernetes pod but for that firstly i have to create a kubernetes pod itself if you have watched my previous videos uh, git remote minus v uh, you know this is one uh, video that i uh, explained docker zero to hero where we have created a python django application which i am going to use here okay now i i will not explain this one more time because uh, i have also explained this in the kubernetes deployment as well as the docker zero to hero video how to create a python django application and host it as a uh, uh, application inside your container we'll use the same container so to just save the time now this is my uh, deployment.yaml file let me open this and uh, let me get it back to the state uh, for example i have to remove this field sorry so this is the same one that i explained in the previous video okay in the kubernetes deployment we use the same deployment to create the kubernetes pods okay so i'll show you very quickly uh, if i just do kubectl apply minus f deployment.yaml what will happen here is it will create two kubernetes pods because i have used the scaled replica as two kubectl get pods minus w for watching two pods are created now how do i look into the environment variables of this pods you can just say kubectl exec the name of the pod hyphen uh, hyphen hyphen slash bin slash bash so you will uh sorry uh, exec minus it is required so that i open it in an interactive terminal right now i am inside the uh, pod and here if i just say environment variable and uh, followed by just let me search with db you will notice that there is no environment variable with respect to db because this is just an application running and uh, till now it does not have information of the database like it does not have the information of the database port but let's say i am using mysql uh, database in this application and i want to use the information uh, that is i want to know the database port of mysql so what i have to do is i have to go here and modify the deployment.yaml and what i need to modify is i just need to add after the image or anywhere you know you can provide something called as env because i want to read the value as an environment variable right so here inside the env what i will do is i will tell my kubernetes deployment that you know i need a environment variable and the name of the environment variable should be db port uh, let's give caps okay this should be name of the environment variable and the value of the environment variable so how will you get the value of the environment variable don't worry i created a config map so to get the value get the value from the config map that is value from what is the config map like i can provide the reference to my config map saying that config map ref that is reference to the config map so get the so this is the name of the environment variable what should be the value of the environment variable the db port that we have provided in the config map so that's why i'm saying value from config map reference and here what is the name of the config map because kubernetes has to know where it has to get right so name of the config map is what did we create the name of the config map i think test hyphen cm and the value or like you know what is the key uh, where i have should stored the 
database port so the key the key inside the config map that i stored is i think db hyphen port let us quickly go back and see so vim cm.yaml oh sorry cm.yml so you will see that okay so this is the port so i have to pass this so that kubernetes can retrieve this information i think i have already passed the right one uh, if i go to the deployment.yaml uh, key is db hyphen port name of the config map is test hyphen cm and the environment variable name inside the uh, python application that i want is db port so now the expectation that i have is as soon as i deploy this kubernetes uh, deployment so it should override the existing pods and inside the pods if i just say env grep db right the expectation is now i should see a new environment variable called db hyphen port and the value of the environment variable should be 3306 so this is my expectation now let me see if my expectation will match or not for that kubectl apply minus f deployment.yaml so it said that uh, okay it threw an error and it says validation error deployment env value from okay so it said that the it does not know value from unknown field config map ref okay so it said that the config map ref name that we have provided is wrong i think there is some syntax error here uh, config perfect map Ah, okay. Sorry. My bad. So that's why you always have to follow the documentation. You should not go by your gut. So it should be config map followed by key ref. Okay. So you will do these mistakes. Don't worry. If you are not doing mistakes, you will not learn things. So here I have done a mistake that it should be config map key reference. So that's fine. Uh, now if I apply it one more time, it should get created. Perfect. Now kubectl get pods minus w. I'm watching it again. See. These containers are getting created. The previous ones, the previous pods are getting terminated and the new ones are getting created. Perfect. Let's give it some time for the ones to be running. I hope that is done. So let me just say kubectl get pods. Perfect. So they are running 25 seconds ago and 21 seconds ago. That means I hope they are good. Now again kubectl get pods let me exec into one of this i can pick randomly anything let's pick this one kubectl exec minus it name of the pod what i'll do is uh, slash bin slash bash so that i'll go to the pod now i'm inside the pod let me say env grep i hope this will work minus i db so that okay let me use db itself i use the capital db and uh, let's see perfect db port is 3306 so our purpose is solved now the developer what he can do inside his java application he can just say that uh, for example or inside the python application he can just say os dot db port or you know os dot env or environ of he can just say db hyphen port and he can retrieve the value for his database connection right so this is how you use the config map inside an application as environment variable. But now there is a problem. I'll show you what that problem is. And this problem your interviewers will definitely ask. Okay, how will you use your config map inside your Kubernetes pod? So if you say this way, okay, so this way you can use your application and uh, sorry, value inside your application. But the problem is, let's say uh, I am the uh, DevOps engineer and I realize that for some reason I want to change the Oh, sorry let me get out for some reason i want to change the db port okay so the db port is occupied or you know consider it as uh, some uh, variable with respect to db that i want to change now how do i change this okay so i'll just come to the config map and instead of 06 i'll say 07 i'll save it now how will the pod come to know about this change okay so if i just do kubectl exec again we'll go to the same pod one more time and if you see the db port name will remain the same okay if you just say grep db it will be 3306 only so your application will continue to use 3306 and it will fail because the port has changed so the database admin has changed the port and your application is not understanding that the port is changed so your application will try to connect to the db but it will never get connected so to solve this problem what kubernetes is said uh, has said is if you have this kind of information if you have the information that keeps changing okay the 
changing the environment variables inside kubernetes is not possible inside containers is not possible you can never update a value like today you can go to any container and try to update the environment variable value and let me know what happens abhishek you will say abhishek i cannot change the value inside the uh, environment variable because container does not allow changing the environment variable you have to recreate the container but in production you cannot restart the containers okay because it might lead to some traffic loss if you are deleting the deployment and recreating the deployment you might incur some traffic loss which is not expected so the other way that kubernetes suggests is why can't you use volume mounts okay so kubernetes says like instead of this approach go with an approach called volume mounts okay so using the volume mounts what you can do is you can uh, sorry using the volume mounts you can do the same thing but instead of using them as environment variables you will use them as files because you are mounting right so your config map information will be saved inside a file and developers can read the information from the file instead of environment variable let us see how to do that okay so again i'll uh, open the deployment.yaml now instead of this i'll delete this environment thing okay so instead of environment thing what i will do is i will do a volume mount okay but to do a volume mount the first thing that you have to do is you have to create the volume itself right so let me leave this space so that you understand and here what i will do is at the level of the containers okay so here at the level of the container what you will do is you will create a volume so uh, you just say volumes whatever the name of the volume that you would like to so let me say the name of the volume is uh, db connection for example and inside that what i will say is this volume should read the information from config map so in kubernetes you can create different type of volumes you can create external volumes you can create internal volumes persistent volumes config map so in this case i am creating a volume that reads the information from config map okay and again the name of the config map what was it uh, it is test hyphen cm okay so this is the volume that i have created and here you can mount the volume okay for that you can simply say volume mounts so what is happening here the first thing that happened is i have created a volume why did i create a volume because a volume is nothing but a storage right it's just a block and inside that what i'm saying is read the information from config map so this is just like a docker volume that i explained you previously and now i have to read this value inside the pond for that what i'll do is i'll mount the volume so mounting the volume is nothing but reading this volume inside the kubernetes pod okay for that in the volume mounts i'll say name what is the name you have to provide the same name that is db connection okay and where do you want to mount this so inside the kubernetes uh, pod on which folder do you want to mount it or on which disk or which file system do you want to mount it i'll simply say mount path as slash opt you can use any path okay now if i save this hmm sorry if i save this and if i just do kubectl uh kubectl apply minus f deployment.yaml you will again notice that okay uh, if i just do kubectl get pods minus w so the pods are created 4 seconds ago and 6 create 6 seconds ago that means they just got created as soon as i applied now let me do exec one more oh sorry i have to get the pod name right uh, to exec kubectl get pods i'll clear my screen get the pods use one of these pods and uh, what will happen now is the environment variable should get deleted because we have related re, uh, uh, removed the environment right so if i exec into one of these pods and if i just say hyphen hyphen slash bin slash bash now you will see if i again do env pipe grep db there is no environment variable because we have removed it right that is working fine now again what i did is i have also mounted this so let us see if it got mounted on the slash opt folder perfect it got mounted now it says that there is a file called db port let us see what is the value of the db port cat db port pipe more uh what happened? oh sorry cat slash opt slash db port pipe more see what is the port 3306 right so this uh, got mounted inside the uh, what is it the file system 
okay now what i can do is again i can go to kubectl edit config map vim config map dot yaml sorry cm dot yaml and uh, here what i will do is okay i changed the port but i did not apply sorry for that uh, so let me apply the port uh, anyways you have seen what is inside the uh, container or what is inside the pod right so you have noticed that inside the pod there is a file called db port and the value is 3306 now let me apply this change kubectl apply minus f uh, cm dot yaml okay now my expectation is the kubernetes pod without getting restarted it should know the value of the config map has changed let us see if it will understand or not now again what i will do is firstly to show you kubectl describe uh, cm test cm see the db port has changed now i will show you that the pod is not restarted kubectl get pods the timestamp will uh, will be more so see it is two minutes before that means it did not get restarted as soon as i updated the config map right so now let us exec into this pod and let us see inside that file the name of the or the port number has changed or not automatically so i did not change anything right inside the pod i did not log in and i did not change it exec minus it slash 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 bin slash bash fingers cross cat slash opt slash uh, db port now i am expecting the port number should be 3307 perfect it got changed you will not believe me so i'll do it one more time config map dot yml okay you might say that abhishek i don't believe it so let me change it one more time 3309 okay now again let me apply it apply minus f uh, sorry fingers yeah apply minus f this got applied again so you have to give it couple of seconds for it to get refreshed inside uh, your kubernetes pods so let's do it one more time kubectl exec every time you don't have to exec into the pod i was just showing you but what i can also do is cat slash opt slash db port here as well and you will notice that the port has changed oh sorry it hasn't changed now like i told you give it a couple of seconds so this is uh perfect let us keep doing it and let us see if it gets changed or not did i change here kubectl uh, describe config map test cm did i apply it oh uh, yeah i applied it right so let us see let us keep doing it and i'm sure it will change perfect it got changed right i know you would and you wouldn't have believed me if i have not showed this but yeah so the port number has updated like i told you it will take couple of seconds because uh, kubernetes uh, continuously keeps reading the config map and looks for the changes so now uh, it understood that okay the mount has changed and like be patient give it a couple of seconds because it will take couple of seconds to reflect okay so you can keep trying it uh, add new values to the config map keep doing it so similarly you can do it for secret as well so there is no rocket science uh, for secrets and config maps the behavior is same uh, so even what i can do is i can just create a secret for you uh, kubectl create so there are different types of secrets uh, there can be tls secrets there can be a generic secret okay we are not talking about that because uh, it will be out of context uh, today so i can just say kubectl create secret generic secret tls is basically to store the certificates but here we are just storing username and password right db password so uh, kubectl create secret generic and uh, let me call this secret name as uh, test secret okay and what i will do is you can also use the same uh, secret.yaml file to write it but i'm just showing you the other way like you can create config map like this as well kubectl create config map name of the config map again you can provide the details just for projecting or showing you the other way of creating a secret i'm just showing you here okay so from literal means to say that you are creating a basic literal okay so here i will say the literal name as uh, db what was the name that we showed i think db port right okay uh, db port is equals to 3306 okay so here what i'm doing is i'm just showing you the other way of creating as soon as i create the secret got created you can also do it the same way using secret.yml as well same way that i did for the config map so now if i do kubectl describe secret uh, followed by the name of the secret was test secret okay so see what is there here 
db port it says 4 bytes so this is exactly what i told you during the theory class right so if i just do kubectl edit secret test secret i told you that what kubernetes does is it will encrypt in base 64 okay so this is the base base 64 encrypted but this is not a great encryption by default kubernetes does not support great encryption you can encrypt using your own way for encryption here you can use something like uh, HashiCorp Vault or you can use Sealed Secrets or you can use any different thing for encrypting the secrets on your Kubernetes uh, namespace level or uh, during your Kubernetes secret creation. But at the rest, using uh, etcd, you have to pass it to the API server, whatever your encryption key is. Okay, but here your Kubernetes secret got saved. And uh, if you want to understand like, you know, what is this secret value? Just to say that is it uh, 3306 or not? You can again say echo uh, the field here and you can just say base 64 hyphen hyphen decode. Okay, so it will decode and see the port number is 3306. So Kubernetes does not have a great uh, encryption uh, whenever you are creating the secrets by default. So if you want to keep it more and more secure, uh, you can use the applications that I just told you, but that's fine. Always uh, importance is to secure it at, at the level of etcd and that comes at your Kubernetes security where you can use a encryption key. Okay, if you want to know more about it, read how to encrypt etcd for secrets. I also explained in it in one of the previous classes regarding Kubernetes security. Okay, so this is uh, the one here, like I have created the secret. Now, instead of this port, what you can do is for your demo or for you to practice, use the same example and create a new secret for db password. Okay, and provide a password here, uh, probably abhi and uh, create a new secret called uh, test secret one and your exercise for today is to repeat the same exercise so instead of config map key reference you can just say secret key reference like if you go to my deployment.file deployment.yaml file right so here whatever i used just replace the config map secret like you know here i said volumes right so inside the volume inside this config map just replace it with secret or you can follow the kubernetes documentation and if you want to read it as environment variable uh, like i showed you in the previous example you can just say secret key reference and provide the information but you will get the, all of this information inside your kubernetes uh, documents i'll pu i'll put the link in the description as well consider this as your homework or assignment and i explained you everything regarding config map now you have to do it with respect to secret okay so that you learn it i hope you enjoy the video for today if you have any questions put that in the comment section don't forget to like the video and share it with your friends finally if you haven't subscribed please subscribe to my channel abhishek viramala thank you so much i'll see in the next video take care everyone bye Hello everyone, my name is Abhishek and welcome back to my channel. So today is day 39 of our complete DevOps course and in this class we'll be talking about Kubernetes RBAC. So as I promised you and also you people might have seen in the thumbnail that I am going to show you how to create a 30 days free OpenShift cluster. Okay, so this cluster is going to be free for 30 days and you can uh, like create resources uh, in this uh, OpenShift cluster and you can play around with this OpenShift cluster. But let's talk into the details of it uh, at the end of the video and currently let's focus on Kubernetes RBAC. So what is Kubernetes RBAC and why is it important? So I will say that Kubernetes RBAC is a very simple but complicated topic. So what is simple and again, when I say it is simple, why is it complicated? So Kubernetes RBAC is a very simple topic to understand, but if it is not implemented right, then it becomes very complicated to debug the issues or, you know, even it becomes very complicated for your organization because Kubernetes RBAC is directly related to security. When something is related to security, that itself means that it is very important. So you need to understand the concept of RBAC more than understanding how to create a service account or how to create role and how to create role binding because that takes very less time. Okay. So if you want to understand how to create a, a role, how to create a service account and how to create a role binding, you can also uh, get things done in 10 minutes. Like, you know, you can create a pod, attach it service account and understand the things, but I'm not going to talk about those things. Instead, I'm going to firstly explain you the concept of RBAC, how and why is it very important? And after that, I'll, I'm going to talk about, okay, what is service account? What is role and what is role binding? Okay. Perfect. So. 
firstly kubernetes rbac can be broadly divided into two parts okay so the first part can be users and the second thing can be your service account or you know how services manage access in the kubernetes that can be any applications that you are running in kubernetes so firstly let's try to understand this user management okay so if you have a kubernetes cluster let's say you have been using uh, kubernetes in minikube or you are using uh, kubernetes in kind or any any other uh, kubernetes platforms let's say so out of the box you get administrative access to this clusters right because they are your local kubernetes clusters and you have been playing around with this uh, local kubernetes clusters for uh, you know learning kubernetes but when you try to use kubernetes in organizations the very first thing that you would do is let's say this is your kubernetes clusters as devops engineers or kubernetes administrators your primary responsibility would be to define access so if there is a development team if there is a qe team okay so how do you define what access should uh, developers have onto this cluster and what access should this qe engineer should have on this cluster okay it's not that uh, you know any qe engineer can come to this kubernetes cluster and uh, uh, delete resources in uh, let's say kube system namespace or let's say uh, the qe engineer deletes uh, something related to etcd okay so these things can become very very worse if like you know if someone comes and delete something related to etcd then you know it becomes very difficult for your uh, administrator or for your uh, devops team to get back the original state of these uh, things so effectively how you can solve this problem is by defining rbac that means to say role based access control okay so what is role based access control depending upon the role of the person okay so rbac depending upon the role you would define access so role based access and this is the control that what you are trying to do okay so this is one part of it so how we are manage how we are going to manage the user management or how we are going to man manage the access to users in your kubernetes cluster that is one part of our bag and the second part is how you are going to do deal with the service account that means to say let's say you have created a pod through deployment or through any other sources you have created a pod now what access does this pod need to have on the kubernetes cluster so should pod be uh, having access to config maps should this pod have access to secrets okay so let's say as part of your application you want to read config map as part of your application you want to read secret as part of your application can you delete like let's say uh, you have uh, uh, you uh, you have uh, deployed a pod and what this pod is doing let's say this pod is a malicious pod and what this pod is doing is it is deleting uh, some content related to api server okay or uh, accidentally it is uh, you know removing some important files on your uh, system so how do you restrict this so again the same thing similar to user management you can also manage the access for your services or for your applications that are running on the cluster using the rbac okay so two primary responsibilities of rbac is user management as well as managing the access of the services that are running on the cluster now how this is done on a broad level okay before i jump into the depth uh, depth of how do you uh, manage all of these things on a broad level in kubernetes you have three major things okay for managing the rbacs one is like i told you service accounts or users second thing is called as kubernetes roles or cluster roles third is role binding or cluster role binding so i'll try to explain the difference of roles and cluster role role binding and cluster role binding as well don't worry about it but first of all these are the high level three things that can define our back in kubernetes okay but 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 how do you create users in kubernetes okay so if we go back to the previous slide here i told you there are two essential things one is users and one is service accounts okay but how do you create users like for example if you are using minikube okay all these days you might be using minikube okay so if you go inside the minikube can you create a user like on my personal laptop 
I can use it's a Linux, let's say it's a Linux laptop. I can use something like user add. Okay. And using user add, I can create a user on my Linux system and I can share uh, this access like, you know, uh, with relevant, I can say that, you know, uh, I'll create a user called developer and uh, someone who has this username and password, they can log into this Linux box and they can do specific set of actions on this Linux box. But how do you do this on Kubernetes? So in Kubernetes also, can you use this command to create users? No, you can't. Okay. So what Kubernetes says is Kubernetes does not deal with user management. Whereas Kubernetes offloads the user management to identity providers. So this is very important to understand because service accounts is something that you can create. Okay. So anyone uh, can simply log into a Kubernetes cluster, even on your mini cube cluster, you can log in and you can create a service account. But this part is very important to understand because when you are going to work in an organization, let's say your organization is using EKS, your organization is using AKS or OpenShift. So how do you create these users? How can you say that, okay, DevOps engineer should log in with this specific user? Or in, in DevOps team, let's say you have 10 users. So probably you might create uh, 10 users for this DevOps users. And probably there are 10 developers. So you might want to create 10 accounts or 10 users for these developers. And each of them should have only relevant access. So developers should not be able to delete resources. QE people should at the most only read the resources and read the logs, probably, just as an example, okay? And DevOps engineers might want to do the administration of the cluster. So how do you do all of these things? So that's what Kubernetes says is, okay, I'm not going to manage the users. I will offload the user management to identity providers. So I'll give you a very simple example. So these days, let's say you're using any applications. Okay, the fundamental thing that you might have noticed is most of these application have options like login with Instagram. Or very popular one is login with Google. And what happens is you don't even have to create account with this applications. Let's say there is a, a person who has downloaded an application from Play Store. And you know, most of the times you get this option called login with Google, login with Instagram or login with Facebook. And what happens is this person gets access to this app without creating the user. Right? So this is what exactly Kubernetes also does. So Kubernetes says is I will offload the user management. Okay. So in Kubernetes, you all know that there is a component called API server. So you can pass certain flags to the API server. Okay. I'm going to show you what that flags are. It's not a rocket science. Don't worry about that flags because always I tell you, don't worry about syntaxes or don't worry about, uh, you know, how does the YAML look like? Always understand the concept. So in Kubernetes, the API server works as your OAuth server. Okay. Now, what is this OAuth? Wait for it. Okay. So you can offload the user management to any identity providers. What are some of popular identity providers? For example, you are using this Kubernetes cluster on AWS. And let's say this is your EKS Kubernetes cluster. So why can't you use IAM users? That's what Kubernetes says. Okay. So if you are using EKS platform, what Kubernetes says is you, you can use your IAM users and using your IAM users, okay, you can log into Kubernetes. So in between what you need to do is you have to create something called as IAM provider or IAM OAuth provider. Okay. And using this IAM, the persons will log into the Kubernetes cluster and already you have created users and groups in IAM, right? So if you have a user and if you have, uh, I mean, if your user belongs to a group, so as you log into the Kubernetes, so you get to log in with the same username and you get to log in with the same group. Okay. So this is how Kubernetes offloads the user management to external identity providers. Okay. This, this concept is same, whether it is OpenShift, whether it is EKS, whether it is AKS. So depending upon the identity provider that your organization is using, this might change. For example, your organization might be using LDAP. Your organization might be using Okta. Your organization might be using any SSO. So you can use all of these things. Kubernetes natively supports all of these things. Okay. But it is up to you 
how you want to configure this identity provider how you want to create users inside this identity providers you can also use uh, some uh, identity brokers like keyclock so keyclock is a very uh, popular one many people manage their uh, kubernetes uh, identity uh, uh, you know identity management or user management using keyclock as a broker you can connect to all of these things okay so even if you want to uh, try some things like let's say you have a access to production or you know you can create a kubernetes cluster on amazon let's say today you can go to eks and you can integrate eks with keyclock and using keyclock you can connect it with your github so in your github you can create user management right as part of github you can collaborate with hundreds of people and you can create uh, collaborators you can create users in your organization who which user has what access in your github so using keyclock you can connect to uh, eks and you can get the all of these users okay this is how kubernetes offloads the user management and the second part is service uh, service accounts right so service accounts uh, it's just like a yaml file everybody can create okay so there is no different uh, with respect to service account so if you understood how to create users and i will show you how to create service accounts so service accounts is just like creating a pod okay don't worry about it there is simply uh, like you know like you have your pod.yaml you can create uh, a service account.yaml sa.yaml for example and inside the service account.yaml you will just define Uh, as part of your yaml file you know what should be your api version what should be your kind what should be a name of your service account but then comes the interesting part okay what will happen next let's say you logged in as a user or your application is currently running uh, as a service account uh, by default even if you are creating a pod you might have uh, this question like all these days i am using some pod okay by default whenever you are running a pod it comes with a default service account even if you are creating a service account or not a service account gets created automatically and using this service account itself kubernetes pod uh, whatever applications that you are running it will be talking to the api server for any or uh, to that matter of fact for uh, connecting with any resources in kubernetes it will use this service account itself if you are not creating service account kubernetes will create a default there is a default service account kubernetes will attach that default service account to your pod if you are creating a service account then you can use your custom service account but what happens after that whether you are logged in into your kubernetes cluster as a user or whether your application is running on a kubernetes cluster as a service account that is fine okay after that how do you manage the rules or how do you manage the uh, configuration so to define access after this part kubernetes supports two important resources that is called role and role binding so you can also consider this as a cluster role when it has cluster level permissions and you can consider it as cluster role binding when it has cluster level permissions so this is not important at this point of time simply uh, understand that kubernetes does all of these things using role and role binding okay now what is this role and role binding so once you create your once you application is running as a service account or you logged in as a user the next part is how to grant access to it so firstly you will create a role okay Let, let's say you are creating a role uh, which says and you want to assign this role to the developers so what you are saying is they should have access to pods they should have access to config maps they should have access to uh, secrets within the same namespace okay to to have within a single namespace you will create a role if they want to have access across the cluster then you will create cluster role that's the only difference but we will talk in detail as well okay so you have created this role now you have to attach this role to the users right so to attach you will use role binding that's the very simple concept okay what is is a role so a role is a yaml file where you will write all the things like you know they need to have access to config map they need to have access to secret they need to have uh, you know even if it is a single user you will create a role and you will say okay so uh, whoever gets this role attached to them like let's say there is a user called abhishek if you are attaching this role to the abhishek then abhishek will get all these permissions if you are attaching this role to uh, xyz person so xyz person will get access to all of these resources that you have defined in the role.yaml so you can consider or you can uh, compare it with uh, iam policies okay so once you attach all of these things or once you say that anybody who gets access to this role might have access to all of these things but how do you actually 
assign them this okay so you have created a role and there is a user how this user and how this service account and the role gets attached to each other okay so to do this you use something called as role binding okay so the simple ecosystem will look like this service account consider it as user as well role and role binding okay actually uh, sorry uh, this arrow so this is service account this is role and this is role binding so you will create a service account or a user okay and you will create a role using this role binding you will bind both of them together okay so this is a very simple architecture so if you don't have a role binding you will create a service you will create a role but both of them are not attached together okay so if you have just a role binding you will create a service account but to bind you need a role without having a role just having a role binding you are not binding your service account with any permissions so simply this will take care of permissions this will be taking care of users creating user management and this will take care of binding the permissions to users okay binding permissions to user so this is the con concept of kubernetes rbac so simply if you are creating a role within a specific namespace it will be called as role and if you are creating this role with in the scope of the cluster it is called as a cluster role similarly role binding as well now what is the difference between cluster role and cluster role binding <clears throat> i don't think it is uh, good to discuss in this specific class because if there are any beginners who is trying to understand this concept it will go over their head so whenever we are doing the practicals it will be very easy to understand the difference between cluster role cluster role binding uh, role and role binding as well okay so till here this is the theory part of your kubernetes rbac if you haven't understood any any specific topic here you can put that in the comment section and i'll try to do uh, you know more detailed video on that or uh, we will try to do a, a master class or something but till now we only discussed about the theory part of kubernetes rbac now as i promise you let me show you how to create a open shift cluster a, a free open shift a free trial open shift cluster for 30 days okay so you can make use of this open shift cluster for your learning so let me stop sharing here and let me uh, start sharing the other screen share perfect got it right so i hope you people are uh, seeing my firefox screen right so i opened a uh, incognito window and just search for open shift sandbox okay so open shift sandbox once you open this one you will notice that you know you will get a free trial what does it say here get 30 days free access okay let me increase the font get 30 days free access to shared open shift and kubernetes cluster i already told you it's a shared cluster because this is just for your practice and to understand the concept of rbac so click on start your sandbox for free all that you need to do is you need to create a account with red hat okay so register a red hat account or you can also uh, like you know if you have already a red hat account you can make use of the red hat account okay so in my case i already have a, a red hat account so if you don't have you can just create red hat account it's just following steps and once you follow the steps you can uh, create a red hat account okay so let me just stop sharing here so that i can uh, enter the details stop share and uh, i'm trying to enter my red hat account details so this is very simple like you know you create your aws account uh, right similarly you can also create a red hat account okay now i'm just creating a red hat account uh, sorry i'm just uh, entering the details of my red hat account and this is public anyone can uh, create a free account here in the open shift sandbox done okay now i am logging in and let me share back my screen perfect so now i am logged in so the only difference is you will see the same screen but now you know if you see this icon here that says that i am logged in 
now again click on start using sandbox what you what you will get is a shared openshift cluster for 30 days in no time okay so the openshift cluster is assigned to you and this cluster has you know both developer and administrative tabs but in the administrative tab you only have limited access like uh, click on login with dev sandbox like i told you like you know this is the identity provider that openshift is using in your case this can be in your organization this can be login with ldap login with okta okay so you have created a red hat account right so this red hat account that you have created get saved in this dev sandbox okay so they are using this as the identity provider to define okay what kind of user is he is he a paid user is he a subscription user is he a red hat user okay you get all of this information uh, you send all of this information to the openshift cluster using this identity provider okay now as soon as i click on dev sandbox okay it will try to get the information of my specific user like what kind of user is this person i just created a red hat account and provided all the details right depending upon that it gave me a red hat openshift cluster and this is how your production environments looks like okay all this time you might have used uh, just kubernetes clusters but you know here see what happens is this is my openshift cluster that is dedicated for me for 30 days and it's a shared cluster for example here what i can do is i can go to the workloads and i can look into the pods i can look into the uh, uh, deployments and here i can switch through the namespaces but because this is a shared cluster i am only given access to this specific namespace that is created for me okay so what this entire uh, concept here is using openshift dedicated you will get a shared uh, cluster and each uh, person gets a namespace now click on the icon here uh, on the username and uh, you know you get an option called copy login command click on that and again uh, it will prompt you for login once you log in click on the display token and using this token you can log in through the cli so here what i will do is i will open my terminal this is my terminal and just provide this uh, same uh, display token that you got from the url and now you are able to log in to the openshift cluster from your terminal now you can do all of the things like you know kubectl get pods what happens is you know you will be able to see what are the pods that are running in that specific namespace you only have access to that namespace okay so because uh, sometimes you know this cluster might take uh, time in responding back but uh, it is hardly uh, less than seconds let me create a deployment here uh, kubectl create a deployment nginx hyphen hyphen image okay now what happens is a nginx deployment will be created for me let us see if it got created or not now if i click on the deployments tab here through the ui also i can monitor right so using the deployment tabs now you will notice that you know nginx deployment is created for me okay so this is the nginx deployment and here you know using the ui itself you can scale down the pods you can scale up the pods now i scaled up the pods to 2 so this way you can play around and you can get the real feel of kubernetes cluster how kubernetes clusters are used within the organization you know in the uh, routes you can create ingress uh, people have been asking me about ingress right so you can play around with ingress here you can create services here right you can also use uh, uh, storage services like persistent volumes volumes how do they work all of these things so using this real time production environment you can understand not just the concept of rbac but you can also play around with these clusters and you can explore a lot of things how events are omitted so these are the events okay so what is happening within the uh, kubernetes cluster so nginx pod got created nginx pod got started so kubernetes is trying to pull the image okay and you can search for the events api explorer lot of the things what people usually do what devops engineers usually do within the organization you can get a feel of it and within the user management like i told you you can create service accounts you can create roles we can create role bindings which we will do in the next class okay in the tomorrow's class we will use the same account and we will create service account we will create roles and we will create role bindings as well okay so stay tuned for tomorrow's video and before tomorrow's video try to create this account because as you get more and more production or real time uh, experience you will be more confident and you will face the interviews very well i hope you enjoyed today's video and if you have any questions uh, please put that in the comment section and don't forget to subscribe my channel abhishek virmala thank you so much see you all in the next video take care
Hello everyone, my name is Abhishek and welcome back to my channel. So today is day 42 of our complete DevOps course and in this class, we'll be learning about Kubernetes monitoring. So this class is not just going to be a theory, but I have also a GitHub repository that is uh, practical, like you know, you have all the installation steps and whatever we are going to try as part of the demo. The reason why I've created this repository is, you know, uh, we are going to do a lot of commands on my Minikube cluster. So uh, sometimes people asked me like, you know, can you put these commands in a, a GitHub repository or can you share them as part of a document? So I thought anyways, I'm going to enhance this repository in the future and add more topics. Like, you know, I'll be adding more topics about uh, advanced Kubernetes monitoring, writing your own metric server. So for all of those things, I thought uh, I will create a centralized GitHub repository and this is the one. So what you can do is you can star this repository so that you understand what are the future advancements that I'm going to make to this repository. Perfect. But coming to the topic for today, what we are going to learn today is firstly, we will definitely understand as usual, right? As every class, I'm going to explain the why aspect, like why you need monitoring, what is the advantage of monitoring, uh, what is Prometheus, what is Grafana. So we are going to learn all of those things. After that, I'm going to show you how to install these tools. So the only prerequisite for today's class is you have to have uh, a Kubernetes cluster that can be anything like uh, it can be a real Kubernetes cluster on a production or it can be your development Kubernetes clusters like Minikube, K3S, K3D, any or anything uh, we are fine with it, right? Uh, we are going to learn about installation and then finally I'm going to monitor. I'm going to show you how to monitor the Minikube. I'm going to use Minikube. So Minikube Kubernetes cluster using Prometheus and visualize using Grafana. Right. So this is going to be an interesting one. And uh, we are going to uh, prepare a Grafana dashboard that will show the metrics of API servers and uh, the deployments that we have uh, on on our Kubernetes cluster. What is the status? What are the replicas? We are going to fetch a lot of information from my Kubernetes cluster. So watch the video till the end so that you understand the, uh, you know, concept of Prometheus Grafana as well as monitoring of Kubernetes clusters. So let's start with why and uh, like i told you i've very well documented all of these things like even if you want to follow uh why monitoring or why prometheus that i'm going to explain you can use the same github repository to understand uh whenever in your interviews also you can use this repository for answering the questions firstly why monitoring is required so let's say in your organization you have one kubernetes cluster okay so whenever you have a single kubernetes cluster that's not a problem because for just one single Kubernetes cluster, probably because you are a single DevOps engineer, what you can do is you can monitor your own Kubernetes cluster. Uh, but what happens if this one Kubernetes cluster is used by multiple teams? Let's say you have multiple teams who are accessing this Kubernetes cluster and one of the teams says that, oh, okay, in my Kubernetes cluster, uh, something is going wrong. Probably they'll say that the deployment is not receiving the request or they will say that the service is not accessible for a short while. So how do you solve this problem? Or at least how do you understand as a DevOps engineer? Now, this is just one Kubernetes cluster. As the number of Kubernetes clusters increases, probably you have a, a dev environment, you have staging environment, you have production environment. So your number of Kubernetes clusters keep growing. So as the number of Kubernetes clusters keep, keep growing, then you would definitely need a observability or monitoring platform. So that is where Kubernetes comes into picture. Okay. So Kubernetes was initially developed by uh, SoundCloud. Then it is open sourced right now. Kubernetes is a, uh, sorry, Prometheus is a complete uh, open source platform and anybody can use this Prometheus uh, on their uh, uh, clusters. Like even if, even if you are running Kubernetes cluster behind or you're running a Kubernetes cluster in your enterprise, you can use Prometheus because it is open sourced one. Perfect. So then if you have Prometheus, what is the requirement of Grafana? So Grafana is basically for the visualization, right? So Prometheus can give you a lot of information uh, using the uh, uh, queries, like you can use the prom uh, QL queries and you can get all the information uh, regarding your Kubernetes cluster, but for a better visualization, you will understand when I uh, show you the live demo, you would need a Grafana. Uh, so Grafana can use any data sources and Prometheus can be used as one of the data source. Okay, perfect. Now, so what is the architecture of Prometheus? So sometimes interviewers might ask you this question. Uh, can you explain me the architecture of uh, Prometheus? This diagram might 
look scary but it is very very simple like you have a kubernetes cluster what prometheus does is as you install prometheus there is a component in prometheus called as a prometheus server so this prometheus server what it does is it has a http server and the Pr prometheus collects all the information like from your kubernetes cluster by default your kubernetes has a api server and api server exposes a lot of metrics about your kubernetes cluster okay so maybe five years or six years uh, ago you might have to do a lot of configuration for your kubernetes cluster but right now these tools are very matured uh, even they have contributed back to kubernetes so a lot of metrics are exposed out of the box in your kubernetes cluster previously maybe you have to do a lot of configuration for your kubernetes but right now the number of configurations has gone down so kubernetes has an inbuilt api server okay so this inbuilt api server exposes a lot of metrics so it says uh, if you access me on API server slash metrics, API server IP slash metrics, you can get all the information of what is the status of your uh, resources in the Kubernetes cluster. Some of the default resources. Now Prometheus will try to fetch this information and it stores the entire information in a time series database. Okay. So what is time series database? It's just like, you know, with respect to the timestamp, it stores the information of the metrics of your Kubernetes cluster. So this is about the default Kubernetes uh, resources right but what if you want to do uh, more resources or what if you want to get beyond the out of the box metrics that your kubernetes api server is using that also we are going to learn today okay so don't worry about it then it stores all of these things on the uh, disk right so hdd or ssd whatever you are using so because it has to store this is a time series database it has to store information somewhere right it stores on a node using H on the H hdd or ssd then it has a monitoring uh, uh, system like, you know, you can configure Prometheus with alert manager and you can send notifications to different platforms. Probably you can send to Slack, you can send, you can do an email, you can send to various uh, things. So what happens under the hood is if you uh, create the alert manager, so Prometheus can push the alerts to the alert manager and you can configure this alert manager to send out notifications to different places. Probably in my organization, uh, let's say uh, I have decided to use Slack for alerting. So what happens is whenever Prometheus identifies, uh, you know, uh, you can say what kind of metrics or what kind of alerts have to be pushed. Let's say I say that uh, if API server is not responding according to uh, my limit that I've set, then what you can say is Prometheus send an alert to alert manager. So Prometheus will send the alert to alert manager saying that API server, Kubernetes API server is, uh, you know, sometimes uh, showing a flaky behavior or it is not responding a few times. So this alert manager, depending upon the uh, number of things that you have configured with alert manager, it's not just one thing. Probably you can do email, you can do Slack, you can do meet, uh, Google Meet, anything, right? So you can send notifications to multiple places. So that's what Alert Manager does. And apart from that, like this is about the default configuration, right? But somebody can also go to Prometheus server, like Prometheus provides a very good UI. So you can also go to the Prometheus UI and you can execute some PromQL queries. PromQL is nothing but Prome Prometheal, uh, sorry, Prometheus uh, queries. So you can execute some Prometheus queries to get the information from Prometheus, whatever it has recorded. Or you can also use dashboards like Grafana or like any other tool, like for example, AWS supports API, right? So Prometheus also supports API. You can also do some curl commands or using Postman. You can get that information from Prometheus as well. So this is overall like the high level architecture of Prometheus. So as we keep learning Prometheus, this architecture looks even more simple. Now, like I told you, why Grafana? So Grafana is just for the data visualization. So here, when you do a query to Prometheus, it gives you output in a uh, format for example, uh, any tool uh, that is returning your output, let's say it is giving output in JSON format. And if your managers or, you know, if uh, you want to set up dashboards uh, in your organization somewhere so that uh, everybody can monitor JSON or, you know, any kind of uh, this templating languages are difficult to read, right? So if you have a lot of information, it is very easy to represent the information in charts or, you know, any, any kind of diagrams. So that's what Grafana does for you. So it provides a very good visualization. It retrieves the information from Prometheus. You can configure Prometheus as a data source and you can get the information into Grafana. And inside the Grafana, what you can do is you can create some nice diagrams. This is for layman understanding. Okay. So you can create some nice charts or visualization. 
so now without wasting any time let's start our demo and uh, what i'm going to do here is you know i'm going i'm just going to take a, a kubernetes cluster so i'll create right from scratch so that many people have been asking me uh, how to create a kubernetes cluster even though i have explained that in the previous videos no worries i can do it one more time so i am using minikube for this demo uh, most of the times i use kind whenever i am doing my local development or whenever i am doing uh, local testing because kind is a very lightweight uh, kubernetes in docker uh, kubernetes cluster but you know whenever you you are doing this kind of demos which requires uh, more uh, memory or which requires more cpu go with minikube so one thing that you can do is you can simply say minikube start but when you say minikube start let's say you are on windows or mac it uses the docker driver as default so that means to say that uh, the default driver which minikube is using is docker but for better or easy networking configurations go with the virtualization like in my case i prefer hyperkit okay so this is the command that i used to start my minikube cluster and if you are on mac definitely use this hyperkit is a default virtualization uh, that is available on your uh, mac or supported on the mac uh, but you can also go with virtual box or kill virtual box or any other platform as well okay so this is the command that i am using minikube start i am giving 4 gb of memory and driver as hyperkit so if you don't provide this driver as hyperkit then it would use the docker desktop so whenever you are using the docker desktop sometimes when you are exposing your services or when you are using ingress maybe you might have to do some additional networking configuration so this doesn't take much time uh it would take uh, probably a minute to create your kubernetes cluster and once your kubernetes cluster is ready what we can do is go back to this github repository right so in this github repository i have created a folder called installation and you have installation for both of the things like you can use prometheus uh, folder for installing understanding how to install prometheus you can use grafana for understanding how to use grafana or install grafana right so i will also use the same github repository perfect this would need a minute more for uh, creating the mini cube kubernetes cluster using hyperkit perfect so my kubernetes cluster is ready i have installed the latest version of the kubernetes cluster that is 1. Dot whatever is supported out of the box with my installation so it has 1.23.3 i did not pass any additional configuration so uh, probably in your case you might be installing 1.25 that doesn't matter okay so i'll show you that my uh, kubernetes cluster if i just say kubectl get pods minus a so you will notice that it just has all the default installations that uh, like the kubernetes api server controller manager uh, uh, code dns etcd only these things right so let me proceed now and start with the installation of prometheus so i would go with the helm as installation option or operators as installation option okay so either use helm or use operators this is not just for these tools in a general practice operators offer a lot of uh, you know advanced capabilities like you know you can do life cycle management of your kubernetes controllers using operators where you can install it can you can configure for automatic upgrades let's say tomorrow there is a new version of prometheus operators are capable of uh, upgrading your prometheus automatically and uh, they can do a lot of more things we will talk when we discuss about pro, uh, kubernetes operators so in this class i am going to install using helm so i will just open uh, the github page that i have shown you in a different uh, screen and uh, what i am going to do is i'm just going to copy paste the commands so the first command that you will see in the github page probably if you are watching the video you can open the github page uh, in a new tab or if you have a different screen you can open it there so i am just copied it and it says helm repo add prometheus community and so what i am doing here i'm just adding a helm chart so first thing that you need to do when you are using helm is to add the helm repo right so that's what i'm doing here in my case it is already existing but uh, in your case if it is not available like you can do it you can install it you can add the repo i means to say now helm repo update so this would update if you have let's say you have installed uh, this repo a week back and now there is a new version of prometheus uh, 
controller. So always do Helm repo update before you install anything. So here in this case, when I do Helm repo update, so it updated a few things successfully. Perfect. After that, I would simply install the Prometheus controller, right? So this is the step to install the Prometheus controller and the other required configurations like the Prometheus config map and the other things. Perfect. Helm install Prometheus, Prometheus community. So you could also do this step directly if you had the Helm chart. But what happens if you don't do Helm repo update, probably you might install an old version of Prometheus. No problem. So I have installed, uh, I'm going to install uh, Prometheus now. So it says, perfect. So Prometheus is successfully installed. And what it says, like, just copy this information. Uh, do not run to the uh, next command because here, it gives you some important information on how to like, you know, uh, how to get the uh, server URL. Uh, probably if you are not using Minikube, uh, maybe if you're using uh, OpenShift platform or if, you're, or if you're using a different platform. So this information is very important for you. So read the information, whatever is provided here. And uh, uh, probably if you want to do uh, port forwarding, all of these things is available. But in this class, I'm going to explain you all of these things. So you can skip, but always try to read these things. So I've done the Helm install. Perfect, now the Prometheus installed. Let me see if it is installed right or not. kubectl get pods. Uh, it should run uh, Prometheus pods. Perfect, so the Prometheus pods are running. So Prometheus server is still running, right? So if you see here, it says Prometheus server. So the container is creating, even in this case, uh, cube state metrics. Uh, I'll explain you what is cube state, uh, cube state metrics and what is the importance of cube state metrics, but uh, you can understand that it is still running. Okay, so let's give it a minute. So this is running now, cube state metrics, and this is taking more time. So meanwhile, I can explain you what is cube state metrics. So like I told you, uh, Kubernetes API server, it would expect it it exposes few metrics of your Kubernetes, right? So it gives you information about the Kubernetes API server. It gives you information about the default uh, installations on your Kubernetes cluster, which I showed you uh, a couple of minutes ago. But as you are monitoring your Kubernetes clusters, you might require more information. Probably you might want to know information about all the deployments, all the pods, all the services on your Kubernetes cluster. You would want to know um, if the replica count is matching the expected replica count of all the deployments on your Kubernetes cluster. So what the Kubernetes community or you know what uh, people at kubestate metrics have done is they have created uh, a kubestate metrics controller. So you can create a service for this kubestate metrics and you can use this kubestate metrics. So when you call uh, the kubestate metrics on the uh, you know uh, metrics endpoint, so it would give you a lot of information about your existing Kubernetes cluster. So this information is beyond the information your Kubernetes API server is providing. So that is the importance of this uh, specific Kubernetes controller. So when you install using Helm, this is installed by default. Let's say you are not using Helm or let's say you are installing uh, just the Prometheus deployment. So I'll also show you that what happens in that case. Let's say you, you are not using Helm chat and you have not installed this. I'll show you how to install this by your own, right? How to install kubestate metrics. So mean uh, before that, let me just say kubectl get pods and see if everything is running. Perfect, now everything is running and I am good to go. So now what I will do is I will just see kubectl get SVC. So all the services here, so there are uh, services like uh, Prometheus server. So this is a service that is created using cluster IP mode and uh, you have again this one which is very important uh, prometheus cube state metrics that is also created on the cluster ip mode so and then alert manager that i told you so all of these things are uh, created using cluster ip but what i want to do is i want to expose this prometheus uh, server and i want to show you uh, how does the prometheus uh, server api would look like and uh, what queries that you can create or you know all of these things so for that what you can do is firstly convert this cluster IP mode service into a, a node port service. So what you can do is go to the documentation and simply use the command that I've provided. So this is kubectl expose uh, service command. So what it would do is uh, as soon as I enter this one, 
okay so you would see a new entry here uh let me just do again kubectl get svc so you would do uh, see a new entry called prometheus server ext because in the command i have provided uh, you know expose a service and the name of the expose service should be prometheus server ext okay so now what i can do is i can open the prometheus uh, server ui on the node port three, uh, 31000 31110 right so let me go back uh, take the terminal here right and uh, show this to you so before that i need to get the ip address of my kubernetes node so i can just do minikube ip so if i do minikube ip this is the ip address so go back take the uh, take the browser enter this one here http colon what was the port again sorry uh, 31110 right so 31110 so see that the prometheus is running so you have installed prometheus on your kubernetes cluster so right so you have done the step one successfully so now what you can do is you can uh, provide any Prometheus queries, right? Uh, let's say you're not uh, aware of Prometheus queries. You can just read the Prometheus documentation or you can also use chat GPT uh, to just give information about a few Prometheus queries. And as soon as you execute uh, this Prometheus queries here, I'll show you, don't worry about that. So you can get the information about your Kubernetes cluster. So by default, like I told you, you can only get the information of the metrics that are exposed by your Kubernetes API server. So if you have a application, uh, let's say you have an application called XYZ that your developers have deployed on your Kubernetes cluster and you want to get the health checks of it or you want to get live, liveliness probe or you want to get any details of that particular application using, I mean, at this point of time, it will not be possible because the API server or the cube state metrics, they will only give you the information uh, at a certain level. But if you want to get more details of your application, then your developer should write a metric server or they can use the Prometheus metrics libraries. And what they can do is they can expose a metrics endpoint and you can scrape that metrics inside the Prometheus uh, that I'll show you how to do that. Uh, in Prometheus, you will have a config map and inside that config map, you can scrape the metrics. So you can say Prometheus that, okay, apart from the metrics that uh, Abhishek is going to uh, show me, in the Grafana board or here, what I want to do additionally is I also want to get the metrics of my custom application or the application that my developer has deployed. And um, apart from the default metrics, uh, kubestead metrics is giving me, I want some additional metrics. Okay, so uh, let's not bother about it uh, for a while. So for now, you have the Prometheus and uh, Prometheus is installed. Now, what I'm going to show you is the advantage of this, uh, this one here. Prometheus cube state metrics, right? So what is the advantage of it? Uh, maybe we'll firstly create Grafana and then we will come back. Okay, so that you understand what are the default uh, metrics that uh, Kubernetes API server is giving and what is the advantage of this cube uh, uh, state metrics, which is going to give you additional metrics. So again, I'll go back to the document uh, here. So if you go to the GitHub, so there is a folder called Grafana. Just go to the Grafana folder and you have helm.md. So just copy the commands step by step. And every time you do it, verify that your command is passing. So let me just copy the first command to add Grafana helm chat. So now the Grafana in my case already exists. Probably in your case, it does not exist. And it is always a good practice to do helm repo update after that. So I have, repo, I have updated the helm repo as well. Then I'll proceed with installing the Grafana using the Grafana Helm chart. So now this should install the Grafana on my Kubernetes Minikube cluster. So it doesn't take much time. And uh, you will notice here that it is very important now to follow these steps because you need to know the password for your Grafana. Okay. So to log into Grafana or, you know, to uh, visualize the information from Prometheus on your Grafana dashboard, what you need to have is the password to log into Grafana. So you can get that password here. You can simply copy the uh, command which says kubectl get secret and uh, you know, admin is the user and the password in this case, oh, sorry. Again, copy it.
so this is the password in my case okay so now let me try to expose this grafana similarly i have done to my uh, uh, prometheus because if you just do kubectl get svc you will notice that there is a grafana service but this grafana service is again here running on the cluster ip so let me expose this one and uh, create a node port mode grafana service okay so you will notice a new entry uh, oh sorry there is a typo here i think i need to fix this on the github page as well no problem so now you will notice that a new uh, service uh, entry would be created if i just say kubectl get svc you will notice that you know there is something called as grafana ext in your production environments or in your dev staging environments you don't have to do this because you will definitely use ingress you will have a ingress controller so you can create a ingress or route for your grafana and you can start using that if you are using a operator then that would be automatically created you don't even have to do that so now the node port ip address for this is 31281 okay so again uh, mini cube ip so this is the ip address and 31281 is the port so let me take uh, this one here and again show you let me open a new tab copy it http colon 31281 now you should see grafana dashboard as well right so it will ask you for the user id and password uh, i explained you how to get the password right so if you don't remember go back and uh, what was the command that i have executed kubectl get secret namespace and this was the password that it generated for me so enter the password here and now you are able to log into grafana as well right so now you have successfully set up prometheus as well as grafana for your kubernetes mini cube cluster awesome so the first thing that you should do as soon as you have grafana is you need to create prometheus as a data source for your grafana now why is this required because like i told you grafana is a visualization platform so it it would need some metrics or it would need some information for it to create all the charts or all the required diagrams so creating that is not difficult just go to this option here uh, called data source add your first data source click on it so you would have option for multiple data sources like i told you prometheus supports a lot of data sources but uh, sorry grafana supports a lot of data sources we are interested about prometheus so click on prometheus provide the ip address of your prometheus so in my case i can copy it from here and uh, paste it here right so this is the ip address and uh, save and test so that would save the configuration and it will also test if your data source is working or not so here it it said data source is working that means to say now my prometheus will be able to sorry again uh, sorry for that no my grafana will be able to retrieve the information from prometheus it can use prometheus as the data source and it can show you some dashboards so let me go and create a dashboard as well so click on the dashboards option here and uh, you would okay you can do it from here and uh, what you can do is instead of creating your first dashboard because it, it you have to do a lot of things the simplest thing that you can do is come here click on uh, a dashboards option here you have something called as import so what grafana has done for you is grafana says that okay you don't have to create anything so in uh, grafana.com we have created multiple dashboards like uh, dashboards are nothing but they have created some predefined queries and anybody who is going to use that uh, dashboard id okay so we will automatically configure some queries to pull the information from prometheus so if you are starting with grafana use this id called 3326 just click on load and your first uh, dashboard not found okay what was the problem let me try it one more time 3326 uh just give me a second sorry my bad the id name would be 3662 it's not uh, sorry sorry for that yeah as soon as you click on the load so you will uh, see here that you can choose what is the uh, default option that is prometheus again so just click on import and you will notice that a 
beautiful dashboard is created for you and this dashboard is retrieving the information from your minikube cluster now how this how did this happen so as soon as you entered an id called 3326 what the people or you know what the grafana dashboard that is available for you at the grafana.com has done is it has created a pre-existing or you know uh, pre-created template and that template would run queries like here i have shown you one diagram uh, if we go back So here, what I told you in the initial slide is, you know, if you want to get any information from the Prometheus server uh, through Grafana, you have to run some PromQL queries, right? For if you are a beginner, you might not know about this PromQL queries. Uh, maybe you have to, uh, you know, learn or you will take more time to understand how to write this PromQL queries. So what Grafana said is, okay, don't worry, we'll make it easy. We have noted down what are some of the common uh, queries or what are some of the standard queries that everybody would require. And we have created a template for it. And that template ID is 3662. So 3662 in the Grafana is a standard template that would get lot of information from your Kubernetes cluster. See, now we are able to get the information of Kubernetes API server, Kubernetes nodes, all of the things, right? So you can uh, just go on one specific thing. Let's just click on Kubernetes nodes. So here you have the information of the Kubernetes nodes. And uh, uh, probably if you want to get uh, any information about uh, what is the uptime of your Minikube cluster. So it says Minikube cluster is always running. And if you just hover on it, so it will give you the query as well. Okay, so slightly hover on it. Uh, yeah, so it is sometimes difficult to capture that. View. Uh, just give me a moment. Okay, no problem. Like, you know, you can hover on it and you can get the query as well. Okay, so as soon as I'm doing it, I'm not able to copy it and uh, show it to people. But uh, you can get all of these queries uh, to understand or you can also go to, like see here. So it is saying it has executed uh, a query called sum and it is getting the time series of all the things. What is the memory chunks? Or, you know, what are some of the missed iterations? So all of these things, and this is a real-time dashboard. So you can get this information uh even if you execute this query that i'm showing you here now average average over time of uh, up status of my kubernetes node so you are going to get the output in the prometheus as 100 okay so you can execute that queries here as well but like i told you uh, if you are going to execute the queries here uh, inside the prometheus what will happen is you are going to get the information in a json format but for a better visualization go for grafana you can use the similar queries in grafana as well now, but here if you see what is happening is I have the metrics regarding the native Kubernetes services like you have Kubernetes API server, you have few other components. But what if I would like to know what is the deployment status? What are the running replicas or, you know, what is the uh, current status of the Kubernetes service from uh, Prometheus? So that's why what uh, Prometheus has done or what this specific service that I'm going to talk is cube state metrics. So this one here, cube CTL get SVC. So this is the cube state matrix and this is going to give you a lot of more information. Okay, so again, similar to the uh, previous things, I'll try to expose this cube state matrix and go I'm going to show you. Okay, so the command that we're going to use is just say expose and uh, use this one here. Followed by what is the target port? So how do you understand the target port? So if you look at the cube state matrix, so the target port is 8080. So 8080. And let us name it as cube state matrix hyphen ext. Now, once I run this, you will get a new entry for this uh, Prometheus cube state matrix as well. So let me do cube CTL get SVC one more time. And now you will notice that the cube state matrix is running on 30421. Now see the magic, what would happen if I just use the same Minikube IP address, but on the port 30421. Okay, so let me do that. What is the Minikube IP address? HTTP colon double slash 192.168.6415. Or let me copy it from the cluster only.
copy colon 30421 now see so it says let me increase the font it says okay so you are trying to reach cube metrics and if you click on metrics so you get metrics of a lot of things on your kubernetes cluster okay so like i told you this is a json format information not json actually so this is a metrics format information where you are getting a lot of information right but now what you can do is see you can use this same information inside your grafana as well or take any of this uh, query like for example i would like to know what is the status of deployments okay so you can just use the prometheus query here called uh, this one so what it is doing is it would give me status of my prometheus server so you can take this query here and you can execute it uh, like this and as soon as you do execute See, this is the information that Grafana, uh, sorry, Prometheus has returned you. And what Grafana will do is it will take the same information, but it will provide you this information in a visualization pattern. Okay. So that's the only difference. Like the information is coming from Prometheus itself. Grafana is just using Prometheus as a data source and it is providing you this information in a visualization format. Okay. So it is providing you this information in a better format. Now, what you have done till now is that you have set up Prometheus, you have set up Grafana, and you have used the default dashboard in the Grafana, that is 3662 uh, ID, uh, that's a default template, which will retrieve a lot of information about your Kubernetes cluster. What is your nodes uptime? What is the status of your Kubernetes API server? What is the status of your Kubernetes ETCD? All of these things is available. Let's say if your organization requires more information, then what you can do as a DevOps engineer, you can expose the cube state metrics and you can get a lot of information on this specific endpoint. Okay, what is the endpoint here? 192, 168, 64, uh, 15 is my uh, mini cube IP address, followed by the node port of my uh, cube state metrics slash metrics. Okay, so this is the endpoint where you are going to achieve or get all the information. Now you might ask me, okay, so I am doing this on the browser, but how do I do this information inside my Prometheus? Like how do I get this information directly inside my Prometheus? So again, it's not a rocket science. What you need to do is you can just do kubectl get cm. So this is the config map called Prometheus server. Okay, just open this Prometheus server. Okay, kubectl edit cm config map called Prometheus server and here you have information about all the data that your Prometheus is scraping. Okay, so scrape information is nothing but the information that Prometheus is getting from. Like you have a Prometheus.yaml file and here you have scrape configs. So by default, what it is saying is it is just getting the information from the local host 9090. But where I want the new information should be coming from. So I want the new information should be coming from this specific endpoint. 192.168.64.15.304.2.1. Sorry, 21. Right. So this is the new information that I want. So what I can do is I can create a new entry inside my Kubernetes cluster for this cube state matrix endpoint. So here I would add a new configuration. How would I do that? I can simply come here. Okay, so provide a new job name and uh, here you can say uh, state matrix or anything that you would like to and here you would say uh, static configs and put the same information and provide the target IP address. Okay, now the important information is okay. So this is about cube state matrix and this is about the default Prometheus matrix. But what about the applications my, my developers are writing? So my developers are writing bunch of applications and how do I get the health of those applications? So how do I understand if that applications are receiving or you know they are sending out uh, response on each and every request. So how do you get that information is you should ask your developers, right? Similar to this cube state matrix, it is exposing uh, all the metrics regarding the Kubernetes uh, default applications on slash metric endpoint, right? So similarly, you should ask your developers to write a metric server. And what they will do is they will write a metric server and they will use the Prometheus libraries. Uh, there is a very good documentation that is available as a DevOps engineer. If you are not writing these things, it is not required. But let's say you are interested. What you can do is you can just search for Prometheus metric server. How do I write that? 
I will also explain you that in the future classes. So once your developers or DevOps engineers writes that, then it is all about just going back and updating your applications metrics here. Okay, so this is very simple. And this is how you are going to do monitoring and visualization using Prometheus and Grafana, right? I hope uh, you understood what we have done today. And if you want to replicate the same behavior, if you want to try out the same things at your end, then you can follow this documentation where I have detailed each and every step. Okay, whatever I have done till now, and probably the cube state metrics information is missing. So that thing you can uh, understand from the video because it is just one command. Okay. And so yeah, so this is the video for today. If you like the video, click on the like button. If you have any questions or any feedback for me, put that in the comment section. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please share the video with your friends. Thank you so much. I'll see you in the next video. Take care, everyone. Bye. Hello, everyone. My name is Abhishek and welcome back to my channel. So today we are at day 40 of our complete DevOps course. And in this class, we'll be learning about custom resources in Kubernetes. Okay, so before we go to the topic, I just want to make an announcement that if you haven't subscribed to my channel, definitely subscribe to my channel because I am going to announce my future roadmap in next couple of days where, you know, I'll explain you what am I going to do after this complete DevOps course? Are there going to be master classes? Are there going to be any more uh, free courses that I'm going to conduct? So, you know, if you want to get early access to that, or if you want to follow the content right from day one, then, you know, definitely subscribe to my channel to get those interesting updates. Okay. So without wasting any time, if we jump onto the topic for today, what we will learn today is the topic related to custom resource definitions and custom resources. Okay, so on a high level, we will understand what is a custom resource definition. The shorthand for the custom resource definition is CRD, which is very popular. Like, you know, people usually say CRD, not custom resource definitions, just to be uh, like, you know, whenever they are writing or whenever they are talking about it, so that it's very simple. It's very simple to say. Okay, and then we will talk about custom resources and then we will try to understand what is a custom controller. Okay, so these are the three things that we will understand today. Now, so before I explain uh, the topic, I will just give you a high level overview so that you understand what are we going to talk today. So this is your Kubernetes cluster. Okay, so within your Kubernetes cluster, by default, there are some you know, resources that come out of the box. Uh, for example, uh, you have a deployment, like you can create a deployment resource. And, uh, you know, once you write a deployment.yaml file, a deployment is created for you, an application is created for you, which is taken care by uh, the controller in the Kubernetes. Or you have service in Kubernetes, or you have pod in Kubernetes, or you have config map, you have secrets. So these are all the native Kubernetes resources. So they all of them come out of the box in Kubernetes, right? But apart from this out of the box resources. So what Kubernetes says is if you want to extend the API of Kubernetes or you know, you want to introduce a new resource to Kubernetes. Okay, so this is very important. Okay, so if you want to introduce a new resource to Kubernetes, why you want to introduce a new resource? Because if you feel that the functionality that you need inside the Kubernetes is not supported by any of these resources. For example, let's let me give you a basic example. Let's say uh, you feel that Kubernetes does not uh, uh, support advanced security capabilities. Okay. So, for example, you have resources like Cube Hunter or Kiverno or Cube Proxy, sorry, uh, or uh, Cube Bench. So, all of these things try to address the security related problem. So, you know, they say that, okay, we want to introduce a new resource into Kubernetes. Or, you know, you have applications like Argo CD. What they say is, we want to introduce the GitOps capabilities to Kubernetes. Or you have applications like Flux, you have Spinnaker. So, you have hundreds of applications. Like, if you go to CNCF, CNCF is all about the Kubernetes controllers, like the custom Kubernetes controllers. Okay. So you have so many resources, like whenever you want to introduce a new resource to Kubernetes, or you want to extend the API of Kubernetes to introduce a new resource. So that's when you use all of these things. Okay. So this is the high level overview. And what happens is there are two actors here, right? The actor number one is DevOps engineer. And the actor number two is the user. So Deploying the custom resource definition and the custom uh, custom controller is the responsibility of the DevOps engineer. And deploying the custom resource 
can be the action of the user or can be the action of the devops engineer as well okay so these are the three things that we are going to talk today and we will try to understand with the actors okay and we will try to understand the concept okay so why you want to extend the uh, api of kubernetes i just explained you because whenever you want to introduce a new resource to kubernetes okay probably argo cd or flux or key clock or you know uh, any resource in kubernetes if you go to cncf you will find so many resources in such cases you need a custom resource custom resource definition and a custom controller let's try to understand each one of them and let's try to deep dive into this concept okay so firstly like again let's say this is your kubernetes cluster okay and what you have done is you like you know you learned about the basic concept of kubernetes you understood or your organization has implemented kubernetes they have deployed the application as a kubernetes deployment and then they have created a service for it and then they have also created an ingress resource for it and this deployment might have used some config maps uh, secrets so everything is fine and the user who is there he was also able to or he or she was able to access the application through the ingress like you have created the ingress so you know let's say there is an ingress controller and your application is working fine like you know the traffic is flowing in and outside the kubernetes cluster and your application is being used so there is no problem at all but after a while what what the devops engineering team or you know what you have as a devops engineer has uh, said is let me explore kubernetes more and as you explore kubernetes more you have realized that there is world beyond this native kubernetes resources like you know you have realized that there is something called istio which adds you know service mesh capabilities to your kubernetes cluster or you know you have realized uh, there is an application called argo cd which adds the capabilities of gitops to your kubernetes cluster okay or you have realized that there is a application called key clock what it does is it will provide a very tight identity and access management or you know oauth or oidc capabilities to your kubernetes cluster so similarly there are multiple applications that you have realized are used to enhance the behavior of your kubernetes cluster your application is working fine but once you started exploring kubernetes you realize that there are multiple things like you know you have security related things okay you have uh, kiverno you have kubebench you have kubeproxy so you have realized that you know there is world beyond the existing kubernetes resources now how does kubernetes support these resources because the number of these resources is keep i mean it kept growing right so there are there is not one uh, resource like istio or argo cd or key clock so there are multiple people in the market there are multiple companies who says that you know we will provide advanced capabilities to kubernetes clusters or you know uh, apart from the basic kubernetes resources use our resource to get x feature use our resource to get y feature on kubernetes use our resource to get z feature on kubernetes it can be load balancing it can be security firewall api gateway so each and every company is coming to you know uh, kubernetes space and they are saying that okay we will uh, add new capabilities to kubernetes so how does kubernetes handle with this like you know kubernetes cannot go to each of these applications and kubernetes cannot add the logic for these applications into the uh, kubernetes control plane component right kubernetes has accommodated logic for deployment kubernetes has accommodated logic for service kubernetes has accommodated logic for uh, you know let's say config maps or secrets but if kubernetes has to accommodate logic for all of these things it is practically impossible for kubernetes team or creators of kubernetes because the number of these applications has reached thousands 10000s you know there are like there are multiple custom kubernetes controllers in the market which are solving some or the other problem with kubernetes so that's why what kubernetes said is okay these are the set defined resources like you know whatever you are seeing here or beyond this so we have only few resources that we support out of the box if you want to add additional capabilities to kubernetes what we will do is we will allow the users to extend the api of kubernetes okay watch this or understand this point carefully so what kubernetes is saying we will allow you to extend the capabilities of kubernetes or extend the api of kubernetes so they are saying that you can add a new api uh, to your kubernetes or you can add a new api resource to kubernetes using this resource you can ask your uh, customers or you can ask your whoever wants to use istio so what kubernetes is saying istio people is that you can create 
you can extend the uh, kubernetes like uh, probably uh, whoever your users are you can ask them to deploy few resources and uh, you know you can uh, uh, this way you can extend the kubernetes clusters but we are not going to support it so to extend the api or to extend the capabilities of api there are three resources in kubernetes okay now i, I think you understood the problem so the three resources are crd like i told you in the first line then you have cr then you have custom controller let us try to dig dive into each of them and let us try to understand first one crd okay so crd is nothing but custom resource definition that means you are defining whoever it is like when i say you it's not you but uh, for example if uh, there is a company called istio and istio says that we wants to enhance the capability of kubernetes so kubernetes people are saying istio to create a crd what is a crd defining a new type of api to kubernetes okay so define a new type of kubernetes api to kubernetes and how do you define is you have to submit a custom resource definition to kubernetes okay so people of istio will create a new custom resource definition and in this custom resource definition like it's a yaml file and in this yaml file you will define things like you know what a user can create for example if you are a user or if you are a user who are uh, creating a deployment.yaml file okay so in your deployment.yaml file probably you have mentioned few things like you have said what is the api what is the kind what is the spec inside spec what is the template what is the pod what is the container what is the container port but beyond this how does kubernetes understand whatever the deployment.yaml you have created is correct or not so kubernetes will have a template which has all the fields related to deployment.yaml like you know tomorrow you can add volume mounts tomorrow you can add mounts or tomorrow you have added a new field called xyz so kubernetes will say that immediately when you create a new field called xyz in the deployment.yaml you will get an error okay what error you will get field xyz is not known if you have a uh, question like go to your deployment.yaml file and uh, you know write a new field in the inside the spec try to create a new field called xyz so kubernetes will immediately throw a error called field xyz is not known or some error kubernetes will throw at you okay so how kubernetes is throwing this error because kubernetes knows what is the definition of a deployment okay out of this definition you can use whatever is required or you can omit whatever is not required but this is the standard definition that kubernetes has similarly even for the custom resource or what is a custom resource custom resource is a custom like you know it's a new or it's a uh, you know a variable resource that you are submitting to kubernetes but before anyone submits kubernetes asks you to extend or define a new type of api to kubernetes using the custom resource definition where people of istio if you are taking istio as an example they will provide a complete yaml file which will have all the possible options that they support okay a crd is a yaml file which is used to introduce a new type of api to kubernetes and that will have all the fields a user can submit in the custom resource okay like for example if you take about a resource called deployment.yaml and further uh, deployment.yaml you have a resource definition inside your kubernetes so this is a general resource of kubernetes and this is a general resource definition of kubernetes but because we are dealing with custom resources that's why we call this as a custom resource definition okay and whatever the user is submitting we call it as a custom resource okay let's try to understand this in detail okay so we'll try to compare it with deployment.yaml itself so that you people will understand for example you are a user you are creating a deployment.yaml okay so this is a yaml file that you are submitting let's say this is a deployment.yaml file okay inside the deployment.yaml file what you will do is you will say my api version okay apps v1 and then you will say my kind then you will say metadata then you will say spec inside the spec you will say template you will say container all of these things okay but how does kubernetes understand if your yaml definition is correct or not so like i told you this is a kubernetes resource that you are creating similarly kubernetes has a resource definition in the api okay in the api server 
or in the Kubernetes controller manager. Okay. So what does this resource definition do? It will validate if the resource that you have created is right or wrong. Okay. So the resource definition in the Kubernetes will try to understand if the user created resource is correct or not. Similarly, even in case of custom resource definition. Okay. So custom resource definition is a custom resource that you are adding to Kubernetes to enhance the behavior of Kubernetes or to extend the API of Kubernetes. So even in that, what a user will do is as a user, he will create a custom resource. Okay. So because we are talking about Istio, let us take about the Istio example itself. So Istio has a custom resource called virtual service. Okay. So what here user will do? He will say API version is something related to Istio. Then he will say kind as virtual service. Then he will say spec. I mean metadata obviously. And then he will say spec. He will say few properties. Okay. Uh, I mean nobody will remember this. You will go to Istio documentation and you will see what is the uh, resource YAML file that is required for the Istio virtual service. You will have a bunch of examples there. Okay. So this is a, what is this virtual service? This virtual service is a custom resource. Now, whom, I mean, who will validate this custom resource? So this custom resource, like I told you, is validated against a custom resource definition that is CRD that you have submitted or the Istio people have created. You can, as a DevOps engineer, you can deploy this custom resource onto your Kubernetes cluster so that your Kubernetes cluster is extended. Okay. So the two functionalities, one is for the CRD is to extend the capabilities of API, uh, Kubernetes API, and also to validate. So right now you have understood the difference, right? If I try to compare this with a native Kubernetes resource against a custom resource of Kubernetes, the process is same. Here you are creating a deployment.yaml file. On the contrary, here the user will create a virtual service YAML file. Okay. And this is validated against the resource definition. Here this will be validated against the custom resource definition. Now, like once you think this is done, okay, but this is not done yet. So you have created a or user has created a custom resource. Okay. So user has submitted a CR validated against a CRD. Let's say this, both of the things are fine. You have created a CRD. It is, uh, you have created a CR. It is validated against the CRD and CR is created inside your Kubernetes cluster. Let's say it is created inside your KH cluster. Now, if you think this is done, this is not done yet. Okay. If you think this is over, this is not over because you have created a custom resource. But like I told you, if you take the same example of deployment, you might have created a deployment.yaml onto your Kubernetes cluster, which is validated against the deployment resource definition. After that, you will know that inside Kubernetes, there is something called as a deployment controller. Right? So this deployment controller is the one that is, you know, it is taking care of creating a replica set. Right? And replica set controller will create a pod. So there is a process that is happening. And who is doing this? A Kubernetes controller is doing it. So similarly, here there has to be a custom controller or you can call it as a custom Kubernetes controller. Okay. So this is the flow. So actually arrow should point here. Okay. So there has to be a custom Kubernetes controller that is already deployed inside your Kubernetes cluster. So that once you deploy your custom resource, let's say you have deployed your CR, this controller will watch for the CR and it will do some action. Okay. So now let us take this into a diagram and understand. Okay. So if this is a Kubernetes cluster, first of all, DevOps engineer, that is the people who are watching this video, maybe, or people might be developers or someone else as well, but most of our audience who are DevOps engineer, what they will do, step one, Okay, if the organization decides to use Istio, for example, or if the organization use any other uh, example, step one is they will deploy the CRD onto the Kubernetes cluster. How they will deploy this? They will go to the Istio documentation. They will find what is the CRD and they will deploy either using the plain Kubernetes manifest or 
they can deploy it using the helm charts or they can deploy them using the operator anything is possible okay so using the crd they, they go to the do i mean they go to the docs and they deploy the crd who deploys the crd so the devops engineers have deployed a new crd let's call it as a because we are talking about istio let's call it as a virtual service crd okay so virtual service crd is deployed onto your kubernetes cluster now now there is another actor here and this actor is nothing but a user so you can consider it as a developer or a devops engineer or anyone okay now what this user will do again he will also go to istio docs and because he wants to use the capabilities of istio inside the cluster he will create a custom resource what is this custom resource let's say he has a namespace called abhishek so inside this abhishek namespace he will create a istio virtual service custom resource let's call it as vs so he has created a vs custom resource now like i told you before it getting created the api server or you know someone will intercept this request and they will try to validate it against the virtual service crd and if the request is correct then the request will pass through if not the request will fail right so this is the process that will happen let's say you have created the user has created a proper custom resource he went to the documentation and he has created a proper custom resource which is validated and deployed inside your kubernetes cluster but till here you have just deployed a custom resource it will just stay there like for example if you just uh, deploy a ingress resource without ingress controller what will happen nothing will happen right like we discussed in the previous class the ingress resource will be of no use similarly you have just deployed a custom resource if you deploy a deployment there is a deployment controller which is taking or which is doing something for you but here this custom resource is being watched by no one till now right so if nobody is watching it then nothing is going to happen right so someone has to watch this custom resource so again the action to here of the devops engineer would be to deploy a custom controller so again how this custom controller is deployed again he will go to the documentation he will either deploy them using the helm chart plain manifest or operator whatever the devops engineer wants to follow the process within the organization so now again he can create this across the cluster the custom controller or he can just create for the specific namespace depending upon the uh, feature that controller supports let's say because we are dealing with abhishek namespace so devops engineer will deploy a custom controller here so now this custom resource is verified by the controller and controller will perform the required action in this case what is the required action the required action is istio that is service mesh or mutual tls or you know east west traffic whatever it is let's not go into the details of it horizontal traffic or east west traffic mutual tls whatever the configuration that you want to do so this istio controller which you deployed will read the custom resource and it will perform the action so whenever you are getting confused with respect to custom resources or custom resource definition the simplest thing that you will do is try to understand it with the native resource itself because whether it is a native resource like deployment or the custom resource the only difference would be in case of custom resource you will deploy all the required resources whereas in case of deployment there are these resources out of the box available on the cluster okay but the steps are common first step is i mean for any custom resource or for any uh, uh, you know uh, applications like istio or argo cd the steps are common that is first step would be you have to deploy the custom resource definition to extend the capabilities of your kubernetes cluster second step would be uh, you know you have to deploy the custom controller and the third step is the user who wants to use this feature on their kubernetes cluster like you might have 100 namespaces but only 20 namespaces might want to use this feature okay so whoever the users or who are the namespaces that they want to use what they will do is they will deploy the custom resource so similarly if you compare with deployment so by default inside kubernetes cluster you have a resource definition for deployment as a user you are creating a deployment in kubernetes which is validated against the resource definition of your kubernetes and instead of the custom controller for deployment inside your kubernetes you have a native kubernetes controller okay so this is the concept of custom resource custom resource definition and a custom controller now some interesting points just for your understanding how one can write a custom controller so the very popular way 
of writing a custom controller is using Golang. You can write using Python. You can write using Java as well. But the community or the very popular medium of writing a uh, custom Kubernetes controller using Golang. One of the primary reasons is, you know, Kubernetes application itself is written in Golang. Okay. So one of the popular Kubernetes, uh, you know, uh, APIs is client go. Now you have client Python, you have client uh, Java, everything. But you know, initially when Kubernetes was developed to extend the capabilities of Kubernetes, Kubernetes has something as a client go, which will allow, uh, you know, you to interact with the uh, Kubernetes API. So whenever I'm saying you want to extend the capabilities of Kubernetes, that means to say the users has to interact with the Kubernetes API, right? Uh, just like kubectl interacts with the uh, Kubernetes API. Whenever you want to write a custom controller, you have to, or you might want to talk to your Kubernetes. For that, inside the Kubernetes API server, there is a component called client go. Okay, so this client go will allow you to talk to the Kubernetes API server. So initially it was only client go. But later point of time, there is uh, now you can write it in Python, you can write it in Java because Kubernetes has uh, API supported for different things. That is fine. But you know, because the community has started with Go and Kubernetes itself is written in Go and the entire CNCF ecosystem, uh, you know, because of the uh, features of Golang, like, uh, you know, multi, uh, like the concurrency or, you know, the easy way of writing it, all of the things we will try to learn whenever we are trying to learning the Golang. But for now, because you know, initially the community has started in uh, uh, Go language and the client Go support is very well. There is a very good community for the client Go and the CNCF ecosystem with Go language. All of these controller, custom controllers are written in Golang. So even when you want to write a new custom controller, the preferred way would be to use Golang. Okay. And how do you write a custom controller on a very high level? Okay. I'm not going into the details because if you want to learn this, probably I can take a new class because many of our subscribers might not understand Golang or, you know, many of our subscribers are a beginners to DevOps or they just learning Kubernetes. So I don't want to go into the depth, but you can put that in the comment section if you want to understand this in detail. Now, so what you will do is you will use Golang as your programming language. And like I told you, if this is your Kubernetes cluster or this is your API server. So there is a component uh, called client go. You will interact with the client go and the entire process depends on setting the watchers. Listers and watchers. Okay. So what you will do is by default, this client go or by default, your Kubernetes will be watching for a set of watchers. Like, you know, there is a deployment watcher. There is a uh, service watcher. So whenever you are creating or whenever you are performing any of these actions like update, delete, or create. Okay. So what happens is there is inbuilt watchers that Kubernetes has created for these uh, resources. So whenever one of these actions is performed, Kubernetes will come to know due using these watchers. But if you want to write a custom Kubernetes controller, then you have to create your new watchers. So early when I started writing Kubernetes uh, controllers back in uh, 2015, there, you know, the frameworks were not strong or there were no uh, lot of frameworks. So you have to create your own watchers, everything right from scratch. But right now you have many uh, frameworks, like one of the very popular ones is you can use the Kubernetes controller runtime. So, you know, this is a uh, go one that is supported by Kubernetes itself. It's a Golang based uh, Kubernetes package. So using this also, you can uh, set up your watchers. Like let's say what people might, uh, people at Istio might have done is they have set up watchers for virtual service. So any action, like I told you, users will create a virtual service, right? Whenever they are creating or deleting or updating. So there is watchers that is configured for this virtual service and this watchers, you know, they will notify uh, client go. So again, in client go, there is a, uh, a package called reflector. So I'm not like I'm telling you, I don't want to go into the details of it. So using this reflector, then, you know, uh, what you will do is whenever you find to understand, uh, sorry, whenever you understand that a new virtual service is created, you can put that in a FIFO uh, queue. So you will uh, put that in a worker queue and, uh, you know, you will start reading each of the uh, elements or each of the objects in the worker queue uh, and like watchers will identify and you will put that in the worker queue and then you will start processing each and every resource. Okay. So this way, like once your controller starts processing each and every object in the queue, then it starts creating 
the required functionality on the Kubernetes. In this case, it will start creating a virtual service configuration on your Kubernetes cluster. So this is a very high level concept. If you want to write a custom controller, like if you are interested more, uh, you can go for a sample Kubernetes custom controller. I'll put the link in the description. Uh, a very good documentation, which will help you to uh, understand how to write a sample Kubernetes custom controller. Kubernetes supports some documentation as well. And go for the controller runtime as your medium of writing. If you want to write operators, then you can use operator SDK as well. What is operator? How is it different from controller? Not uh, the topic. <clears throat> Today we are not dealing with this topic. Okay. So now let me not go into the details of it. So this is uh, some interesting things that I wanted to explain. And uh, if you want to write a CRD, Okay, so DevOps engineers will not write custom controllers or CRDs, most of the DevOps engineers, but if you are in a uh, Kubernetes developer role, and uh, if you want to write your, uh, in your organization, if you are required to write a new Kubernetes custom controller, then you might have to know all of these things. Like in my role, I have to write uh, Kubernetes controllers. I have deal day in, day out with Kubernetes controllers. So I know all of these things. But even if you want to write a custom resource definition, that's not difficult. Uh, you can write a resource definition very easily. Okay, now let me show you one example just for your understanding. Uh, how does a custom Kubernetes controller would look like and uh, what are the parameters, how to deploy them and all of those things. So quickly I'll stop sharing here. Uh, stop share and uh, let me start sharing my other screen. So I hope till now the topic is very clear to you. And uh, I will just take one example because we have been discussing about Istio. Let us take example of Istio itself to just show you, okay, uh, how does uh, this custom controllers and uh, how they operate, okay? Perfect, uh, just go to GitHub <coughs> or, uh, yeah, first let's go to GitHub. And uh, so this is your GitHub page. You can just search for Istio Istio, okay? So if you just search for Istio Istio, so this is the Istio repository. So if you want to know the list of popular uh, custom controllers in Kubernetes, the best way is to go to CNCF. Okay, so CNCF is Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And uh, inside this, you have a lot of Kubernetes, like uh, for example, I work on Argo CD. So these are all the, like they have 20 graduated projects, 37 incubating projects and 93. Uh, so all of these are custom Kubernetes controllers like Argo CD, Istio, Backstage, Build Packs. Okay, so all of these, or the custom Kubernetes controllers, which are very popular in the uh, community, not just these things. So these are from the CNCF. CNCF is a, uh, like you can consider it as a uh, Linux foundations uh, project uh, or CNCF is a community. Uh, basically that is uh, backing up or giving support to all of these uh, projects. Like if you get your project incubated with CNCF, then you get a lot more attention or, you know, you get a lot of more uh, support for your projects. Okay. So Creo is one, Core DNS is one. Crossplane, which we discussed uh, in one of the classes is one. So these are all the custom Kubernetes controllers, which are very popular in the community. Prometheus, I think most of you know about Prometheus, right? So you can go to any of their uh, projects. Like in my case, because I've been talking about Istio the whole video. So this is Istio, okay? So if you are a DevOps engineer and if your organization has decided to use Istio, what you will do is if you want to read through the code, so this is the Istio Go language code. It is open source. You can start reading it. But on a, uh, like, you know, if, firstly, if you start with it, you'll find it slightly difficult. So uh, if you are a beginner and if you want to understand the code, firstly, go to the package uh, folder. So inside the package folder, like, you know, uh, anyways, like uh, this will be very difficult to understand from here. So use the example that I uh, put in the description. That is uh, Kubernetes sample uh, uh, custom controller, like uh, Kubernetes sample controller okay so i'll put the link in the description as well but this is the github page where uh, kubernetes people will explain you how to write a sample kubernetes controller okay like i told you uh, you use a lot of uh, packages like there is a code generator okay and uh, then uh, there is a uh, controller manager sorry uh, controller runtime so you can use make make use of all of these things just follow the documentation uh, they'll explain you how to write the go code for the controller as well and uh, how to write a custom resource definition uh, there are a bunch of examples on how to write a custom resource so just follow this uh, specific github repository if you are interested uh, like i'm telling you for most of the De De devops job roles this might not be important. You only need to understand the concept, how to deploy a custom resource, how to deploy a controller, how they are working in the backend. 
whatever i explained in the theory part this should be more than enough for you but if you are in a challenging devops role where you take care of uh, writing kubernetes controllers as well okay where you are contributing like probably you are an open source contributor for any of these projects like i am doing so in such cases you might require this kind of knowledge if not Uh, you can stop at the video where i explained you all of these things and you can see how to deploy these custom resources okay so this is about istio right like i'm telling you you can go through the uh, code in this uh, github repository after that you know what you need to do is go to the introduction inside anything uh, you can just go to their uh, official documentation of uh, istio uh, where is it in this case the official documentation yeah so this is the istio.io this is the official documentation and here you will find the installation uh, page okay so this is taking some time but uh, basically you will have a helm chart i'll show you uh, the helm chart will take care of the deployment of the custom resource definition as well as your custom controller okay so both of the things will be deployed so let's go to the documentation and inside the documentation setup right so is if you are a devops engineer you have to do these things okay so get installation guides go here and now you need to understand okay take any of these things install with helm because helm is a quite popular one okay so all that you need to do is you just need to uh, copy this commands okay uh, called helm repo add istio and then update the uh, helm repo for the istio and then you know Uh, you will see that the istio related custom controllers will be created in your namespace along with the crds so after that it's up to the users to just go and deploy the istio virtual service for example okay if i just want to show you quickly just copy this one here and uh, if you have a kubernetes cluster handy what you can do is i don't know if it uh, today looks like my network is slow but i'll try to show you okay so i am just creating the uh, helm things for this uh, so it says update complete happy helming perfect thank you and uh, after this the installation steps is to choose uh, any of the helm release and all of these things okay so now i have to choose the helm release as well i thought they have a no problem yeah i think this is fine here firstly create a namespace for istio okay so i am creating a namespace for istio just follow the documentation as a devops engineer uh, you can go through the documentation of uh, how to create uh, the steps for installing the custom resource definition and the custom kubernetes controller but once you do this you have to understand the concept like i told you how does istio work how what is a custom uh, like you know what is a virtual service in istio all of these things you have to know by yourself okay so your role is to just deploy this custom resource uh, sorry custom resource definition custom controller and apart from that if your teammates has any problem with istio then you have to solve it not the golang related code or not the controller or anything but if they say that you know my istio virtual service is not working then you have to go to the istio controller look for the logs what is happening there if the virtual service resource is properly created or not what is the status of the virtual service describe the virtual service resource so this kind of debugging is expected from you as a devops engineer okay so now if i just do helm uh, istio you will notice that the crd installation is created okay see so you have a new resource uh, or you can just say kubectl get crd so you will see that the istio related so these are all the istio related custom resources so in case of istio there are lot of custom resources don't worry about it but you know this is how you create a custom resource after that again follow the documentation and create your istio related okay so by using this command now your istio related controller will be created so there is no rocket science here uh, all that you need to do is just follow the documentation and create every configuration like custom resources uh, definition and your uh, kubernetes custom controller so this is for helm uh, istio but the same process will be for argo cd same process will be for prometheus anything you just install their helm charts which will imp which will deploy their custom resources uh, definition and also their uh, sorry what was that uh, custom controller which is a deployment okay so this is the configuration related to it if you have any questions just post that in the comment section but as a devops engineer like i'm telling you one of your primary responsibilities is this and after that to debug like if your organization is using istio you have to read through the istio documentation completely and you have to understand about istio okay just deployment is not your part 
you have to understand each and everything here how is the uh, service mesh is working what are the configurations that are required uh, if user is getting any uh, questions with respect to istio destination rules uh, what is the envoy proxy in istio right all of these things you have to know as devops engineers apart from the installation and configuration okay so this might take some time but uh, there is again no uh, no point of just creating the deployment i just want you to explain i wanted you to explain the concept so i hope you like the video for today if you have any questions put that in the comment section and don't forget to subscribe my channel thank you so much for watching the video today i'll see you in the next video take care everyone bye